Section Zero of the Medici, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The Medici, Volume One by G. F. Young. Section Zero. Preface and Prologue. Preface. There are, in English, several histories of three or four of the more important members of the Medici family, but there is none, either in Italian or English, of that family as a whole, the history of no less than nine out of thirteen generations having remained hitherto unwritten. The history of the Medici is a deeply interesting story, while, beside its intrinsic interest, it helps us to acquire much knowledge about the rebirth of learning and art, about the history of Europe in perhaps its most important period, about the birth of science and about the great collections of art possessed by Florence. For without referring largely to all these subjects, no true picture of the Medici can be given. My aim has been to write of them as a family, their rise, their course upon the mountain tops of power and their decline and end, and to keep the parts always in subordination to the whole. It may perhaps be thought that more might have been said in the case of one or two members of the family, but to have gone into greater detail regarding individuals would have had the effect of obscuring the general view, besides making the book far too long. This history takes a somewhat different view of the Medici from that which has hitherto generally obtained. It is a strange fact that in their case, the violent partisanship which swayed the historians of their time has been carried on into our own, and writers about them, whether belonging to their age or ours, are banded into two furiously opposing camps, making it very difficult to arrive at a true estimate. Those on the one side can see no faults, and give a picture which one feels to be untrue to life by reason of its successive eulogy, while to those on the other the name of Medici appears to act like an intoxicant, rendering them incapable of seeing what the very facts recorded by themselves demonstrate, and making even facts telling strongly in favour of those concerned appear to such writers only to show a subtle policy towards a nefarious end. And it is those of the latter type who have been best known, and have consequently been followed by writers who, in guidebooks on the art and history of Florence, have had occasion to allude to the Medici. There have been Florentines of note, now passed away, well read in the archives of their country, who have said that if only the world at large could study those archives, it would discover that the time-honoured view of the Medici which has thus grown up was to a very large extent unjust and far from the truth, but their voices have not been generally heard. To whitewash historical characters is as great an offence to history as to traduce them, and the view to which I have gradually been led regarding the Medici has not been due to any original bias in their favour. On the contrary, I began the study entirely imbued with the time-honoured theory I have mentioned, and was only brought by degrees to a different opinion by coming to see that the admitted facts refused over and over again to square with the view of this family usually presented to us. I have therefore preferred to judge those concerned by their acknowledged deeds, rather than by comments thereon which, emanating from writers violently biased against them, are found uniformly attributing good actions to ignoble motives, or distorting those actions until they become full of impossibilities. Avoiding any attempt to make out the Medici as either this or that, I have endeavoured, eschewing all legends, to detail simply the facts for which we have evidence. No crimes attributed to them have been omitted or slurred over. If the result is to show the Medici in a better light than hitherto has been the case, that is not due to any desire to whitewash them, but is simply the consequence of a want of any evidence for a large proportion of those crimes which have furnished the darker shades in the traditional picture of this family. I have also endeavoured to leave the facts to speak for themselves as far as possible, to narrate rather than to explain, leaving readers to form their own conclusions, 
as I am confident that in this way what the Medici were and did is likely to be more forcibly appreciated. As regards the elder branch of the family, this book relates for the first time the histories of Giovanni di Bicci, Piero il Gottoso, and Lorenzo, Duke of Urbino, brings to notice certain points not previously known with reference to Cosimo, Pater, Patriae. The manner in which that title was given to him and his singular tomb and throw some new light on the character and deeds of Lorenzo the Magnificent. It takes a different view from that hitherto held regarding Pope Leo X, Catherine de Medici and Pietro the Unfortunate, and it discloses for the first time the inner history of Pope Clement VII. The scheme which he formed, the manner in which he carried it out, and the motives underlying his hitherto imperfectly understood political manoeuvres with Charles V, Francis I and Henry VIII. As regards the younger branch of the family, this history is the first that has been written. In this portion of the subject, the most notable points are the various important achievements of Cosimo I and Ferdinand I, the character and importance of Eleonora di Toledo, the history of Anna Maria Ludovica, a member of the family who has been practically unknown, though most deserving of record, the solution of a problem long unsolved connected with the feeling regarding the Medici in their own city, the unveiling, through the results of recent research, of many misconceptions regarding Cosimo I and his sons, the exposure of such errors as the common one of supposing that the palace known as the Pitti Palace was built by that family instead of by the Medici, the demonstration of the unique connection of the Medici with the birth of modern science, and the disclosure of the immense gift made by the last of the Medici to Florence. In the absence of any history of this portion of the family, it has not been recognised that the deeds of the younger branch in the domain of literature, art and science were, though different in character, of scarcely less importance than those of the elder branch. The elder branch advanced learning and art by the liberal expenditure of their wealth in that cause, their enlightened patronage and their artistic taste, their art collections, however, being swept away. The younger branch did for science what the elder branch had done for learning, while it was they who collected all those artistic treasures which now form the attraction of Florence. Thus this portion of the history necessarily furnishes a large amount of information which was hitherto entirely wanting regarding the artistic possessions of Florence. Lastly, as regards art, this book explains for the first time the meaning of certain pictures hitherto misunderstood, but whose true meaning a complete study of the Medici history reveals. The chief of these are Gozzoli's frescoes in the Riccardi Palace, the Medici Palace, to which frescoes an entire chapter has been devoted, and the true meaning of Botticelli's pictures, the adoration of the Magi, fortitude, the birth of Venus, the Primavera, and Calumny. It also brings to notice a hitherto unknown statue by Gian de Bologna called The Genius of the Medici a hitherto unknown portrait of the celebrated Clara Strozzi, of whom it had been supposed that no portrait existed, and a hitherto unknown portrait of the Princess Violante Beatrice, of whom it had been supposed that no portrait existed, and gives the first reproduction of a lost portrait of Madalena, eldest daughter of Lorenzo the Magnificent, of the recently discovered portrait by Raphael of Giuliano, third son of Lorenzo the Magnificent, which had been lost for 350 years, and of nine other portraits of members of the Medici family which have not previously been known. And it demonstrates that the recent theories put forward regarding several of Botticelli's most important pictures are erroneous. In the chapters relating to the earlier members of the family, short notices have been introduced 
of the prominent artists of the time, not merely in order to show to how large an extent the Medici were concerned in their steady advancement to greater achievements, but still more because this is essential if the Medici are to be shown in their proper setting. The favourite method of separating the history of the time from the history of its art would in this case have been exceptionally destructive, for it would have excluded from the biographical sketch of each head of the family that which in the case of many of them was their chief interest in life, and even to place such notices at the end of the chapter would have caused a similar separation. The course adopted preserves better that close touch with the world of art which is here essential, while it also assists to maintain the due sequence of events in regard to art. These notices cease after the time of the Interregnum, 1494-1512, to, to have continued them beyond that point when the Tuscan school which so long led the way began to merge into the larger field of Italy would have had the effect of obscuring the history of the Medici with matters in which they had ceased to be any longer an important factor. In the earlier chapters, short abstracts have been given from time to time of contemporary events taking place in other countries, as this course, though unusual, is, I think in the case of a history of this kind, helpful, by keeping it in touch with general history as it proceeds. The need for such abstracts gradually decreases as the history of the family advances. In regard to the vexed question of references to authorities, I have endeavoured to steer a middle course between quoting chapter and verse for every statement, a method as much loathed by the general reader as it is liked by scholars, and quoting no authorities at all. Either method is, of course, open to criticism from one side or the other, but I think the middle course adopted is that likely to be preferred by most readers. In the notices on contemporary artists, I have freely used extracts from other writers in detailing the special characteristics of the art of various painters and sculptors, as on such a subject it has seemed to me preferable to quote the words of others whose opinion must necessarily have far greater weight than my own. I desire specially to acknowledge my indebtedness to Mr. F. A. Hyatt's Florence in regard to the characters of Cosimo Pater Patriae and Lorenzo the Magnificent, to Mr. E. Armstrong's chapter in Volume 3 of The Cambridge Modern History in regard to the administration of Tuscany under Cosimo I, to his Lorenzo de Medici in regard to the character and writings of the latter, and to Count Pasolini's Life of Catherine Sforza in regard to that remarkable ancestress of the later generations of the Medici. Also to Miss Hope Reyes Donatello, Mrs. Aides Fra Angelico, Mr. Langton Douglas's Fra Angelico, and D. Williamson's Perugino, in regard to the art of those masters. Original research has been carried out chiefly, though of course not entirely, with regard to that portion of the history relating to the last six generations of the family. And here, a very large part of the information has, even more than from books and manuscripts, been gathered from what buildings and tombs, pictures, statues and monuments have to tell, these having proved as valuable a mine of information as the records of the archives. Added to this, I am also indebted to the researches of the late Professor G. E. Saltini for much valuable information in regard to this portion of the history of the family. This book is written primarily for the general reader, but not exclusively so, and I trust that scholars may find in it not a little that is new to them, both in the domain of history and of art. At the same time, it does not pretend to be more than a very inadequate memorial of this interesting family, and none know its imperfections so well as myself. G. F. Y. Florence, 12th of October, 1910. The Medici, Prologue. In the fifth century, storm upon storm out of the dark north swept away in a great deluge of barbarism 
all the civilization of the western half of the Roman Empire, from the Atlantic to Constantinople, and from the Rhine and Danube to the deserts of Africa, all that was learned and cultivated, all that was artistic and beautiful, was overwhelmed in an avalanche of ruin, in which not only the triumphs of architecture, literature and art, produced by many centuries of a high civilization, but also those who could create such things afresh were involved in one general destruction. Then, after a night of thick darkness, obscuring everything in Western Europe for two hundred years, during which these barbarian races are battling over the dead corpse of the Roman Empire, comes in the eighth century, Charlemagne, creating a brief light for forty years. But on his death the darkness settles down again, wrapping all in gloom, and again we read, Barbarism and confusion reigned throughout Western Europe for a hundred and fifty years. Meanwhile, from Arabia another deluge, that of the Mohammedans, sweeps in succession over the fair countries forming the eastern half of the empire, creating there also a similar desolation. Gradually, all that is left of the art and letters of the Roman Empire takes refuge in Constantinople, where it remains shut up, surrounded west, north, east and south by the barbarian flood. At length, in the twelfth century, the re-civilization of the West is begun by the discovery in Italy of the code of the Roman law. Then come in the thirteenth century, Niccolò Pisano, and in the fourteenth century, Dante, Giotto and Petrarch, to arouse men again to a sense of the beautiful and the cultivated and art and literature begin to flow back to their long-deserted western home. And so, out of the very grave of that old civilization of Rome, buried deep nine centuries before, comes the new inspiration, the rebirth. But as yet there was none with power to make these efforts produce their full fruit, none with the power to unearth the treasures so long buried, to spread a knowledge of them throughout the West, and to make the voices of those long dead begin again to speak. While after these forefathers of the Renaissance had passed away, art and literature threatened again to die, and the movement thus inaugurated to become but local and temporary. And then, in the city which had produced three of these men, arose a family who, with the power of wealth, and with a great love for these things, lifted learning from its grave, spread a knowledge of it throughout Europe, gave art the encouragement it needed in order to advance to its highest achievements, and made that city the Athens of the West. End of section zero. Section one of the Medici, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 1 by G. F. Young. Chapter 1. Florence. O foster nurse of man's abandoned glory, since Athens, its great mother, sank in splendor, thou shadowest forth that mighty shape in history, as ocean its wrecked fane, severe yet tender, the light-invested angel poesy was drawn from the dim world to welcome thee shall we standing on the hill of san miniato and looking down from thence as so many belonging to bygone generations have done at the city spread out at our feet we see before us a city such as none other ever can be to a large portion of mankind one in which things have had their birth which now form the lifeblood of all the intellectual existence of europe as iriarte says we must dearly love Florence, for she is the mother of all those who live by thought. Her outward beauty is palpable to all, the domes and spires of a smokeless city bathed in sunshine, the slopes of the Apennines extending almost to its walls, covered with vineyards, olive plantations, gardens, and numberless luxurious villas, the silver thread of the river Arno winding away in the distance through the beautiful Val de Arno, the tender coloring which in Tuscany is so marked a feature of the distant landscape all these together make up a whole which is a dream of beauty 
but there is more to be seen than this florence's charms are not confined to her outward beauty for this is the city which produced the renaissance an achievement which will ever surround florence with an unfading glory the influence she has thus exercised has secured for her a world-wide interest undoubtedly the main attraction of florence for the modern world is as a place where there breathes a stiller higher atmosphere than that of the hurrying striving twentieth century a place where if we will the history of the past is made to rise before us and where the masterpieces of art strive to draw the mind upwards from the low level of the trivial the ignoble and the commonplace it has been said that the arts are the avenues by which the mind of man soars to its highest limits if that be so then in florence if anywhere in the world must the truth of those words be felt for in the city of dante and petrarch of ghiberti brunelleschi donatello and michelangelo of giotto arcagna masaccio fra angelico botticelli and leonardo da vinci not only one of those avenues but no less than four of them have been followed as far as the mind of man has ever penetrated along them we are going for a little while to be occupied in miss scene's instinct with the spirit of these men therefore in looking at beautiful florence let us try to think chiefly not of her outward beauty but rather of all the deep interests which she is able to unfold to us in art and history and literature bound up with the name of florence for all time to consider the high-souled thoughts which gave the birth to all that we go there to see produced by minds which were able to make their city preeminent among all cities in painting in sculpture in architecture and in poetry and at the same time preeminent also in learning and in the science of their age thus as we look down upon florence from san miniato we shall be drawn to think of the high aspirations of those who first planned to build that mighty dome and who directed their cathedral to be designed so as to be worthy of a heart expanded to much greatness to think of the conceptions of him who while he was the father of all painting could also be so great in architecture as to design that beautiful bell tower by its side of the strong character of those freedom-loving florentines who erected that solidly built city fortress to guard their supreme council from the effects of their own turbulent spirit of all that lies collected under that small pointed spire in the background telling of the dawn of the renaissance of art or again of what a world of high-souled thought is represented in that line of statues in that colonnade florence's valhalla extending from the river to the fortress that galaxy of the great in poetry and art in learning and in science all produced by this single city and containing even though brunelleschi giberto masaccio fra angelico and botticelli are not there at least twelve great names of which any one would suffice to make any other city famous and as they look down upon us from their niches they invite us to walk their streets in spirit with them with dante and giotto and arcagna and donatello and leonardo and michelangelo and galileo and to be uplifted into the world where their thoughts dwelt so that we too may be if but for a moment among the immortals lastly we shall be drawn to think of that family who for so many generations took a chief part in all that interests us in florence whose care for learning and art produced such wide effects who preserved to the world most of those treasures of art which we now visit florence to see and who all lie buried in that church of san lorenzo which is marked by the smaller dome in the distance where as their line came near its end they erected tombs which are those of crowned heads tombs visited by all the world for their masterpieces of art and their magnificence the city is what those who once lived in it have made it and as we look at the memorials of themselves which they have left behind them and which still belong to their descendants we must not omit all thought of the race which made these men what they were for this is a peruvia a country which has always from the earliest time led the way in italy and from whence in the middle ages there came forth as leaders of the movement which we call the renaissance a great secession of men of whom it has been said the dazzling light of their genius shines on through the centuries to show to future generations what man can be and do so that these memorials of florence's past are no dead records of a bygone time but afford the strongest inspiration to us of the present day and since the signoria of florence when starting at the end of the thirteenth century to build their cathedral declared in the document conveying their instructions to its architect arnolfo di cambio 
that the desire which animated them was that it should be designed so as to be worthy of a heart expanded to such greatness corresponding to the noble city soul which is composed of the soul of all its citizens the great dome of florence whose construction was thus inspired by a name so different from that which later on called into being its rival at rome may well whenever from far or near it strikes upon the eye act as a clarion call to high and noble aims the men who in a mere government document ordering a great public work could reach such a level were no common men and in commenting on their words mr walter skyfe justly asks has the much vaunted progress of civilization during the six centuries that have since passed carried us so far beyond either the sentiments or the work of these men but there is yet another attraction which florence possesses for the modern world and that is the vividness with which the past is there made to live before us the way in which the twentieth century is enabled to look at the fifteenth even with the outward eye and as if four swiftly flowing centuries that have intervened were rolled back the massive strength of the bargello of the palazzo vecchio and even of the ordinary buildings in every direction forces upon us the recollection of the fierce fighting which these narrow streets have time after time witnessed and while other cities have preserved little round which interest connected with men eminent in history literature or art who pass their lives there can gather florence which has held a leadership in art and letters equaled by no other city except athens teems with memorials of those who gave her that leadership the dome of the cathedral brings to our minds brunelleschi its nave re-echoes with the thundering eloquence of savronarola its beautiful campanile recalls to us giotto the loggia di lanzi reminds us of orcagna the baptistry bears record of gilberte the torre del gallo still keeps alive the memory of the starry galileo we see the house where dante lived we pass the shops where giotto botticelli and andrea del sarto worked we follow the same streets by which verrocchio ghirlandaggio and michelangelo went to their daily tasks we stand before church doorways made beautiful by the art of luca della robbia we listen to donatello's voice as we gaze at the statues surrounding or san michele we pace the corridors and cloisters of san marco accompanied by the spirits of fra angelico and savronarola and in many an old fresco the faces dress and manner of life of the men and women of the renaissance are brought before us with startling vividness but the full effect of this vivid realization of the past which florence forces upon us is best seen by comparing her with her great rival venice mrs oliphant speaking of venice says after the bewitchment of the first vision a chill falls upon the inquirer where is the poet where the prophet where the princes the scholars the men whom could we see we should recognize wherever we met them with whom the whole world is acquainted they are not here in the sunshine of the piazza and the glorious gloom of san marco in the great council chambers of the ducal palace one so full of busy statesmen and great interests there is scarcely a figure recognizable of all to be met with in the spirit no one for traces of whom we look as we walk or whose individual footsteps are traceable instead of the men who made her what she was and who ruled her with so high a hand we find everywhere the great image of venice herself in her records the city is everything the individual nothing venice is the outcome not great names of individual venetians mrs oliphant's subsequent remarks show that the root of a reason why venice produced no prominent men was the inordinate love of money a race with whom money-making and money-spending is the one serious interest cannot penetrate those those avenues by which the mind soars to its highest limits florence also loved money but it was not her chief interest and so we have this significant result florence with art and learning as her passion and with her long line of immortal names in every branch of these the city which led the way in producing the civilization of europe and on the other hand venice producing next to nothing of the kind no great poet no great scholar no great sculptor no great statesman known to all the world no great painter even until her rival had been leading the way in that particular for a hundred and fifty years and had produced a host of such and leaving nothing behind her but her own exalted name nothing still able to elevate mankind after her glory had passed away 
it is a great contrast and just as it is the lack of human interest in the case of venice that causes that chill to fall upon the inquirer so on the other hand it is the abundant possession of the human interest that gives florence her great attraction the seed from which the fruit grew was in the one case the love of money in the other the love of art End of section number one Section 2 of The Medici, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avahi in February 2020. The Medici, Volume 1 by G. F. Young. Chapter 2 The Medici we turn from this glimpse of the city to those who were for over three hundred years its most prominent citizens the history of the medici covers three and a half centuries fourteen hundred to seventeen forty three two of those centuries the fifteenth and sixteenth being the most interesting period of any both in history and in art it is a period which covers the change from medieval to modern history which may be held to commence with the long triangular duel between francis i charles v and henry the eighth it covers the time when the conditions changed from those consequent on the feudal system and small isolated states to those brought about by regular armies and powerful countries with clashing interests it covers the time when the chief political power in europe shifted from the great independent states of italy venice milan florence and naples to the northern countries france england and germany it embraces the reformation with all that brought it about and that followed from it and it includes the extinction of the christian eastern empire and establishment of the Mohammedan Turkish Empire in its place, the discovery of a new world in America, the expulsion of the Moors from Spain, and in general the settlement of the different nations of Europe, after centuries of transition, in the localities they now occupy. As regards art, the period is even more important, for with the year 1400 there began that wonderful 15th century which saw the birth of the Renaissance in art and produced a galaxy of great men in every branch of art, such as the world had never seen before and is never likely to see again. The gradual rise of the Medici from comparative obscurity and not by military conquests to so high an eminence is one of the most remarkable things in history from simple bankers and merchants they rose in spite of much opposition and many vicissitudes until they became the most powerful family in europe and indeed until there was a medici on the throne of nearly every principal country they are interesting from several very different points of view the important place which they took in history makes their story at times almost that of europe cosimo pater patrie lorenzo the magnificent pope leo the tenth pope clement the seventh and catherine de medici not to mention others have made the name of medici occupy a larger place in history than was probably ever taken by any other family their patronage of learning and art in this domain the medici have never been approached by any others among the rulers of mankind the rothschilds of their time their immense wealth was lavishly expended on the revival of learning and the encouragement of art in painting fra angelico lippi gozzoli ghirlandaccio botticelli lorenzo di credi leonardo da vinci and raphael in sculpture ghiberti donatello verrocchio and michelangelo in architecture brunelleschi michelozzo and bramante with a host of lesser names all owed much to their assistance as regards painting this had especially important results 
and just as the age of pericles in athens became the classic period or period of highest development of the art of sculpture so the age of the medici has become the classic period of the art of painting their connection with the reformation in this great movement which convulsed all europe throughout the greater part of the sixteenth century the two popes who belonged to this family were those chiefly concerned, namely Leo X, Luther's great antagonist, and Clement VII, the pope in whose pontificate England repudiated the claim of the Church of Rome to exercise supremacy over the Church of England. Naturally, this again adds much interest to the story of the Medici. Lastly, Owing to an exceptional many-sidedness, they touched life at so many points. In statesmanship and financial capacity, in learning and artistic taste, in civil administration and sympathy with the feelings of the people, in knowledge of commerce and agriculture, in all these different directions did the Medici evince an unusual ability. And this was joined to qualities of courtesy, agreeableness of manner absence of arrogance and a free and generous disposition which much enhanced their power of influencing those with whom they were brought in contact they were not however assisted by any attractions of personal appearance their portraits showing that they were by no means a handsome family their only good feature being their fine eyes which were proverbial these various characteristics make them an interesting family apart from the other aspects of their history two grave charges have been preferred against them first that they by a long course of duplicity deprived their country of its liberty and exalted themselves into despots over it and second that there is to be attributed to them an evil pre-eminence in crimes of murder how far these charges are just will be best seen as we follow the course of their history, but regarding the second some general remarks are called for. The charge is a strange one in view of the contemporary history of other countries. For the history of this family embraces thirteen generations, and out of this number there are no less than ten generations to whom no such crimes have been even attributed. It is not until we reach the seventh generation that we have the first murder committed by a Medici, and even that was committed by one who had no legitimate right to the name. While it is not until we reach the eighth and ninth generations that we meet with that series of these accusations, which has been the main cause of the reputation which has been given to the family. Such a charge against the whole family involves comparison, and when we compare even the whole of the cases attributed to the Medici with those authenticated as committed by other contemporary ruling families, not only in Italy, but also in France, England, and Spain, it becomes evident that the popular belief ascribing to the Medici an evil pre-eminence in such crimes can only be due to a lack either of information or of the sense of proportion. Among ruling families of the time, there are few to whom there have not been attributed more crimes of this nature than to the Medici. Nor do we stigmatize the whole line of the sovereigns of England or France, because three out of thirteen generations may have committed crimes of this character. Some writers, while admitting the injustice of this graver charge, and while ready to allow that the Medici were capable, intellectual, and patriotic, assert that nevertheless they were grasping, cruel, intrigant, and stained with vices which were rampant in their times. It is hoped that this history will demonstrate convincingly that the Medici were decidedly not either grasping or cruel. To say that they were intriguing is merely to say that they were men of their age. Regarding the fourth point, while they certainly were not free from the vices rampant in their times, the indictment in the manner it is made is an exaggeration, implying as it does that the Medici were worse than others, 
whereas all evidence tends to show that they were distinctly better in this respect than other contemporary families. This general statement, on a point to which modern histories do not consider it necessary to allude except in general terms, will perhaps suffice, but it will be found to be borne out by various facts in the lives of many members of the family as these are followed. Simons makes a complaint against the Medici that they were bourgeois. Of course they were bourgeois, it is the very pith of their story, and instead of giving ground for a gibe to be cast at them, it contributes much to their honour. It is the essence of their history that they belonged entirely to the people, that their rise began from their championship of the latter against the nobles, and that theirs was an aristocracy, not of birth, but of talent and culture. They present to us in following their story the most opposite extremes both of conduct and of fortune. Marvellous as to their rise, pathetic as to their vicissitudes, magnificent as to their liberality towards objects for the lasting benefit of mankind, tragic as to many episodes of their career, despicable as to their ignoble decline and end, except for one last act worthy to rank with those of their best days, their history is like a great drama extending over three hundred years and played out on the widest of stages. End of section two. Section three of the Medici, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 1, by G. F. Young. Chapter 3, Giovanni de Bici, Part 1. Born 1360, died 1428. In the year 1400, the Medici were an ordinary middle-class family in Florence. The family can be traced back as far as the year 1201, when Chiarissimo, eldest son of Gian Buono de Medici and a member of the town council, is noted as being the owner of various houses and towers in the Mercato Vecchio. But the only branch of it with which we are concerned is that which made so great a name in history and was destined to run an eventful course of nearly 350 years. Of this branch, Giovanni de' Medici was at this time the head. For some reason or other, his father, Averardo de' Medici, was nicknamed by his companions Bici. Among the Medici, the same Christian names recur so frequently that each is in history known by some addition or sobriquet, and Giovanni, the founder of the historic branch of the family, is always known as Giovanni de Bici, i.e. Giovanni, the son of Bici. He was at this time a man of forty years of age, and highly respected for his character and business ability. The family were bankers and already possessed of considerable wealth, which Giovanni by his financial ability increased. Several of his ancestors had taken part in public affairs. His great-grandfather, Averardo, who had begun the prosperity of the family by successful trading operations, had been gonfalonier in 1314. His grandfather, Salvestro, had been one of the envoys of the Republic, deputed to conclude the treaty with Venice in 1336. And two of his father's first cousins had been gonfalonier in, respectively, 1349 and 1354. But Giovanni de' Bici de' Medici came of a family which had signalised themselves in another way than this, for they had on several occasions taken a prominent part in the struggles of the people against the nobles, Grandi. A distant cousin of his father, also named Giovanni, had in 1343 been seized and put to death by the tyrant of Florence, Walter de Brienne, Duke of Athens, as one of the most dangerous of the citizens, Popolani. 
and when Giovanni de' Bici was eighteen years old, he had seen in 1378 a distant cousin of his grandfather, another Salvestro, by his powerful words in the Signoria, bring about the riot known as that of the Ciampi, the weavers, dyers, and minor workmen of the Guild of Wool, which riot, we are told, broke the power of the nobles and destroyed the oligarchy of the Parte Guelfa, while another cousin of his father's, Vieri, had pacified the rebellion of 1393. Thus the family had as its tradition antagonism to the nobles and championship of the cause of the people. Giovanni de' Bici was destined to go far in the same course, as well as to found a family whose influence was to spread far beyond the sphere of the petty politics of Florence. Let us first see what, in this year 1400, were the conditions surrounding him, one, in his own city, and two, in the larger world beyond it. 1. Florence, after fierce struggles between rival factions for 150 years, had at last settled down with the most democratic government on record. In 1260, the banished Ghibellines, under Farinata degli Uberti, had, at the Battle of Monte Aperto, defeated the Guelphs and re-entered Florence in triumph. The Ghibellines had thereupon proposed to raise Florence to the ground. Against this, Farinata degli Uberti had raised his single voice and prevailed, for which act he has obtained lasting honour in Florence, and his statue, the only Ghibelline one, has received a place among those of Florence's greatest men in the Uffizi colonnade. Then had succeeded in 1289 the Battle of Campaldino, giving the final victory to the Guelphs, whereupon the community had been divided into guilds, arti, whose representatives formed the governing body, the Signoria. In 1298 had begun the building of the cathedral, and of the Palazzo della Signoria, the order for the latter, to Arnolfo di Cambio, the architect, stating that it was required for the greater security of the Signoria in this city, so given to sudden and violent tumults. But the internecine strifes did not cease, even though the Ghibellines had been driven out. The same fierce conflicts as before broke out under new names. Cerci versus Donati, White Guelphs versus Black Guelphs, and so on. At length, in 1343, Walter de Brienne, a foreigner whom the city had made its governor, was driven out, when a time of anarchy and frequent revolutions followed, during which occurred in 1348 the great plague described by Boccaccio, and in 1378 the above-mentioned riot of the Ciampi. As a result, the Signoria was reconstituted and composed of representatives, priors, from each of the 21 guilds, instead of from the more important ones only. These were directed to be chosen every two months, afterwards extended to a longer period, while it was ruled that no noble should be eligible as a member of the Signoria. The president of the latter body was the Gonfalonier, chosen from among the members of the Signoria, and elected for a similar short period. Nor did even this satisfy Florence's fiercely democratic instincts. Although all power was vested in the representatives of the various guilds, yet on any large question the great bell, the vacca, in the tower of the Palazzo della Signoria, summoned the whole male population into the square below, when the question was decided, ostensibly at any rate, by popular acclamation. This form of government continued for 150 years. It had been established about 20 years at the time our story begins. Passionately indeed was Florence enamoured of freedom. In a struggle of some 200 years, she had first gradually shaken herself free from subordination to the emperors, then fought against and thrown off the power of the nobles, 
and lastly, had established the most republican republic the world has ever seen. And in deep dread of being brought again under the yoke, she had developed so great a jealousy of any action, either by an individual or a family, tending, however remotely, to threaten her independence, that this feeling had become a mania. There was a very short shrift in Florence for anyone suspected of harbouring an intention of exalting himself into any position of authority above that of an ordinary citizen. Florence was at this time at a high level of power, ruling over various subject cities and constantly increasing her territory by little wars with neighbouring states. Republics such as Florence were of a peculiar kind, since only the citizens of the capital city possessed any political power. None others were allowed any voice in the policy of the state. This complete subjection to the capital city accounts for the fierce struggles of Pisa, Prato, Pistoia, Volterra, and other cities gradually conquered by Florence, against being subdued by her. It is also, no doubt, the reason why history at this period always speaks of Florence to denote that state which at a later period we speak of as Tuscany. As regards trade and commerce, Florence was at this time the most flourishing state in Europe. Her citizens owned banks in all countries, and the golden florin had become the general European standard of value, marking the leading position in commerce held by Florence. Macaulay, speaking of the revenue about this time, says, quote, The revenue of the Republic amounted to 300,000 florins, a sum which, allowing for the depreciation of the precious metals, was at least equivalent to £600,000 sterling. A larger sum than England and Ireland, two centuries later, yielded to Elizabeth. The chief trade was in wool and woolen cloth, both that produced by Florence itself and that sent there from other countries, to be dyed and refined by a secret process and re-exported a trade memorialised in the still-existing names of two celebrated streets in Florence, Calimala, or Calimara, and the Pelleceria. And the Guild of the Wool Merchants was the most important in Florence, so much so that to this guild was committed the work of building the cathedral. The principal part of the trade of Florence was with England. 2. Turning now to the larger world outside Florence, we find the other states in Europe situated as follows. Venice, a republic of a very different kind and ruled by an oligarchy of nobles, was rapidly advancing to the height of her power, having in 1380 crushed her maritime rival Genoa, and was year by year extending her territories by fresh conquests. Milan, an imperial duchy, was under the rule of her great duke, Gian Galeazzo Visconti, the most capable of that family, the builder of the Cathedral of Milan and the Certosa of Pavia. He had conquered almost all northern Italy, extending his dominions even as far as Perugia and Spoleto, was at this time only resisted by Florence, and was in full expectation of shortly subduing Florence also, when he would make himself king of Italy. Naples and Sicily, a kingdom, but of the feeblest kind, was in its usual state of anarchy, the bone of contention between the rival houses of Anjou and Aragon, as it had been for a 150 years. The Papacy The situation of the Papacy at this time was most deplorable. There had in 1378 begun the Great Schism, with rival popes at Avignon and Rome, a state of things which had brought down the papacy to the very dust, for there was here no case of an anti-pope. Both popes had been duly elected, and each had an equal right to be considered the true pope. On the side of the French pope were France, Scotland, Spain, Portugal, Savoy and Lorraine. On the side of the Italian Pope were England, Germany, Italy, Denmark, Sweden and Poland. 
Whereas salvation was held to depend on being in communion with the true Pope, none during all this period could feel sure that he was so, while it was at any rate certain that one half of Europe was not. The position was intolerable, and its results during the forty years it lasted were such as to degrade the papacy to the utmost depth of humiliation. As regards the remaining countries of Europe, in England Henry IV had just usurped the kingdom from Richard II, whom he had murdered. In France, Charles VI was king, but was mad and the country in the greatest disorder. Germany was a mass of insignificant states, and the emperor almost a cipher, the seven princely electors invariably choosing as emperor some prince of small dominions and power, who would be unable to oppose their own assumption of independence. In the Eastern Empire, Constantinople was being closely pressed by the Ottoman Turks. Spain was not as yet one country, Aragon and Castile being still petty independent kingdoms, while all the southern half of Spain was held by the Saracens, or, as they were called, the Moors. The above is an outline of the general state of Europe before those great changes began, in which the Medici were to play so large a part. The Florence in which Giovanni de Bici passed his life, though very different in aspect from that with which we are acquainted, nevertheless contained a good deal which we should still recognise. The baptistery, then already many hundred years old, was much the same as now. So also the Bargello, built about a 150 years before this time, and close to it the Bardia, built in 1330. The Palazzo della Signoria, known to us as the Palazzo Vecchio, built in 1298, was, as to the front portion, much as we see it, but did not extend at the back down the Via de Gondi, while along the front ran a raised platform, the Ringhiera, from which proclamations were made. The Loggia de Lanzi had lately been completed. The cathedral, which had been building for over a hundred years, was still unfinished, and its great dome had not even been begun. While many doubted whether so vast a space could ever be covered in this way, its beautiful campanile, Giotto's tower, was finished. The Ponte Vecchio, with its shops, though not then jeweller's shops, was as now, except, of course, for the passaggio on the roof of the shops, constructed long afterwards. Of the two chief churches, Santa Croce and Santa Maria Novella, the latter was completed, except for its façade, while Santa Croce was approaching completion. The city was surrounded by its ancient and picturesque walls, which are now gone, but its main streets still follow the same course as then, and many of them present much the same general appearance. Or San Michele, the curious square church, built by the Guild of the Wool Merchants, was nearly finished, and behind it stood, as now, the guild house of this celebrated Arte della Lana. As we look at this old house of the great Guild of Wool, with their emblem of the lamb over the door, and think of the many works in which this guild were then occupied in Florence, we cannot but be impressed with the thought of how many other things besides money-making engaged the attention of this enlightened body of merchants, and of how much in Florence's afterglory has had its birth in that now little noticed old building. And it was in connection with these things that a movement was about to begin, which was soon to be the paramount question in Florence. For in our review of the Florence of 1400, we have also to think of the existing state of things in regard to art and learning. These, though in the previous century roused from their long sleep by Dante, Giotto and Petrarch, appeared to have sunk back again into slumber. Dante, whose swan-like dirge of the departing Middle Ages had inspired all mankind for a time, had died eighty years before, and no successor to him had arisen. 
Giotto, the shepherd boy whose kiss had aroused the sleeping beauty, aunt, from her nine centuries of slumber in her Byzantine palace, had died sixty-three years before. His great pupil, Orcagna, had died thirty-two years before. And the painters of the time, the Giotteschi, had no idea beyond that of a slavish copying of Giotto, and so had sunk into a conventionalism almost as complete as that Byzantine tradition from which Giotto had rescued art. Lastly, Petrarch, the great scholar who had led men to study the long-buried writings of the Classic Age, had passed away twenty-six years before, and no other like him had arisen. Thus, when the year 1400 dawned, it seemed as though the movement which had begun in the time of Dante and Giotto was merely a passing phase, already moribund, if not defunct. It was, however, not so. There was soon to be a fresh movement destined far to surpass all that had gone before, and the latter half of Giovanni de Bici's life, with which we have to do, the period from 1400 to 1428, is the time of this morning of the Renaissance, of that extraordinary outburst of art in every branch, which, felt in some degree in other cities of Italy also at this time, seemed in Florence to permeate the whole people with its throbbing life, producing results the influence of which was, before another hundred years were over, to be felt to the utmost bounds of Europe. End of section three. Read by Jane Bennett. Section four of the Medici, volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 1, by G. F. Young. Chapter 3. Giovanni de Bici, Part 2. Giovanni de Bici, 1400 to 1418. Giovanni de Bici, with his wife, Picarda Boeri, and his two sons, Cosimo and Lorenzo, who in the year 1400 were boys of eleven and five, lived first in an old house in the Via Larga, and then in one which still stands in the Piazza del Duomo, and the familiar view which daily met Giovanni's eye from the windows of his house must have been that of the slowly rising walls and dome of the cathedral, begun so long before and intended by Florence to be grander than any yet built. By the year 1400, Giovanni de Bici was a man in middle age, gracious in manner, retiring in disposition, and much respected by all around him. He has received very little notice from historians, but he was the author of various important works for the benefit of his countrymen and for the encouragement of art. He was distinguished for his ability as a financier and for his prudence, the quality always specially admired by the Florentines, and had made himself highly popular with the people by the liberal way in which he spent his wealth for the public benefit and by his constant readiness to be their champion in the never-ceasing struggle against the nobles. Being regardless of fame or notoriety, it is only here and there in the history of the time that notice of him is to be found. Moreover, during his lifetime, the chief influence in Florence was possessed by the Albizzi family, who, notwithstanding the law affecting the nobles, managed, chiefly by influencing the elections, still to exercise power. Meanwhile, Giovanni was laying the foundations of a family which was ere long to obliterate all memory of the sway of the Albizzi. The first occasion when we find him specially mentioned is in the year 1401. In the picture of the Florence of that age, one point has still to be noted, without which that picture would not be complete, namely the terrible outbreaks of the plague 
which again and again devastated the city in those days, keeping the thought of death and the hereafter ever present in the minds of all men. And our story opens in the midst of one of these awful visitations. And again, as in 1348 and so many other occasions, large numbers of all classes were being daily carried off by this terrible disease. In this distress, Florence determined on a costly votive offering to be placed in her oldest and most highly venerated church, San Giovanni Battista, better known as the Baptistery, and that this offering should take the form of two pairs of very elaborate bronze doors. An international competition was instituted to settle who should execute this work, and Giovanni de Bici, as a leading citizen and a great patron of art, was appointed one of the judges in this competition. It is an interesting and significant coincidence that the first mention we have of the first of the Medici should be his taking a prominent part in an event which has always been held as the birthday of the Renaissance in art. During the next 17 years, 1402 to 1418, the chief notices which we have of Giovanni are those showing his quiet but steady advancement in public affairs. In 1402, we find him elected by his guild, that of the bankers, Arte del Cambio, as its prior, which made him a member of the government. And we find him again thus elected in 1408 and in 1411. It is specially recorded that he kept aloof from the many political intrigues of the time, and that these and subsequent higher honours were forced upon him unsought. In 1417, Florence suffered another of those terrible visitations of the plague, which afflicted her on so many occasions. This time, it carried off 16,000 of the inhabitants. Giovanni did his utmost to relieve the many sufferings of the people. While we are told that he did not confine his help only to the poor, but was no less ready to alleviate the misfortunes of the rich. We must now glance at what had been going on in Europe during those 18 years. Contemporary historical events, 1400 to 1418. The first 18 years of the 15th century were years of various great events in Europe, all of which closely affected Florence and its signoria. In 1400, the Emperor Wenceslaus was deposed by the electors for his worthless, savage and drunken character. In his place they chose Rupert, Count Palatine of the Rhine. In 1401, the Turks, under Bajazet, having at last come to the final stage of the long campaign of centuries, against the eastern half of the Roman Empire, and having reached and begun to besiege the capital itself, Constantinople, the eastern emperor, Manuel Paleologus, who had in 1391 succeeded his father, John Paleologus, John VI, like him visited Italy, Germany, France and England to try to rouse them to aid in saving Constantinople and to prevent such a dire calamity to all Europe as its fall into the hands of the Turks. He was received everywhere with imperial honours and much sympathy, but as regards Italy, the papacy was paralysed by the Great Schism, and also would do nothing unless the Eastern Church would agree to acknowledge the supremacy of the Church of Rome while the other Italian states were at almost constant war and threatened at the moment with extinction by Milan. Germany was in chaos, the emperor having just been deposed. In France, the king was out of his mind and the country in the utmost confusion. And in England, the king was a usurper threatened with civil war. So the emperor Manuel Paleologus had to return as unsuccessful as his father had been. 
Help, however, came to Constantinople from an unexpected quarter. The Turkish dominions were suddenly invaded by the Tartars, under Timur, or Tamerlane, which called away the Sultan Bahase from his attack on Constantinople. And at the Battle of Angora in the following year, he was defeated and taken prisoner by Timur. This defeat shattered for a time the power of the Ottoman Turks, and gave Constantinople a last lease of life for another fifty years. In 1402, Gian Galeazzo Visconti, Duke of Milan, suddenly died in the midst of his schemes of conquest, relieving Florence of her most formidable enemy, and enabling her four years later to conquer and annex a part of his dominions, Pisa. This conquest of Pisa extended Florence's territory to the coast and gave her a seaport. In 1409, in Florence's new subject city, took place the Council of Pisa. The effects of the Great Schism, with half the countries of Europe recognising one pope and the other half another, became at length so intolerable that all Europe began to cry out for a reformation of the church in head and members, a phrase constantly on men's lips all through this 15th century, and this was the first of three attempts to that end. The cardinals of both the rival parties deserted their popes and summoned a council of the whole Western Church at Pisa to solve the difficulty. To this council there came about 200 bishops, nearly 300 abbots, over 400 doctors of theology, and the representatives of most of the sovereigns of Europe. The primary point to be fought out was whether a council was supreme over a pope, and therefore able to reform errors in the papacy, or whether a pope was above a council. The 6th century would have been amazed that such a question could be debated. The supreme authority in the church throughout the early centuries having been a general council of equal and independent bishops, each himself under the authority of such a council. But since then one bishop had exalted himself step by step until the time had come that such a question could be debated. However, The council, by the mere fact of assembling on its own authority, and in defiance of two popes, virtually declared itself the highest power in the church. Moreover, it at once proceeded formally to lay down the same, and this done, it deposed both the rival popes for their crimes. Then the council made the mistake which nullified all its work. Instead of proceeding to reform the abuses in the church, and only after this had been done electing a fresh pope, it elected a pope, Alexander V, before attempting to carry out reforms. A natural result followed. Alexander V promptly found means to adjourn the council, nominally for three years, practically for an indefinite period. This futile conclusion of the first attempt to reform the church left matters worse than before. The two deposed popes refused to accept the sentence of the council, so that the only result was that there were now three rival popes instead of two. And so the great schism continued. Florence, for allowing that detested thing a council to assemble in one of her subject cities, was, on behalf of one of the three popes, Gregory XII, attacked by King Ladislas of Naples and while the council was sitting, had to protect its deliberations and her own territory by force of arms, with the result that the Florentine army captured Rome. In 1410, Pope Alexander V died, and was succeeded by Pope John XXIII, and in the same year Sigismund, King of Bohemia, the younger brother of Wenceslaus, was elected emperor. In 1413 in England, Henry IV died and was succeeded by his brilliant son, Henry V. And in 1415, the latter invaded France, because that country would not give him Catherine, 
the king's third daughter, and with her Normandy, Maine, and Anjou. Then followed the great battle of Agincourt, with its crushing defeat for France. In the same year as this great battle between France and England, there took place the Council of Constance, the second attempt to reform the Church. This council was summoned by the Empress Sigismund, that holder of the imperial dignity, whom Carlyle sarcastically calls Sigismund Super Grammaticam. The widely representative and authoritative character of this council may be judged by the list of those who composed it. It included 27 archbishops, 300 bishops, 20 cardinals, 300 abbots and doctors of theology, and 14 deputies of various universities. While there also attended its deliberations, 26 princes, 140 counts, and about 4,000 priests. It sat for over three years at Constance, whose chief fame it has made. It was purposely held out of Italy, whose bishops could not be depended upon to give an independent opinion. And since these latter outnumbered those of all other countries put together, it was ruled that to prevent their having an undue preponderance, the voting should be by nations. This council put an end to the Great Schism, which for more than a generation had been the scandal of Christendom. Having met and appointed the Empress Sigismund to preside, and having formally declared its authority over all ecclesiastics, the Pope included, it deposed all the three rival Popes, and this time they were unable to refuse obedience. Pope John the Twenty Third was, in addition, on account of his crimes, imprisoned for three years in the castle of Heidelberg. But the council then made the same mistake as that of Peter, and before proceeding to reform the abuses in the church, elected a fresh pope, Martin V. He at once used all his power to prevent any real reforms being passed, concluded separate concordas with each national party, and terminated the council as soon as possible. And so this council, like the former one, failed to achieve that reformation of the church which all good men throughout Europe desired. One other thing this council did, which has brought upon it and the Empress Sigismund lasting infamy. This was the burning of John Huss and Jerome of Prague, for teaching the opinions of Wycliffe in Bohemia, and notwithstanding that they were at the council under the emperor's own written safe conduct. The disgraceful and only too well-known argument was employed, here perhaps for the first time, that faith need not be kept with those who were heretics. Sigismund thus dishonoured his word, because he feared that otherwise the council, to bring about which he had laboured earnestly, would break up. They were burnt at Constance, 1416, with every circumstance of odious cruelty, and all else achieved by this council is forever blackened by this detestable deed. This action provoked such indignation in Bohemia that it caused a furious war, in which priests were burnt in pitch, whole towns destroyed, commerce ruined, the death of King Wenceslaus caused, and the Emperor Sigismund three times defeated and finally driven out of the country. These years, 1400 to 1418, are also those of the extensive conquests made by Florence's powerful rival, Venice. Between 1400 and 1414, Venice conquered Verona, Padua, Vicenza, Belluno and Feltre, also Lepanto and Patras, also Guastaglia, Castel Maggiore and Brescello. In 1416, Venice gained a great naval victory over the Turkish fleet at Gallipoli, and in the next few years subdued all the towns on the Dalmatian coast, besides waging successful war against Hungary. 
Venice was at this time at the height of her glory, growing richer and more powerful every year. With annual exports valued at 10 million ducats, while the wealth and magnificence of her governing class was unbounded. Art, 1400 to 1418. Meanwhile, Florence was, in these years, laying the basis of a very different kind of glory, the results of which were to be of much more permanent importance to the world at large. And this wondrous morning of the Renaissance in art, which shone forth in his time, and with which he was intimately connected, must ever be the main interest in looking at the life of this first of the Medici, especially since, owing to his retiring disposition, we only see occasional glimpses of him among events at that time forming all the principal life of Florence. The 15th century started from the very beginning on its wonderful career in this respect. In the first year of the new century occurred that event already mentioned, the competition for the execution of the bronze doors of the baptistery. The work being a votive offering on the part of the entire city was intended to be of the very best description, for which reason this competition to determine by whom it should be executed was instituted among artists of every country. The subject fixed was a bronze panel representing the sacrifice of Isaac. It is impossible to describe the rivalry and enthusiasm called forth by this competition. It was a time when the stirrings of art were felt throughout the entire population of Florence, and the excitement over the matter was intense. When the models were sent in, three of them were considered superior to all others. Those of Ghiberti, Brunelleschi, and Jacopo della Quercia, the two former being Florentines and the third a native of Siena. They were all quite young men, Jacopo della Quercia being 27, Ghiberti, 23, and Brunelleschi, 22. After further consultation, the panel by Ghiberti was judged the best, and the construction of the bronze doors was given to him. The models by Ghiberti and Brunelleschi are preserved in the museum of the Bargello, and there is no doubt that the decision of the judges was correct. Brunelleschi, in disgust, went off to Rome, declaring that he would learn in which Ghiberti should not be able to excel him. This he did, and became the great architect of his time. Ghiberti, one. Ghiberti began his work at once, and was occupied on the first pair of doors, which represent scenes in the life of Christ, for the next 22 years. The labour expended on this work, which was more perfect than anything seen in art up to that time, and which to this day has never been surpassed, was incalculable. Again and again the panels were recast, Ghiberti always striving after something more perfect, and his patience and determination being so great that he again and again destroyed the results he achieved, being resolved not to desist from his labours until he attained the ideal after which he strove. And very wonderful was the aim which he set before himself. In Ghiberti's hands, bronze reliefs became in reality pictures in bronze, even the clouds being represented, and the effect of distance being marvellously rendered. Ghiberti himself tells us, and what he says, while simple enough to us all now, is most interesting when we remember that this is in the early days of art, as follows. In modelling these reliefs, I strove to imitate nature to the utmost. I sought to understand how forms strike upon the eye, and how the theoretical part of sculptural and pictorial art should be managed. 
working with the utmost care and diligence, I introduced into some of my panels as many as a hundred figures. These I modelled upon different planes, so that those nearest to the eye might appear larger, and those more remote, smaller in proportion. As this work proceeded, its influence on art in general was extraordinary. Ghiberti had to employ a number of assistants, and these pictures in bronze, with their lifelike figures and excellent relief, became, as the details of their execution were followed out, a perfect school of art, in which all who had either the sculptor's or the painter's instinct learnt valuable lessons. Besides the effect thus produced on the art world generally, two at least of the assistants employed by Ghiberti in this work learnt therein that which enabled them afterwards to attain fame exceeding even his, the painter Masaccio and the sculptor Donatello. Then followed in 1412, while the above work was still in progress, another event, likewise contributing to help forward the outburst in art. This was the completion by the Guild of the Wool Merchants of their church of Or San Michele, and the decision to adorn the outside of the walls with statues of apostles and saints, each statue to be given by one of the principal guilds. Hence fresh emulation, each guild desiring its statue to be the finest, and all the best sculptors vying with each other in the production of these statues. Or San Michele thus becoming another centre of art inspiration. In this way, there were produced during the next few years, in 1412, Donatello's statue of St. Peter, in 1413, Donatello's statue of St. Mark, in 1414, Ghiberti's statue of St. John the Baptist, in 1415, Ghiberti's statue of St. Stephen, in 1416, Donatello's celebrated statue of St. George. In 1418, Ghiberti's statue of St. Matthew. Statues by other masters followed in subsequent years. End of section 4section 5 of the medici volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the medici volume 1 by g f young chapter 3 giovanni de bici part 3 Giovanni de Bici, 1418 to 1428. Life in Florence in Giovanni's day was a very different thing from that which it became two generations later. Anything in the direction of luxury was condemned by plain living Florence as a sign of degeneracy, and when Giovanni, in order to give assistance to struggling artists, had the whole of the walls of his house decorated with frescoes, a form of decoration hitherto confined to churches, we may be sure that this action was looked upon by many as a questionable innovation, betokening a reprehensible tendency to voluptuousness. For very austere indeed was the style of living then customary. The palaces of even the most wealthy were furnished with a plainness which scorned all idea of either beauty or comfort heavy tables and straight-backed wooden chairs covered with leather, bare stone floors, desperately cold in winter, whitewashed walls, only covered with tapestry on state occasions, a huge credenza containing vases, glass, majolica and silver for use at banquets, wide, hard, comfortless beds and great chests containing linen and clothes. Such were the surroundings, and such the only furniture considered necessary, even in the palaces of the noblest families. As to dress, there was the same austerity. 
And here Florence enacted very strict laws to check undue extravagance. These laws laid down with the most minute exactness what a lady's dress might be like and what it might not be like, and the same as regards the men. No lady might have her dress made of other material, nor of greater length or breadth than was laid down, nor wear any of numerous forbidden ornaments. While for the men was prescribed, for all above the class of artisans, the plain garment, buttoned straight down the front and looking like a priest's cassock, which is to be seen in all the earlier portraits in this book. We do not hear much about the ladies of this period. It was not until a generation or two later that they began to come forth from the seclusion considered correct in Giovanni's time. But they evidently fought vigorously against these laws about dress. They evaded them in numberless ingenious ways and waged an untiring warfare with the authorities on the subject. In this contest, which went on perpetually between the ladies and the officials charged with seeing that these sumptuary laws were obeyed, for which thorny task foreigners, i.e. non-Florentines, were purposely appointed. The officers concerned had evidently no pleasant time. One of them reports as follows. When, obeying the orders ye gave me, I went out to seek for the forbidden ornaments of your women, they met me with arguments such as are not to be found in any book of laws. There cometh a woman with the peak of her hood, fringed out and twined around her head. My notary saith, Tell me your name, for you have a peak with fringes. Then the good woman taketh this peak, which is fastened round her hood with a pin, and holding it in her hand, she declareth that it is a wreath. Then going further, he findeth one wearing many buttons in front of her dress, and he saith unto her, Ye are not allowed to wear these buttons. But she answers, These are not buttons, but studs, and if ye do not believe me, look. They have no loops, and moreover, there are no buttonholes. Then my notary goeth to another who is wearing ermine, and saith, Now, what can she say to this? Ye are wearing ermine. And he prepares to write down her name. But the woman answers, Do not write me down, for this is not ermine, it is the fur of a suckling. Saith the notary, what is this suckling? And the woman replies, It is an animal. No wonder that the authorities remark, We do but knock our heads against a wall. And that in the next generation these sumptuary laws were gradually allowed to become a dead letter, the ladies having gained the victory. In 1418, we hear of Giovanni giving a large sum of money to assist one whose deservedly incurred misfortunes, we are told, roused his pity. In conjunction with the chief of the party of the nobles, Niccolò da Uzzano, he obtained after strong efforts the release of the deposed and imprisoned Pope John XXIII on condition that a ransom of 38,000 ducats should be paid, and the whole of this sum Giovanni himself gave. Pope John, on being released, came, broken down and destitute, to Florence, and was given an asylum there by Giovanni, who, when the deposed Pope died in the following year, erected to his memory the beautiful monument which is to be seen in the baptistery. In 1419, we find Giovanni at his own cost erecting and endowing an important charitable institution which remains to the present day, the Foundling Hospital of Florence, the Ospedale degli Innocenti, and in carrying out this charitable work, he also managed to help forward the cause of art. Brunelleschi had by this time returned to Florence, having in the intervening years carried out his determination to learn another branch of art, 
in which Ghiberti should not be able to rival him, but he had not yet obtained any opportunity of displaying his powers. Giovanni gave him this opportunity by entrusting the construction of his new hospital to him. Though afterwards eclipsed by his other achievements, the Foundling Hospital remains notable as being the great architect's first prominent work. In 1421, Giovanni received the highest mark of esteem which his country could confer. In spite of the opposition of the nobles, who urged that it was unsafe to allow one so wealthy and so popular to hold that office, he was, without any seeking for it on his part, elected gonfaloniere. In 1422, Florence entered on a four years' war with Milan, whose duke, Filippo Maria Visconti, the cowardly and treacherous son of Gian Galeazzo, was threatening to absorb all northern Italy. Giovanni de' Bici was against this war, feeling that Florence was not strong enough for it and could not afford the cost. And in it, Florence suffered no less than six serious defeats within a space of about two years. Nevertheless, she gained in the end the object for which she fought. After four years of war, Venice joined her against Milan, with the eventual result that the designs of the Duke of Milan were frustrated, and he was forced to conclude a peace, the terms of which were honourable to Florence. Thus, twice during twenty-five years had Florence stood in the breach and prevented two successive Dukes of Milan from subduing all Italy. These two wars are said to have cost Florence a sum equal in our present money to six million pounds sterling. In 1426, Giovanni succeeded in effecting, in spite of every kind of opposition from the nobles, the chief political measure of his life. This was his celebrated catasto, the new form of taxation devised by him. The main tax on the people had hitherto been an irregular poll tax, which bore very unfairly upon them, and gave unlimited opportunities to the nobles to exercise oppression. It was consequently hated by the people. Giovanni worked out a scheme to substitute for this a fixed tax on property, which would be regular in its incidence and to prevent the nobles from evading their due share of the general taxation, and by his weight and influence in the Signoria, succeeded in getting this measure passed. And this, notwithstanding that it increased very largely the amount he would himself have to pay. The nobles were, of course, furious and accused him of all sorts of ulterior motives. But Giovanni, having no such motives, went on his way undisturbed. And for this immense boon which he had procured for them, the people looked on him as their saviour and benefactor, and were ready to do anything for one who had fought thus strenuously on their behalf. In 1427, Giovanni performed his last act as a champion of the cause of the poorer classes. A number of the nobles, headed by Rinaldo degli Albizzi and Niccolò da Uzzano, held a secret meeting to devise means for reducing the power of the people in the government. The plan they eventually settled upon was to put forward a suggestion to the Signoria to reduce the number of the inferior guilds, and also to remove the prohibition against members of the nobili being eligible for election to the Signoria, using the argument that the time had passed when such a prohibition was necessary. Having elaborated the details of their plan, the nobili on a suitable occasion submitted their suggestion to the Signoria for discussion. The proposal, in the manner in which it was put forward, was a specious one, while its real object was kept carefully veiled. But Giovanni, ever on the watch to defend the cause of the people, fathomed its real intention. He exerted the whole weight of his influence to oppose the measure, 
and entirely through his vigorous opposition it was defeated. By this, the last act of his public life, he increased still more his popularity with the people. The wrath of the nobles was proportionate, and all the more so since they could not openly show it, without disclosing to all what their object had been. Giovanni on this occasion showed the sagacity to detect, the courage to oppose, and the sound judgment to foil without an open conflict, a dangerous attempt to revolutionise the government. Contemporary Historical Events, 1418 to 1428 the chief events outside Italy during these years were the following. In 1420, Henry V of England, having by this time conquered all France north of the Loire, the Treaty of Troyes was executed. By this treaty, the crown of France was secured to him, to the exclusion of the Dauphin Charles, whenever the mad king, Charles VI, should die. And meanwhile, Henry was made regent of France and at last married to the French king's daughter, Catherine. In 1422, Charles VI and Henry V both died and the latter was succeeded by his six-months-old son, Henry VI, the Earl of Bedford being appointed regent of France on his behalf during his minority. In 1425, the emperor... Manuel Paleologus died, and his son, John Paleologus, John the Seventh, succeeded him as Emperor of the Eastern Empire, by this time reduced to little more than its capital city, Constantinople. In 1428, the Regent Bedford, having gained several victories over the Dauphin Charles, crossed the Loire and began his memorable siege of Orléans the key to the south of France. Art, 1418 to 1428. The years 1418 to 1428 were years of still further developments in that outburst of new life in the world of art taking place in Florence. In the year 1418, the cathedral, begun by Arnolfo di Cambio 120 years before, and which, when finished, would be the largest then existing, was approaching completion. But it still wanted its dome, and all concerned were in despair as to how a dome was ever to be thrown over so vast a space. At length Brunelleschi, who was then building the foundling hospital, came forward and offered to do it, but would not say how. There was great opposition to giving the task to him, and the reason is important as showing the conditions from which art had gradually to emancipate itself. Every citizen of Florence who aspired either to have any political rights or to take any part in the important public works from time to time being executed had to belong to one or other of the 21 guilds. The seven major guilds were 1. Wool Merchants 2 dyers of foreign cloth, three, silk merchants, four, furriers, five, bankers, six, judges and lawyers, and seven, doctors and apothecaries. There was no special guild for the workers in art. The painters had to belong to the guild of apothecaries. The architects and sculptors, either to the guild of the wool merchants or to that of the silk merchants. The fourteen minor guilds were simply those of the various trades and had lesser privileges. Brunelleschi, 1. Up to the time when Brunelleschi made the above refusal to announce his plans, every great public work such as this was done collectively under the auspices of some particular guild, and anything like independent working in such matters was unprecedented and the whole work of erecting the cathedral was carried out by a board of works, acting under the orders of the Guild of the Wool Merchants. Brunelleschi, being of an independent character, detested this system, which hampered all artists much, but especially architects. 
Since his disappointment over the bronze doors, he had spent nearly 20 years in studying architecture, more especially the ancient buildings at Rome, and was now confident that he knew a way of building the great dome and without using any scaffolding, this point being the chief difficulty. But if he succeeded in building it, he desired that it should be his and not that of the Board of Works, and did not want to tell his secret only to have it appropriated by a corporate body, who might also modify his designs. But this was just what the Board wished to be able to do. Such novel independence was, in their opinion, most objectionable and required putting down. And so there was a tremendous contest. However, eventually Brunelleschi prevailed simply because all knew by this time that he was the only man who could construct the dome. The work was given to him, and the construction began in 1420. And though even after this there were constant battles, still, by degrees, the great dome slowly rose on his designs and under his superintendence. It was built without any scaffolding, and on a principle Brunelleschi had learned from studying the roof of the Pantheon at Rome. He tells us that managing while at Rome to get on the roof of the Pantheon, and to take off some of the outer stones, so as to inspect the ribbing of the vault, and discovering the way the blocks of stone were dovetailed into one another, so as to be almost self-supporting, this gave him his ideas for the Dome of Florence while it also led him to conceive how to utilise crossbeams to gird the ribs together, and how a second dome within the first would strengthen the whole. The dome is built on this principle, one dome within the other, and the two bound together so as to support each other, with a space between sufficient for a staircase, and each dome resting on a drum. It was the first of the kind ever constructed, was considered the wonder of the age, and is the largest double cupola in Europe. Domes had, of course, been a feature of Byzantine architecture, but the great change made by the Renaissance was that caused by lifting the dome on a drum, the dome thus becoming the chief feature of the building. It is interesting to notice how, as it had been with learning, and as it had been with sculpture, so here again with architecture we have a resurrection of the long past, and Brunelleschi receives his inspiration from the Pantheon, built by the Emperor Hadrian 1300 years before. In 1425, Giovanni de Bici gave a commission to Brunelleschi which resulted in one of the three chief works for which the latter has obtained fame the Church of San Lorenzo, now so famous on account of its tombs of the Medici family. This church, one of the most ancient in Italy, having been consecrated by St. Ambrose himself in A.D. 393, was in 1423 falling into ruins. Giovanni now undertook to rebuild it, devoting thereto a large amount of his fortune, and after his time, it was when completed endowed by his descendants and became the family church of the Medici. On this church, Brunelleschi lavished all his talent, and it is one of his finest creations. Simmons, speaking of it, says, quote, Not a form or detail in the whole church is at variance with classic precedent and yet the general effect resembles nothing that we possess of antique work. It is a masterpiece of intelligent Renaissance adaptation. Unquote. Following as he did the sobriety and correctness of the classic style, the keynote of which is harmony, Brunelleschi's buildings are remarkable for this latter characteristic. They never give one that jar which, like a discordant note in music, is produced by a falsity in architecture, and whose effect we feel, even though perhaps unable to point out wherein it lies. 
his churches of san lorenzo and santo spirito are both of them examples of this characteristic of harmony and to it is undoubtedly due their indescribably peaceful effect ghiberti two in fourteen twenty four the first pair of bronze doors on which ghiberti had so long been at work were at last finished they had taken him twenty-two years the enthusiasm when they were set up was tremendous nothing like this in art had been seen before all florence crowded to see them and the signoria who never quitted the palazzo della signoria in a body except on the greatest occasions came in state to applaud the work and do honour to the artist when we think of all that this work had called forth in every branch of art during the long years he had been employed on it of the genius which had created this wonderful new departure and of the determined perseverance by which alone the work was brought to such perfection we are led to feel that ghiberti deserved any honour which his countrymen and their governing body could confer upon him ghiberti by this time a man of forty-five at once set to work on his second pair of doors which were destined to take him still longer and to surpass even the first pair in excellence Masoccio. in fourteen twenty three seven years after donatello had produced his statue of st george three years after brunelleschi had begun to construct his dome and one year before ghiberti finished his first pair of bronze doors painting showed that same new burst of life which had already been shown by architecture and sculpture for in that year masaccio afterwards so famous and destined to advance the art of painting by so immense a step that he became the leader of all painters after him began his frescoes in the brancacci chapel of the church of the carmelites the carmine the influence of ghiberti's work of the bronze doors is in the case of masaccio directly traceable born in the year of the competition of fourteen o one he worked as a boy under ghiberti on the panels of these doors and there learnt the knowledge of form effect of light and shade and other secrets which he afterwards elaborated in his paintings in these by a proper use of light and shade he gave roundness to the limbs was the first to give to figures natural attitudes and a lifelike appearance and to drapery natural folds improved the drawing of heads and hands and as Vasari says improved everything but this was not recognized until after his short life had ended he was crushed with poverty burdened with the maintenance of younger brothers always ready to do a good turn to others but careless about his own affairs and entirely absorbed in his painting was almost unknown dying at the age of twenty-seven only four years after he began painting these frescoes his life was so short and he was so hampered by debt that he has left very few works except for two small unimportant pictures at berlin and one in the academia at florence no picture of masaccio's is in any of the galleries of europe and all his fame rests on the frescoed walls of one small chapel in florence nevertheless with him painting entered on a new epoch and the brancacci chapel has become sacred ground to all painters since there almost all the great masters after him including vasari tells us perugino leonardo da vinci raphael michelangelo andrea del sarto fra bartolomeo and many of lesser genius have studied and copied the works of one who is the inaugurator of all that we understand by modern painting in this chapel wrought one of the few nature's interpreters the few 
whom genius gives as lights to shine, Masaccio. Look around, and know that where we stand stood oft and long, oft till the day was gone, Raphael himself. Nor he alone so great the ardour there, such while it reigned the generous rivalry. He and how many more, once thither drawn, anxious to learn of those who came before, to steal a spark from their immortal fire, who first did break the universal gloom, sons of the morning. Rogers, Italy Giovanni de Bici, in his readiness to befriend struggling artists, assisted the poor youth who was then so little known, and Masaccio introduced a portrait of him into his fresco picture of the consecration of the Carmine Church in 1422, but this fresco was destroyed when the greater part of that church was burnt in 1721. At some time during the year 1427, Masaccio ended his painting for the Carmelite community and went off to Rome. None know for what purpose, for of such an insignificant person nothing was at that time recorded, but presumably in order to obtain work and there in the following year he died in poverty and obscurity, unknown to fame until after he was dead, when the world awoke to the knowledge of what a genius had been living in that obscure corner of Florence where he had worked. Giovanni de Bici, 1428 Giovanni died in 1428, at the age of 68, and at his death left an immense fortune to his two sons, Cosimo and Lorenzo. He died deservedly esteemed by his countrymen, beloved by the humbler classes of the people, who had so often found in him a defender, and whose welfare he had consistently promoted, remembered with gratitude by all who, struggling to rise in some branch of art, had never failed to receive from him a helping hand, and respected even by some amongst the nobili, who, though always opposed by him, had never found him other than an honourable antagonist. Machiavelli, describing his character, says, He never sought the honours of government, yet enjoyed them all. When holding high office, he was courteous to all. Not a man of great eloquence, but of an extraordinary prudence. Giovanni had assisted at the birth of the movement, in which Ghiberti, Brunelleschi, Donatello and Masaccio were the leaders. He had helped its onward course, and he died as its mourning ended with the death of Masaccio, and began to pass into full noon. Thus the chief interest connected with his life will always be that memorable outburst in art which took place between the years 1400 and 1428, burning with such ardour among the Florentines that it threw even politics into the background and formed the prominent feature in the life of Florence during his time. He lies buried with Picarda, his wife, in the old sacristy, in the church of San Lorenzo, the only portion of the rebuilt church which was finished at the time of his death. Their fine tomb, richly ornamented with figures of putti and garlands of flowers, stands in the centre of the sacristy, with a large marble table over it. The tomb is interesting from the fact that isolated tombs like this, though common in other countries, were very rare in Italy. Such was the founder of this family, which was destined to have so momentous a history. He laid the foundations of the family solidly, not so much by the popularity which he won through his steadfast championship of the cause of the humbler classes, as by the principles of magnanimity, generosity, courtesy and care for the people, which he taught his sons, and caused to become an unwritten law in this family for three generations after him. As we look at the kindly and sensible old face in his portrait, 
we feel how well it was for Florence in after years that Giovanni de Bici de' Medici possessed the character that he did. It will be seen how, on his death, the party of the nobles took steps to destroy his work, as well as to prevent these upstart Medici from rising any higher. End of section 5「Section six of the Medici, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The Medici, Volume One by G. F. Young. Part One Introduction. Chapter Four. Cosimo, Pater Patriae. Part One. Giovanni de Bici's two sons were Cosimo and Lorenzo. Cosimo's branch, which includes all the greater Medici, eventually, in the seventh generation, died out, when the succession passed to Lorenzo's branch, which carried on the family through six more generations, attained that crown which the elder branch had striven for and made possible, and at last, in its turn, also died out in 1743. As the best way of avoiding confusion, the history follows the elder branch right down to its end, part one, before returning to take up, part two, the story of the younger branch from its commencement with Lorenzo downwards. This is rendered the easier since the first few generations of the younger branch have scarcely any independent history of their own, theirs being almost entirely merged in that of the elder branch, so that the period when the younger branch has an independent history is a comparatively short one. Chapter 4. Cosimo, Pater Patriae. Born 1389, ruled 1434 to 1464, died 1464. When Giovanni de Bici died, his eldest son Cosimo was 40 years old. Up to that time we have only one episode recorded of him, viz. that when in 1450 the Council of Constance was assembled, and Pope John the Twenty Third, forced by the Emperor Sigismund, very reluctantly proceeded to it, Cosimo de Medici, then twenty-six years old, who had known him before he became Pope, went with him at the risk of his life to help to defend him, and had to fly in disguise when Pope John was deposed and imprisoned by the Council. Cosimo had shortly before this adventure been married to Contessina di Bardi, and his eldest son, Piero, was born, apparently in the Bardi Palace, while Cosimo was absent at the above council. The Bardi were in the 14th century the richest banking family in Florence. Though they themselves have disappeared, their oldest palace still stands in the street, which was once their property, and still bears their name, the Via de Bardi, always to us reminiscent of Romola but they had fallen on evil days before Cosimo's marriage to the eldest daughter of the house, having been gradually ruined, owing to the loss of a large sum of money which, lent by them to Edward III of England, had never been repaid. By this marriage, the Bardi Palace came into the possession of the Medici family, and Cosimo appears, during his father's lifetime, to have lived there, his arms with eight red balls, being still to be seen in some of the rooms. Cosimo had been educated at the celebrated school attached to the Camaldolis Monastery of Santa Maria degli Angeli in the Via degli Alfani. He knew Greek, Latin, Hebrew and Arabic, besides several modern languages, and was passionately fond of both learning and art. He also possessed all of the qualities which distinguish his father, and on becoming head of the family, soon showed that he would be likely to play a more prominent part in Florentine affairs than his father. The family were by this time growing enormously wealthy, owning banks in as many as sixteen capital cities in Europe, and Cosimo's great wealth, courteous demeanour, ability and tact, all joined as it was to a generous disposition, made him fully as popular with the people as his father had been. 
In Cosimo de' Medici, the party of the nobles, the Grandi, then headed by the powerful family of the Albizzi, saw a formidable opponent. They already detested this wealthy family, who were rising from the class of the Populani and gaining such influence, and they saw in its new head one who aroused their bitterest jealousy. They therefore determined that the Medici must be entirely rooted out of Florence. This, however, was not easy to accomplish, Cosimo's popularity being so great. Moreover, the most respected of their number, the aged Niccolò de Uzzano, was against any such design. Machiavelli tells us that when the other nobles consulted him regarding their proposed action against the Medici, he warned them that in a trial of strength the latter would win, that if Cosimo were put to death as they desired, Florence would be in danger of having Rinaldo degli Albizzi as a despot, and that if either was to prevail of the two, he preferred Cosimo. But, he added, God deliver this city from private usurpation, so that for the present the nobles were forced to bide their time. In 1430, two years after his father's death, Cosimo began to carry out a project which he had had under consideration from the time he succeeded his father, that of building a new palace for the family. For this he chose a site in the Via Larga, the widest street in the city, at the corner where it was joined by a short street, the Via de Gori, which ran down to the church of San Lorenzo, then being rebuilt with the family money, and which, when completed, he purposed to endow. This palace, Cosimo, intended should be a model of architectural art, and should surpass anything of the kind at that time seen. Brunelleschi was now the foremost architect of the age. His dome was approaching completion. He was also building the church of San Lorenzo, and in the same year began his other church of Santo Spirito. So Cosimo had at first proposed to employ him in designing his new palace. But on seeing Brunelleschi's plan, he considered it too grand in character, and instead of it accepted a less pretentious one by Michelozzo, an architect then coming into notice, and who, chiefly through this work, became recognised as second only to Brunelleschi, for the adornment of the cortile of the palace when it should be completed, Cosimo gave various commissions to Donatello, by this time acknowledged as the leading sculptor. These included the bronze statue of David, now in the museum of the Bargello, the bronze statue of Judith slaying Holofernes, now in the Loggia di Lanzi, and the medallions copied from antique gems, still to be seen over the arches of the cortile. The first of these works, the David, was an epoch-making statue, in the history of art, having probably a greater influence than any other single statue ever executed. It was finished within the next three years before Cosimo's exile, the other commissions being completed later. In 1432, Niccolò de Uzzano, for so many years the respected leader of the Nobili, though latterly thrown into the shade by Rinaldo degli Albizzi, died. He was one of the best statesmen Florence had ever possessed, consistently employing his influence to check the party rivalries of his countrymen. His restraining influence being removed, the nobles proceeded to carry out their resolve to get rid of these Medici who were becoming such formidable champions of the people. Complete success in this object required, they considered, the death of Cosimo himself and the banishment of the rest of the family including his brother Lorenzo and their first cousin Avarado. In the case of a family of bankers, such a banishment, particularly if they were dispersed, would soon cause their ruin. With the Albizzi family at their head, the Nobili now took steps to effect these objects, and the new palace, so much superior to any hitherto built in Florence, assisted them in their design. Now that the walls began to attain sufficient height, for the general style of the building to be appreciated, and particularly the novel and expensive rustica style of the lower story. Having by a skilful manipulation of the elections of the year 1433 obtained a signoria considerably under their influence, 
the Albizzi party accused Cosimo to the government of scheming to exalt himself above the rank of an ordinary citizen, the worst charge possible in Florence, and pointed, among other things, to the new palace as being too grand for a simple citizen, denoting an ambition dangerous to the Republic. Whereupon Cosimo was suddenly arrested and consigned to a cell in the tower of the Palazzo della Signoria, while arrangements were made for his speedy judicial murder. But the temper of the populace, when they heard what was going on, became so formidable that that plan had, after a day or two, to be abandoned. The nobles then attempted to employ poison, and commissioned two of their number to effect this. Cosimo had from the first expected that this method would be employed, and for the first three days of his imprisonment would eat nothing, but the second plan also failed, as Cosimo's jailer, Federico Malavonti, refused to be corrupted. So the nobles had to be content with his banishment, but Cosimo had a narrow escape. In due course, a sentence of banishment was passed by the Signoria, a regular decree of ostracism in the Greek style being drawn up. The whole of the Medici were exiled, Cosimo and his family to Padua, his brother Lorenzo to Venice, and his cousin Averardo to Naples, and they were escorted under a guard to the frontier. The decree declared that the Medici were banished from the city and state of Florence, being dangerous to the Republic by reason of their wealth and ambition. The sentence of exile and the reasons for it were published in all other states, so as to make their disgrace as public as possible, and the nobles, though they had failed to secure Cosimo's death, were satisfied that they had nevertheless achieved the ruin of the Medici. Thus were the Medici for the first time cast forth in ignominy by Florence as foes to her republic. It was an experience they were to undergo three times in the course of their history. On this first occasion it occurred solely to satisfy the desire of the nobles to get rid of the one family that stood in the way of a return to that state of things wherein the power had been in the hands of the nobles, an object the latter had never ceased to work for since the reform of the Constitution, which had placed all power in the hands of the people. It is often asserted that the germs of an aim to destroy the Republic and erect a despotic monarchy in its place existed in the Medici from the first, but so far, at all events, as this first banishment is concerned, the statement is proved in the most practical manner to be untrue. For whereas suspicions of this nature, when once aroused, have, if there be any basis for them, a tendency to grow stronger in the absence of the accused, and certainly would do so in such a city, yet, in this case, the very reverse occurred, and Florence, by her action a year afterwards, conclusively proved that there were no grounds for the charge. By Cosimo's exile, the work on the Bedici Palace was brought to a standstill, and as neither Michelozzo nor Donatello desired to remain in a city which had cast him out, they also went into exile, Michelozzo accompanying Cosimo and Donatello proceeding to Rome to study such remains of the classic sculpture as were to be found there though these were at the time extremely few, the popes not having begun to collect such things, and all the treasures now to be seen in the sculpture galleries of the Vatican and the capital then lying buried under the ruins of the devastated city. Contemporary Historical Events, 1428-1433 to 1433. The chief events during the first five years after Cosimo became head of the family with the great change which at this time came over the long struggle between France and England, known as the Hundred Years' War, and the assembly of the Council of Baal, the third of the attempts of the 15th century to reform the Church. Also, on a smaller stage, Florence's two wars against Lucca and against Milan. Regarding the first of the above events, it has been noted how, in 1428, the English, then masters of all northern France advanced southwards and laid siege to Orléans. Then came Joan of Arc, and in three years, 1428 to 1431, changed the whole aspect of affairs in France. 
the details of her career ending in a death which was to the lasting disgrace of both English and French are well known. The English power in France never recovered the blow dealt it by her victories, and from this time forth the English were steadily driven backwards. In 1431, the same year that Joan of Arc was burnt at Rouen, the Council of Baal was assembled. In that year, Martin V, the Pope, who had been elected at the Council of Constance, died. He had revived the autocratic view of the papacy, which had been maintained by the popes of the 13th century, had ruled that archbishops and bishops are merely the delegates of the pope, and had endeavoured to prevent all further assembling of councils to reform the church, by ruling that popes were superior to councils. It was a strange outcome of the work of such a council as that of Constance. However, on his death his rulings were ignored, and a third attempt to reform the church was made by the assembly of the Council of Baal. It was convened, like that of Constance, by the Emperor Sigismund. The new Pope, Eugenius IV, having failed in his endeavour to prevent its meeting, or to get it dissolved as soon as the preliminary proceedings were concluded, was, through fear of being deposed, at length forced to acknowledge that a Pope is subject to a Council, and sent four cardinals to represent him at it. This council was sitting at Baal from 1431 to 1438. It passed various decrees of reform which the Pope accepted. Then, as it proceeded to deal stronger blows at the papacy, the Pope tried to remove it to Italy. The council, however, refused to be removed. Its subsequent dealings with Pope Eugenius IV will be noted hereafter. During the years 1429 to 1433, Florence was dragged into two small wars which brought her much discredit. The Albizzi, wielding the chief influence, first persuaded the government to enter on an unjust aggressive war against Lucca, and then prosecuted this war with such an utter want of ability that it was no wonder that it was completely unsuccessful and Florence, in this attempt to conquer Lucca, reaped nothing but expense, failure, and loss of prestige. This war produced one with Milan, which languished on undecisively until 1433, when a temporary peace was patched up. These two wars, whose only result was an increased expenditure, brought much disfavour upon the Albizzi, who were entirely responsible for them. Cosimo 1434. The first exile of the Medici lasted only for one year. The large majority of the population loved this munificent and gracious family, and by the time a year had passed saw that they had been made a cat's paw to assist the manoeuvres of the nobles, and that while there was no ground for the accusation against the Medici, there was every ground for suspecting the motive of the nobles for the Albizzi and their party, when once they had got rid of the people's main supporter, proceeded, by their scarcely concealed plotting against the democratic form of the government, which Florence had gained through so many struggles, to give the people good reason for such fears. So in September 1434, the decree of banishment against the Medici was annulled, and messages were sent inviting their return. The Albizzi thereupon flew to arms, assembled their adherents to the number of about 800, and made an attempt to seize the government before Cosimo should return. But the Signoria obtained troops from Pistoia, and the attempt failed. On the 6th of October, Cosimo re-entered Florence with a public triumph, almost like that given to a conqueror, and in the midst of a rejoicing populace. Machiavelli says... Seldom has a citizen returning from a great victory been greeted by such a concourse of people and with such demonstrations of affection as was Cosimo on his return from exile. And Cosimo's unassuming demeanour, even on the occasion of so honourable a triumph over his enemies, increased still further his popularity. His subsequent conduct did him equal honour, in any other state in Europe at that time of the world's history, such a return to power 
would assuredly have been followed by the putting to death of those whose enmity had caused what had been endured. Cosimo and his whole family had been treated with the bitterest animosity by the nobles, and with the greatest ingratitude by those members of the Signoria whom the nobles had induced to do their will. The humiliation of himself and his family had been made known in all the surrounding states. They had been put to much fear, inconvenience and loss. His own life had been attempted, and nothing had been omitted to secure the total ruin of his family. Yet, when thus triumphantly brought back by the will of the people, with ample power to retaliate, we find Cosimo firmly refusing to allow any of those who had caused these things to be put to death. On the other hand, that some should suffer banishment on account not of what had been done to the Medici, but of the attempt which had been made before their return to overthrow the government, was inevitable. The Albizzi and their party could not expect to get off unpunished after such an endeavour. Those writers who are anxious to find cause against the Medici have accused Cosimo of a vindictive policy on this occasion, but this is unjust. The Signoria, terribly frightened at the attempt, which had nearly succeeded, of the Albizzi and their party to seize the government by force of arms, passed a sentence of exile against some eighty of them. It was not an unnatural result of their conduct, but in any case there is no evidence that this and other repressive measures against the Albizzi party, some of which measures had been already taken before his arrival, were instigated by Cosimo at all. A few months after the above triumphant return, Cosimo received from his city the most practical demonstration it could give of its entire revulsion of sentiment towards him and regret for the treatment which he and his had received. He was elected gonfalonier and held that office for the next two months. Contemporary Historical Events 1433 to 1434 Meanwhile, Pope Eugenius IV had become involved in many troubles, mainly through his continued opposition to the Council of Baal. The Emperor Sigismund, at length being determined to force the Pope to submit to the reforms which the Council was striving to pass, but which the Pope's delegates were obstructing, proceeded to Italy, being invited thither by Filippino Visconti, Duke of Milan, who hoped that the Emperor would assist him in the war he was then carrying on against Florence and Venice. After staying for some time with the Duke of Milan, and after being crowned with the Iron Crown of Lombardy, the Emperor, avoiding Florence's territory, proceeded by way of Lucca and Siena to Rome, where he was crowned by Pope Eugenius in St. Peter's in 1433. Thence he started on his way back to Baal, apparently less ready than he had hitherto been to support the council against the Pope. But immediately afterwards, Fortebraccio, commander of the Milanese troops, marched upon Rome, while at the same time Francesco Sforza, also in behalf of the Duke of Milan, seized a large part of the papal territories in Romagna, declaring that he was authorised to do so by the Council of Baal. The eventual result was that Pope Eugenius was, in 1434, forced to fly from Rome in disguise and in danger of his life, the people of Rome joining with his other foes in expelling him. He took refuge at Florence, arriving there just at the time of Cosimo's recall from exile, and at Florence this Pope resided for the next eight years, while Rome remained in possession of his enemies. End of section 6「Section 7 of the Medici, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The Medici, Volume 1 by G. F. Young. Chapter 4 Cosimo, Pater Patriae, Part 2. 
Cosimo, 1434 to 1439. Cosimo, at the time of his recall from banishment, in 1434, was 45 years of age and thenceforth became the acknowledged leading citizen of the Florentine Republic. But knowing well the fickle nature of popular favour and the peculiar temperament of his countrymen, their habit of constant change, their tendency to fall a prey to one faction after another, and above all their jealousy of any individual who seemed inclined to exalt himself, he saw that an immense task lay before him if he was to retain that position. It has generally been assumed that Cosimo was actuated solely by personal ambition, but he had other motives than this. Apart from all question of personal or family ambition, he desired to retain that position for two reasons eminently honourable to him. The poorer classes were ground down under a crushing burden of taxation due to the heavy cost to each individual citizen of wars so constantly undertaken by a state whose population was comparatively small. This evil he desired to remedy by so guiding foreign affairs as to make such wars less frequent. Again, he saw that the same cause was severely hampering Florence's commerce, while, as a banker on a wide scale, he felt that if he could create peace, he would be able considerably to extend Florentine markets and increase the commercial wealth of the Florentines. Feeling that he possessed in himself the ability to do these things, it was in every way natural that he should wish to show that he could do them. Ambition of this kind is not a fault, but a virtue. But to do all this he must be Florence's leading citizen, no matter who might from time to time be gone falonier, and in order to retain permanently this position, one which could never be more than tacitly granted, two things would be necessary. First, to make all foreign countries recognise that he, and he alone, was the motive power in the Florentine state, and second, to convince his own countrymen that no one else could so satisfactorily manage their affairs, and in particular their foreign affairs, so that they should be glad to leave all such matters in his hands. And both these things must be done in such a way as never to arouse in the Florentines that peculiar jealousy of any kind of authority which they were so apt to develop. Such was the task before Cosimo, one at which any man might have quailed in view of the temperament of the Florentine people of his time, as well as the conditions of perpetual intrigue in the midst of which it must be carried out. Yet, as will be seen in the sequel, he accomplished with complete success this difficult task. But it was not only in the political sphere that Cosimo won renown. Many and varied were the matters which he took in hand for the advancement of learning, the encouragement of art, and the assistance of charitable institutions. Before all else he was a deep scholar, one of those who loved learning for its own sake. He maintained a regular staff of agents, always employed in searching in the East for rare and important manuscripts, which became the nucleus of the great library which he founded. He instituted the celebrated Platonic Academy for the study of the rediscovered Plato, of whose writings he was an enthusiastic admirer. No scholar applied to him in vain, and the ways in which he promoted the cause of learning were numberless. Gibbon says of him, Cosimo was the father of a line of princes whose name and age are almost synonymous with the restoration of learning, his credit was ennobled into fame, his riches were dedicated to the service of mankind, he corresponded at once with Cairo and London, and a cargo of Indian spices and Greek books were often imported in the same vessel. To art he gave similar assistance. He was a liberal patron to the painters Fra Angelico and Lippi, to the sculptors Ghiberti and Donatello, and to the architects Brunelleschi and Michelozzo. He collected objects of art of every kind, and he made his collections open to all artists. No less lavish were his charities. He gave large sums for the rebuilding of many churches and monasteries, including the Badia of Fiesol, the Monastery of San Marco, and the Church of San Lorenzo. 
built a hospital at Jerusalem for sick and infirm pilgrims, and bore a large part in every charitable work undertaken in Florence. Such was the man who, in 1434, became the leading citizen of the Florentine Republic, and set forth on the political task which has been mentioned. In 1435, Francesco Sforza, the celebrated condottier commander, visited Florence. During this visit he developed a great liking for Cosimo, and thus began that friendship between them which, in after years, had important political results. In 1436, Brunelleschi completed his dome, and the cathedral, begun a 138 years before by Arnolfo du Cambio, was at last finished. This completion of the great work upon which four generations had laboured was a notable event, and a ceremony worthy of the occasion was arranged. Pope Eugenius IV was at this time residing at the monastery of Santa Maria Novella, and the cathedral was solemnly consecrated by him on the Feast of the Annunciation, 25th March, 1436. A raised passage, richly carpeted and decorated with tapestry, damask, silk and flowers, was constructed from the door of the Santa Maria Novella, and passing through the baptistry to the western door of the cathedral. Along this an imposing procession, consisting of the Pope, 37 bishops, 7 cardinals, the Signoria, and the envoys of foreign powers, passed from Santa Maria Novella to the cathedral. The consecration ceremony occupied five hours, after which the procession was reformed and returned in the same way. A tablet on the wall of the cathedral commemorates this event. Brunelleschi, more fortunate than Giotto, lived to see the completion of his great work and to take part in the above ceremony. The completion of the dome and the consecration of the cathedral served to mark the beginning of Cosimo's rule in Florence. In 1437, Cosimo set about rebuilding, at his own expense, the afterwards far-famed monastery of San Marco in Florence. This monastery of the Dominican order had, at this time in its community, two men who will ever live enshrined in the memory of men as representing all that was best in the spirit of that age, and as counterbalancing much that was evil. Giovanni of Fiasol, called Fra Angelico, and Antonio Pierozzi, called Antonino afterwards, Archbishop of Florence. Situated near the new palace which he was building, its prior, a man so justly beloved, this monastery seems to have been looked upon by Cosimo as a well-beloved retreat to which he could retire for rest and congenial companionship when harassed by the cares of state and the vexations of political life. And with his usual liberality in all that he undertook, he spent money upon it. With a generosity which the modesty of the friars had to restrain, the rebuilding of it cost him 36,000 ducats, in addition to which sum he gave it a large endowment. He had a special cell set apart for his own use, and thither often resorted for converse with the prior and others of the community. He gave as a nucleus for the monastery library over 400 valuable manuscript books, and it was at his expense that the walls of the monastery were decorated with those frescoes by Fra Angelico, which all the world now visits San Marco to see. Art, 1434-1439 The effect of having at the head of the state a man like Cosimo showed itself at once in the impetus given to all branches of art. As a result, we find art taking great strides during those first five years of Cosimo's supremacy in Florentine affairs, and artists at work all over the city whose names have since become famous throughout the world. Ghiberti was employed on his second pair of bronze doors. Brunelleschi was engaged on his two churches of San Lorenzo and Santo Spirito, besides several palaces. Michelozzo was at work on the Medici Palace and the Monastery of San Marco. Donatello, having returned from Rome, was busy in San Lorenzo and on his various works for Cosimo's new palace. 
the dead Misaccio's name was earning great fame, for by this time men had recognised his genius, and all painters were eagerly studying his works in the Brancacci chapel. Luca della Robbia was completing his marble screen of the Cantoria, Fra Angelico was beginning his frescoes in San Marco, Lippi was painting pictures for Cosimo, in which he was to show the world the lessons which Masaccio had taught. Andrea del Cassagno, Domenico Veneziano, Paolo Uccello, and many other artists were at work in Florence, most of them brought thither directly by Cosimo to execute various works for him, while he was besieged with letters by others at a distance importuning him for commissions. Contemporary Historical Events, 1434 to 1439 From 1434 to 1436, Florence was again at war with Milan, Filippo Visconti, Duke of Milan, being stirred up to attack Florence's territory by the banished Rinaldo degli Albizzi and his party, who urged the Duke to make war on Florence, promising to aid him with the contingent of Furo City, and by fermenting insurrection within the city. At length, however, in February 1437, Florence gained a victory over the forces of Milan at the Battle of Barga, which for a time put a stop to Milan's efforts, whereupon Florence again attacked Lucca, but without any success. Milan, however, renewed the war in 1438, and it dragged on with varying success for several years without definite result. In the year 1437, the Emperor Sigismund died, and immediately upon this, Pope Eugenius IV came to an open breach with the Council of Baal, and summoned a fresh council to meet in Italy, the place chosen being Ferrara. Its main object was to consider proposals made at this time by the Eastern Emperor. The Emperor John Palaeologus, following the example of his father and grandfather, proposed making a personal visit to the West to solicit help against the Turks to save Constantinople, which must otherwise fall. The Pope invited him, together with the Patriarch and bishops of the Eastern Church, to a conference, holding out hopes of such aid if the breach between the churches of the East and the West could be healed. Upon this action on the Pope's part of convening on his own authority a fresh council to meet in Italy, a step he had never been permitted to effect so long as the Emperor Sigismund lived, the Council of Baal, refusing to be thus broken up, declared Pope Eugenius deposed. But the feeling of Europe was against the creation of another schism, and by degrees the Council of Baal dwindled away and came to an end, after having sat for eight years and effected practically nothing towards that reformation of the Church for which it had been assembled. Thus again did the last reforming council, for it was the last, fail as completely as the two which had preceded it. Meanwhile, the Emperor John Paleologus and his retinue, together with the Patriarch of Constantinople, Joseph, and a numerous body of bishops and theologians, sailed from Constantinople, and in due time arrived at Venice. The emperor was received with great pomp by Doge Francesco Foscari, and entertained at Venice for a month, after which he proceeded to Ferrara, where Pope Eugenius having also arrived, the council began its sittings, 5th of January 1438. Cosimo, in that task which has been mentioned, of gradually bringing foreign nations to recognise in him the motive power of the Florentine state, and also gradually convincing his countrymen that their interests were best served by leaving foreign affairs to him, had had to exercise much patience. He had a matter to effect which necessarily moved but slowly, and during the first few years he had been forced to be content with a very partial control, and often been obliged to acquiesce in action which he was as yet without the power to direct as he would wish. But by the end of the year 1438 he was beginning to have this power, foreign affairs being more and more left to him to manage in his own way, and he now took his first independent step, 
one which had very important results to Florence. He proceeded to Ferrara, where the council between the Eastern and Western churches had been sitting for nearly a year, and so used his influence with Pope Eugenius IV that he got the council transferred to Florence whereby he obtained for his city increased political influence, brought to it much added trade, and secured for it additional advantages in the advancement of the cause of learning. Accordingly, the council removed in February 1439 from Ferrara to Florence, which thus became the centre of interest in this great historical event. The Council of Florence, 1439 this council is one of the most interesting assemblages of this kind that ever took place, a gathering which included an emperor of the East and his retinue, a patriarch of Constantinople, the principal authorities of the Eastern Church, a Pope of Rome, the principal authorities of the Western Church, and all the most learned men of both East and West had never before been seen. Moreover, it was the last occasion on which such an assemblage was possible. Fourteen years later, the fall of Constantinople swept away all that formed its peculiar interest, making it impossible for such a gathering ever to occur again. This occasion gave Cosimo a great opportunity, both in the political sphere and with regard to the cause of learning nor did he allow the cost of entertaining these distinguished visitors to fall upon the state, but made them all his own guests, an action which gained him universal commendation. Residences were provided for them such as they could not have obtained in any other city. The Patriarch of Constantinople was lodged in the Farantini Palace in the Borgo Pinti, the Pope and his suite in the extensive range of buildings at that time attached to Santa Maria Novella, while to the Emperor and his retinue were given the whole of the Peruzzi palaces, then surrounding the Piazza del Peruzzi, a group of palaces in which the Eastern Emperor and his suite were more splendidly lodged than they could have been in the dwelling of any prince in Europe. The Council began its sittings on the 2nd of March, it sat in the cathedral, beneath Brunelleschi's glorious dome, at that time the wonder of Italy, and worthy to be first used on so unique an occasion. This gathering gave an immense impetus to what was beginning to be called the New Learning. It brought to Florence the most learned churchmen of Eastern Christendom, such as Bassarion, Bishop of Nicaea, and also the most learned scholars of the East such as Gemistos Plethon, whom Cosimo induced to settle permanently at Florence. It brought many rare manuscripts, most of which found their way into Cosimo's library, and above all it created personal contact and friendliness destined to have large results when a few years later this Greek learning should find itself driven from its home in Constantinople. The effect of all this was to advance Florence still further on that path of unearthing the long-buried literature of the past, on which Cosimo's efforts had already been long engaged. And this new learning, among many results which it was to have in the future, was to have one result of which men little dreamed, and least of all those most occupied in fostering the cause of learning. For it was destined in time to produce that great convulsion extending over all Europe, which we know as the Reformation. The new learning operated in two different ways to produce this result. First, in its work of increasing a knowledge of the ancient literature, it opened up large tracts of history till then scarcely known. It made scholars acquainted with writings belonging to the centuries preceding the dark period before the time of Charlemagne, writings hitherto accessible, if at all, only to ecclesiastics, and able to be read only by a few even of the latter. A large number of these writings referred to church matters, and had been written by eminent bishops of that period, and these soon disclosed to scholars that during at least six centuries of the church's earliest life, its constitution had been very different from what they now saw it, and with no supremacy of one see over all others, 
while such writings also made them acquainted with the proceedings of the six great general councils of the church which had taken place in those centuries some of which councils had given decisions bearing on this very point and to this new knowledge of the history of the church the gathering in florence added considerably for it enabled the dignitaries of the eastern church to converse face to face and in their own language with inquirers on such subjects belonging to the west and since the eastern church prided itself on never deviating by one hair's breadth from what was held at the beginning and since the special point upon which the discussions of the council were taking place was this very one of the claim of the church of rome to a supremacy which the eastern church maintained did not exist at the beginning the eastern bishops and theologians gathered at florence would be certain to corroborate any discoveries on the above point which the new learning might reveal to the eager scholars of florence and what scholars learnt in one generation all mankind would through them learn in the next pope eugenius therefore in bringing the bishops and theologians of the eastern church into contact with the hotbed of learning which was growing up in florence had done the most fatal thing he could do to the cause of the papacy moreover the time was soon to come when one of these scholars of the renaissance pouring in some dim library over the documents of the eighth century would make the amazing discovery that the so-called donation of constantine and the celebrated decretals now known as the forged decretals upon which the whole claim of the see of rome to a supremacy had been based were nothing less than a series of immense forgeries as the general result of all this the new learning which now received so strong an impetus was bound as soon as it should spread to germany and england and as soon as the invention of printing should come to aid it in doing so to produce the reformation the process would take time but the effect was certain where the councils of pisa constance and baal had failed the new learning would assuredly not fail it was a train of gunpowder laid in an ever-widening circle from florence as a centre though the man was not yet born whose hand would eighty years later far away in germany eventually set fire to the train the second way in which the new learning tended to the same result was of a different kind it gave a strong impulse towards the study of plato and other non-christian thinkers of the classical age and a tendency to look at all religions from their standpoint and here also this gathering in florence had much effect we are told that cosimo always a great admirer of plato's philosophy formed the idea of his celebrated platonic academy from conversing with the greek scholar plethon the most learned of the greeks who came to the council this famous academy tended to create a sceptical spirit and though many of its members made endeavours to reconcile platonism and christianity yet its general tendency was against the existing order of things in religion its influence became later on very widespread and simmons says that it would be impossible to overestimate the influence upon european thought which this platonic academy came to exercise about the time of the reformation in italy through marsilio ficino and pico della mirandola and in germany through reuchlin and his pupil melanchthon this great gathering of fourteen thirty nine in florence had its effect also on art we are often inclined to wonder where such painters as fra angelico benozzo gozzoli and gentile da fabriano got the idea of the gorgeous robes and strange-looking headdresses which we see in their pictures of eastern subjects it was all taken direct from the life of florence of this year during that summer the inhabitants of florence saw a perpetual succession of grand processions and imposing functions in which these visitors from the east appeared in every kind of magnificent and strange costume vespasiano da bistici and other writers of the time dilate upon their rich silken robes heavy with gold and their fantastic-looking headdresses 
regarded with deep interest by the learned on account of their ancient character, and the painters reproduce these before us in pictorial records, which are valuable to us on that very account. And because this was the last occasion on which these costumes were destined to appear. As regards the objects with which the Council of Florence was assembled, no results followed. The venerable Patriarch of Constantinople, Joseph, died in Florence one month before the Council came to an end. After his death, an agreement between the Greek and Latin churches was made by the Council and published with much ostentation by the Pope but the basis of it was that submission of the Eastern Church to the Church of Rome, which had been a name of the papacy ever since the 10th century, and the failure of any agreement from that standpoint was a foregone conclusion. The emperor, on the termination of the council, returned at once to Constantinople, and as soon as the terms of the agreement he had made became known, it was violently repudiated by the entire population, and a tumult so great arose that the agreement made at Florence was forthwith dropped and never heard of again. Thus the emperor, John Palaiologos, the third in succession to strive to get help from the West to save Constantinople, was no more successful than his father and grandfather had been. It was evidently vain to hope that the nations of Europe could be induced to lay aside their mutual dissensions even to protect themselves from a danger which threatened them all, and the days of the great capital of the eastern half of the Roman Empire, which had blocked the path of Mohammedan conquest for 800 years, were now plainly numbered. End of section 7。section 8 of the Medici, volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The Medici, Volume 1, by G. F. Young. Chapter 4. Cosimo, Part of Patriae, Part 3. Cosimo, 1440-1452. to 1452. In 1440, Shortly after the above concourse had dispersed, and Florence had returned to her normal conditions, the palace in the Via Larga, which Cosimo had begun to build in 1430, was sufficiently completed for occupation, and he moved into it. The members of the family, who were thus the first to take up their abode in this palace, to which so much of the after-history of the Medici attaches, were Cosimo and his wife, Contessina, and their two sons, Piero, and Giovanni, then respectively twenty-four and nineteen years old. A few years later, both the latter were to marry and bring their wives also to live in the family palace, which, before Cosimo's death, echoed to the childish voices of yet a third generation. Cosimo's brother, Lorenzo, died just as this change of residence of the elder branch took place. In the same year, the long and desultory war with Milan was brought to a conclusion. The Milanese army, under Piccinino, after threatening Florence, retired into the Casentino, where, being followed by the Florentine army, it was defeated at the Battle of Anghiari, by which success Florence gained the fertile district of the Casentino, and Venice, her ally, gained Pescheria and Bergamo. In the following year, 1441, there occurred an incident out of which has originated an accusation against Cosimo of the gravest kind, to the effect that he instigated the murder of Baldaccio d'Anghiari, commander of the Florentine infantry. The crime was an atrocious one, but there is not a particle of evidence that Cosimo had anything to do with it. During the war with Milan in 1440, a Florentine named Orlandini was in command of the troops which had been stationed to hold the important pass of Maradi on the Faenza road, a strong position covering Florence on the north, and between which and Florence there were no other troops, the Milanese army under Piccinino, having failed in their attack on the pass of San Benedetto, then attempted to force that of Maradi. 
where they should have been still more easily repulsed. But, on the approach of the enemy, Orlandini had ignominiously fled, ordering his troops to do the same, thereby leaving the road to Florence open to the enemy, who advanced and occupied the heights of Fiesole, placing Florence for a short time in grave danger. And Baldaccio d'Anghiari, being a brave soldier, had boldly denounced Orlandini's cowardice, which had had such serious results. In 1441, Orlandini became gonfalonier, and while holding that office, sent for Baldaccio, under the garb of friendship, to come and discuss some military affairs at the Palazzo della Signoria. The latter, accordingly, went to the palace, was received by the gonfalonier with every sign of friendship, and conducted by him to his own room, where, on a sudden, hired assassins placed in concealment by Orlandini rushed upon Baldaccio and killed him, throwing his body into the cortile below. His head was cut off, and his mangled remains exposed to the public in the Piazza della Signoria, where it was proclaimed that he had been put to death by the Signoria as a traitor to the Republic. The accusation against Cosimo is that Baldaccio, on his way to the palace, happened to meet him, and asked his advice about going, and that Cosimo treacherously advised him to go, it being declared that Cosimo desired Baldaccio's death, because he feared the growing influence of Neri Capone, whose close friend Baldaccio was. The motive, alleged, is exceedingly lame, while the whole story of Baldaccio's having met Cosimo at all, or received any advice from him, is apparently due solely to political animosity. It is only mentioned by one historian of the time, Cavalcanti, whose hatred of Cosimo is well known. And as the story is not mentioned by any other writer, and comes from a source so unreliable in this particular case, it is now rejected by all historians as unworthy of credence. Gino Capone, in similarly rejecting it, says that Cavalcanti always writes in hatred of Cosimo while wishing to appear not to do so. Some writers have urged that even if Cosimo did not instigate the crime, he must be held no less responsible, since he took no action against those guilty of it. But this ignores the fact that the latter were not private individuals, but the government of the country, that, at the date when this occurred, 1441, Cosimo had by no means yet gained the degree of power he afterwards attained, and that any action by him against the Signoria under the circumstances, would have been at any rate highly unconstitutional, and would practically have been to head a rebellion against the constituted authority of the state. Lastly, the crime is so opposed to the whole tenor of his life that we are justified in rejecting absolutely the idea that he had any part in it, especially as the charge is entirely unsupported by any evidence. Nor, except for the desire to find material for a damning charge against Cosimo, does the crime appear to differ from many others common at that time. The facts of the case are amply sufficient to account for Orlandini's deed, while he probably had reason to know that the members of the Signoria were not men likely to refuse to support his action before the people, backed as that action was by the evidence of traitorous conduct which he asserted that he possessed against Baldaccio d'Anghiari. In the same year, 1441, Cosimo arranged the purchase by Florence from the Pope of the town of Borgo San Sepolcro for a sum of 25,000 florins, while we are told Cosimo increased the obligation of the state to him in the matter in that he himself advanced the purchase money. In 1443, Pope Eugenius IV was at last able to return to Rome. Rome was, at this time, a ruined city, devastated by the long conflicts between the Orsini, the Colonna, and other great barons, and destitute of all culture or civilising influences. And the contrast was all the more severe to the Pope, since Florence, where he had been living for eight years, was in advance of all other cities in Europe. The Medici Library in 1444, Cosimo founded the celebrated Medici Library, the first public library to exist in Europe, 
and from the example of which the Vatican Library at Rome was thirty years afterwards formed. This library, housed at first in their own palace, was steadily added to by the Medici family in succeeding generations and by them, in 1524, the building in which it is now located, in the cloisters of San Lorenzo, was constructed, designed by Michelangelo. It contains about 10,000 manuscript books of Greek and Latin classical authors, many of them of the rarest value. Among these, it possesses the original copy of the Pandects of Justinian, A.D. 533, the discovery of which in the 12th century caused so great an influence on the civilization of Europe, and on which our study of the Roman law almost entirely hinges. Also the best manuscript of Cicero's letters, two manuscripts of Tacitus, one of them being the sole existing copy containing the first five books of the Annals, a very ancient copy of the tragedies of Sophocles, a most important manuscript of Aeschylus, a Greek treatise on surgery, the commentaries of Julius Caesar, a Virgil of the 4th century, a Syriac gospel of A.D. 556, the Bible copied from 690 to 716 by Colafrid, abbot of Wearmouth, and called the Codex Amiatinus, a Pliny of the 10th century, and numerous literary treasures connected with the time of Dante and Petrarch, and the Florence of the 13th and 14th centuries, the whole representing a vast sum of money spent by the Medici on this splendid contribution towards the advancement of learning. It is the parent of all the great libraries of Europe, and as such deserves to be duly honoured. In connection with this library, it is curious to note how little printing, when, six years after this, it appeared, was at first welcomed. Those who owned these rare and costly manuscripts of the past and their beautiful calligraphy looked with no favour on crude and ugly reproductions thereof by a mechanical process. It is recorded by Gregorovius that Frederigo Montefeltro, Duke of Urbino, a prince who was at this time beginning to follow Cosimo's example in regard to the encouragement of learning and art, would not have a printed book in his library. In 1446, a general war broke out in Italy. As usual, Filippo Visconti, Duke of Milan, was its leading spirit, and he had as his allies the Pope and the King of Naples. Against this powerful coalition were ranged Venice, Florence, Genoa and Bologna. The latter were entirely successful, especially when Cosimo at length managed to separate Naples from the coalition, and this brought about peace. In the same year, Brunelleschi died. Grand funeral obsequies were held in the Duomo, where his body lay surrounded by candles beneath the mighty vault that he had constructed, and was visited by the whole city. He was buried in the Duomo, his monument being placed opposite that of Arnolfo di Cambio. He who began and he who finished thus lying opposite each other in the building which is their joint creation. In 1447, Filippo Visconti, Duke of Milan, the last of the Visconti family, and the perpetual enemy of Florence, died, whereupon two years of revolutions in Milan followed. Cosimo now executed his greatest stroke of foreign policy. The perpetual state of war with Milan wasted the revenues of Florence and prevented her development. Cosimo therefore determined to entirely change Florence's traditional foreign policy and instead of Venice for ally and Milan for enemy to reverse the position. He was opposed by many in his own state who had less political foresight but he carried his point. Francesco Sforza, the successful soldier who ever since his visit to Florence in 1435 had maintained a strong friendship with Cosimo had since married Bianca Visconti the late duke's only child. To him Cosimo now gave both political assistance and liberal supplies of money, and as the result of this aid, Sforza, early as 1450, gained possession of Milan and became its duke and Cosimo's fast friend. Venice, of course, was greatly incensed, but Florence had no reason to fear Venice, 
which was neither so valuable as an ally nor so formidable as a foe as Milan. It proved a most successful stroke of policy, bringing to Florence peace instead of constant wars, and making Cosimo acknowledged as the most powerful force in the politics of Italy. Contemporary Historical Events, 1440 to 1452 As regards France and England at this time, the Hundred Years' War was still proceeding, devastating all northern France, but with a general result that the English were steadily losing their hold of that country. In 1440, Frederick III became emperor. He was destined to hold the imperial title without dignity or influence for over 50 years, 1440 to 1493. In 1447, Pope Eugenius IV died. As his successor, there was elected a man of far greater energy and ability, the eager little scholar, Tommaso Parantuccelli, who was a great friend of Cosimo, and had acted as librarian to the Medici Library when it was being formed, and he, on becoming Pope, having taken part in all the life of art and learning at work in Florence, was burning to inaugurate a similar state of things in Rome. He took the name of Nicholas V, and, we are told, he determined to make Rome at this time so desolate and ruined the metropolis of the world. He took active measures at once, both in the domain of art and in that of learning. In 1450, there was invented at Mayence the art of printing, fraught with greater consequences to mankind than many other events of this time, which then seemed of far greater importance than this at first obscure invention. In 1452, the Emperor Frederick III visited Italy, and on his way to Rome passed through Florence, where he stayed with Cosimo in the Medici Palace. In the same year, war again broke out in Italy, caused by Alfonso, King of Naples, who, on the death of Filippo Visconti, had taken his place as the disturbing factor in Italy, and who now invaded Florence's territory. In the war that followed, Naples and Venice were ranged against Florence and her new ally, Milan. This was the balance of power which Cosimo had, with much labour, striven to create. It was shown to be thoroughly satisfactory, Venice and Naples being able to effect nothing against Florence and Milan, and after a time, discovering this, they became ready to agree to the peace which, through the Pope, was proposed and concluded. Pope Nicholas V took no part in the war, urging all states to abandon their feuds and combine against the Turks to prevent the fall of Constantinople, then closely besieged, but none heeded him. Cosimo, 1453 For nearly twenty years, Cosimo's administration of foreign policy had given him unremitting labour. But these efforts of many years had been crowned with success. Notwithstanding many difficulties, he had by degrees brought all foreign countries to realise that he was the motive power in the Florentine state. And he was also, through attaining unvarying success, gradually convinced his own countrymen that no one else could manage their affairs so well, so that they had no desire to see them in other hands. It had required much patient tact to convert his countrymen from their traditional policy of having Venice for friend and Milan for foe, to bring them to see that the contrary policy was the sounder one, to counteract the ill favour against him which, in consequence of his action, Venice endeavoured to stir up in his own city, and to do all this without losing his position in the process. But the successful issue of the war of 1452 convinced all that his view was correct, and left none any longer anxious to dispute his administration of their affairs. And so long as he continued in the same course, and at the same time shunned, as he was wont, all ostentation of power, he might do almost what he would. But Cosimo's political labours did not end even when he had achieved this result. He had to exercise a never-ceasing attention in order so to conduct the foreign policy of Florence amidst the intrigues of the time as to maintain a balance of power among the various Italian states, small as well as large, 
and thus secure peace in Italy and preserve Florence from the wasting effect of petty wars. The manifold anxieties of such a position were enough to break down any man, and even upon Cosimo they told severely. It was no wonder that he often sought a few hours' retreat from such anxieties in the quiet monastery of San Marco, nor that by the time he was sixty-four his health had already begun to give way. Contemporary Historical Events, 1453 In 1453, the Hundred Years' War between France and England came to an end. Between the years 1431 and 1453, the English had gradually lost all that they had conquered in France, and when at length, in the latter year, the aged Tarbot was killed at the Siege of Castillon, this war, which had lasted a hundred and sixteen years, ended. It left the condition of France utterly wretched. From the Loire to the Somme, all lay desert, given up to the wolves, and traversed only by the robber and the freelance. But a greater event than the conclusion of this long war, and one whose effects still continue, occurred in the year 1453. This was the fall of Constantinople, bringing to an end the Eastern Empire of Rome, on the 29th of May, 1453. It was an event which struck all Europe with horror, for Constantinople was not merely the storehouse of the ancient learning and culture of the Roman Empire, it was also the one great capital city in Europe which had always, from its very birth, been Christian. A city whose foundation had signalised the adoption by the civilised world of that religion, and which had come to be called in the East the Christian city. That such a city should be captured by the Turk, and be henceforth the headquarters of the Mohammedan religion, and of Turkish misrule and tyranny over the Christian populations of the eastern countries, was hateful in the eyes of Europe. And it happened solely because the western nations were too much occupied with mutual dissensions to combine to prevent it, as three successive emperors of the east, in 1361, in 1401, and in 1439, had come in person to implore them to do. The emperor, John Paleologus, had died in 1448, and had been succeeded by his son, the brave young Constantine Paleologus, the last of the long line of emperors who, during 1130 years, sat on the throne of Constantine the Great. It was a strange coincidence that the last emperor of Constantinople should have borne the same name as the first. Of Constantine Paleologus we are told, he was in no way inferior to any who ever sat upon that throne. In this final contest he, at any rate, did his part nobly, thereby throwing into deeper contrast the behaviour of the Western nations. Deserted by Europe, with the armies of the Turks all round him, with none but himself to depend upon, with far too small a garrison to defend thirteen miles of walls, and a vast crowd of women and children and other non-combatants, the defenceless population of a great city, all looked to him to defend them from the atrocities of the terrible Turks, with every sort of difficulty to be coped with inside the city, whose inhabitants saw themselves abandoned by Christendom. Constantine, solely by his own ability and strength of character, conducted for a year and a half a splendid defence, and in such sort that instead of the ignoble scenes witnessed when Rome fell before Alaric, the manner of the final fall of Constantinople has been felt to be one of the most glorious episodes in all her long history. The immediate consequences of the fall of Constantinople were four. Intoxicated by their victory, the Turks, wild to press on and subdue the whole of Europe, where Mohammed II now planned to set up at Rome the capital of a worldwide empire, advanced into Hungary, but there the brave John Hunyades barred their way, like another Charles Martel, and they got no further. To the Pope, Nicholas V, who alone had laboured to prevent it, the fall of Constantinople was the cause of the deepest grief. He tried to rouse France, England, Germany, and Venice to retake Constantinople and turn the Turks out of Europe. 
but what with the incapacity of the Emperor Frederick III and the general disunion between the different countries, he could effect nothing. After two years he died, in 1455, it was said of grief and horror at the capture of the Christian city by the infidel, and at his failure to rouse the Western nations to retake it. To Venice the fall of her rival was her doom. She began to decay from that hour, losing territory after territory to the Turks, and her commerce at the same time. It was a just retribution, for it was the crime of her treacherous attack upon and capture of Constantinople in 1204, committed under the name of a crusade and solely to satisfy her insatiable greed of wealth, which so weakened the Eastern Empire that the decline in power wrought thereby ended. After 250 years of constant defeat, in the final fall of Constantinople, and brought the Turks into Europe. And it was fitting that on Venice should fall the chief punishment. Her wealth rapidly departed. Others, Portugal especially, gained the commerce which she lost. And by the end of the century, the decay of the once mighty republic was fully established. To Florence, the fall of Constantinople was a gain. It scattered westwards all that accumulation of the ancient learning which Constantinople had so long preserved, most of which naturally gravitated to the city where many of the leading men of Constantinople had been hospitably entertained only fourteen years before, and where they knew they would find friends. And this helped forward still further that preeminence in learning and art which was Florence's greatest glory. As to what happened to Constantinople itself, that is best told in a single sentence by a traveller of our own day, who writes, I have never, in all my travels, grieved so much as at the sight of the once beautiful city, defiled, squalid, and misgoverned. Cosimo, 1453-1463 to We have now to look at Cosimo from a financial point of view at his general as well as his charitable expenditure, and the financial arrangements made between the two branches of the family. Cosimo, besides his work in the world of politics, had to administer a great banking business. In this sphere he has, by all writers, been given the reputation of a financier of the first rank. Notwithstanding his immense expenditure, which included private subsidies towards state expenses, the entertainment of distinguished visitors to Florence, large sums given to advance the cause of learning and art, and the equivalent of a million sterling given to charitable objects, he more than doubled the fortune inherited from his father, and left his son and successor, Piero, the wealthiest man at that time in Europe. Another feature of his financial work is the way in which he made his operations as a banker assist those connected with his position as head of the state. He frequently made his immense banking transactions a weapon with which to force other countries to the course required for the welfare of Florence. Thus, by his financial assistance, the Venetian Republic were enabled to withstand the united attacks of the French and of Filippo Visconti, Duke of Milan, but on being deprived by Cosimo of this support, were unable to do so. Again, in the War of 1452, in which Venice and Naples were allied against Florence, one of the chief means by which Cosimo obtained his success was by calling in such immense debts from those countries that they were deprived of resources for continuing the war. Again, during the War of the Roses, Edward IV obtained such enormous sums from Cosimo's agent in England that he might almost be considered as the means of maintaining that king upon the English throne. As regards charities, the Libro di Ragione shows that Cosimo's private expenditure on churches, monasteries and charitable institutions exceeded 400,000 gold florins, and this at a time when the whole income of the Florentine state did not reach more than half that sum. About the year 1453, as Cosimo was growing old and his brother Lorenzo was already dead, a computation was made of the family income and a resolution come to between the two branches as to the manner in which the profits of their banking business should be divided between them. 
the share of these profits which thus fell to each branch of the family was equal to about half a million sterling an enormous fortune in those times cosimo built for his family besides the medici palace in the city itself various villas outside florence the chief of these were carreggi about two miles to the northwest of the city Cafaggiolo, in the valley of Mugello, and the Villa Medici, on the slope of Fiesol, built by him for his son Giovanni. Careggi was Cosimo's favourite residence, and there he was fond of gathering round him the learned society which he loved. End of section 8section nine of the Medici, volume 1 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The Medici, Volume 1, by G. F. Young. Chapter 4. Cosimo. Pater Patriae. Part 4. Contemporary Historical Events, 1454-1464. The chief historical events in other countries during the last ten years of Cosimo's life were the following. In England, two years after the Hundred Years' War with France had ended, began in 1455 the Wars of the Roses. This kept England in a state of civil war during the next thirty years. As regards the papacy, on the death of Pope Nicholas V in 1455, the Pope elected was Calixtus III. He died in 1458 and was succeeded by the celebrated Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini, Pius II, the chief episodes of whose life are depicted in the series of fresco pictures by Pinturicchio in the library of the Cathedral of Siena. This Pope paid a visit to Florence in 1460 and stayed with Cosimo in the Medici Palace. In Venice there came, in 1457, the end of the long and glorious thirty-four years' rule of the doge Francesco Foscari, who died in that year. He was the last of her great doges. In France, in 1461, Charles VII, the king placed on the throne by Joan of Arc, died. In the same year that in England Henry VI was dethroned in favour of Edward IV, Charles was succeeded by his cowardly and treacherous son, Louis XI, the royal trickster. Detestable as were his long list of murders, carried out by the most treacherous methods, he brought order out of chaos in France. Art, 1434-1464 The Thirty Years' Rule of Cosimo shows us the new movement in art, advancing with rapid strides, to greater and greater achievements through the genius of Donatello, Fra Angelico, Luca della Ropia, Ghiberti and Lippi. Donatello Donatello, the third in age of the four leaders of the Renaissance in art, exercised by far the deepest influence of the four. Ghiberti, Brunelleschi and Masaccio each did their part, but Donatello infused a new spirit into the whole matter breathing into it the breath of life. Sixteen years old when the new movement in art began, and living to the age of eighty-one, he exercised for fifty years the leading influence in the world of art. We have therefore to look at him under two aspects, one as a sculptor, and two as a guide to the art world as to the true aim of art. 1. Dolatello, the first sculptor in the round since the time of Greek art, introduced as great a revolution in sculpture as Giotto did in painting. The nature of this revolution has been well described by a recent writer of his life as follows. Quote, in order to estimate the full significance of the new departure in sculpture inaugurated by Donatello, that sculpturing of isolated statues, which had not been attempted since the last artist of antiquity laid down his chisel, it must be borne in mind that for centuries the accepted form for this art had been relief. 
while also sculpture had not been used as a prime vehicle by itself for conveying the artist's idea, but as an adjunct, an ornament to architecture. Thus, in Or Cagna's celebrated shrine in Or San Michel, in honour of the Madonna, we find the Madonna sentiment diffused throughout all its parts. Her story is told by a series of reliefs. Her character is suggested by a carefully thought-out arrangement of figures representing the accepted virtues of that character, appropriately placed between those stories which appear to illustrate them. Symbols are freely employed, and even the material and colours, the white marble, spangled with precious stones and mosaics, contribute their qualities to aid in the expression of the ideal, associated in the mind of the artist with the personality of the Blessed Virgin. This was essentially the medieval form of art. Now the genius of classic art was exactly the opposite of this. Where the medieval genius was diffuse, the classic genius was concentrated. Where the medieval sculptor flew to symbols to express the internal things of the supernal glory, the sculptor of the classic age, choosing the most perfect form in nature, the human, so refined and idealised it, and so transfused it with that spirit and thought desired to be expressed, that it spoke by suggestion to all who had ears to hear. Donatello's predecessors were medieval, one and all. He himself was a scholar in their school, yet, when he was only twenty years of age, and twelve years before he was admitted as a master in his guild, we see him turn his back on the entire medieval method, and choosing the way of antiquity, begin his series of isolated heroic statues. End quote. Thus did Donatello, while still quite young, feel the inspiration of that rebirth in art which was permeating all Florence, and four years after Ghiberti began his first pair of bronze doors, on which Donatello had worked as an assistant, this youth of twenty made that bold and independent return to earlier principles which marks the true genius. After various statues representing Joshua, Daniel, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Abraham, St. Peter, St. Mark, the marble statue of David and others, all intended to occupy niches on the walls of the cathedral, the Campanile, or the church of Or Saint-Michel, Donatello produced in 1416 his St. George, generally considered his masterpiece, which gave him the position of the first sculptor of his time. But Donatello was to go further than this. About the year 1432, he executed for Cosimo his bronze statue of David, and this statue introduced a new era in the art of sculpture, for it was the first isolated nude statue that had been made for more than a thousand years. Even the St. George, besides embodying no attempt to depict the human form undraped, had only been made for a niche, but this statue of David was intended to stand in the cortile of Cosimo's palace and be looked at from every side. This remarkable innovation, as Lord Balcaris justly calls it, advanced Donatello's reputation to a still greater degree than even his St. George had done, having an immediate effect on all the sculptors of his time and spreading Donatello's fame far beyond Italy. Seeing it as we now do in the Museum of the Bargello, surrounded by many others, we are apt to forget the distinguished position which this statue holds as the leader of all that followed it in sculpture. The only others of Donatello's numerous works necessary to notice here are his statue of Judith slaying Holofernes and his medallions copied from antique gems. The Judith was executed, like the David, for the cortile of the Medici Palace and was finished shortly after the family moved into the palace in 1440. The statue had an important history some fifty years later, see chapter 10. The medallions, which still remain in excellent preservation over the arches of the cortile, are copies in marble of eight antique gems, the subjects being Diomede and the Palladium, Bacchus and Ariadne, Ulysses and Athena, Daedalus and Icarus, and four others of minor interest. The original gems were in the Medici collection. Whether these medallions were completed 
and placed in position at the time when the palace was first occupied in 1440, as seems most probable, or at a later date in Cosimo's life, is a debated point. 2. But greater still is Donatello's fame as a guide to the aim which art should set before itself, a message which he taught to sculptors and painters alike. Hitherto, the aim that artists had striven after was the production of as lifelike a representation as possible of nature, and this alone they had found difficult enough. Donatello introduced a further step, teaching that form must be a mere means to an end, that of conveying some deep thought to the mind, that art, in fact, must be a language. The outward rendered expressive of the inward, the body instinct with spirit, the soul made incarnate, this, which has been said to define truth in art, was in brief Donatello's message to the art world, and it produced the great stride forward which art now took. It was, in fact, the inauguration of the whole difference between classic and modern art, the former aiming no further than to portray absolute perfection of form, the latter aiming, simultaneously with this, at conveying some message to the mind. It is this characteristic of Donatello's genius which has caused him to be called by his countrymen Il Maestro di Ci Sano, the master of those who know. His statue of St. George, in which the ideal to which he gives expression is that of the flesh under the dominion of the spirit, is the best example of this characteristic in his art. Donatello also revived a branch of art which had been dead since the time of ancient Rome, that of casting statues, and particularly equestrian statues, in bronze, a difficult work since all its details had, in the course of nine centuries, become unknown. In 1453, after many difficulties, he completed for the Venetian Republic the first bronze equestrian statue executed since Roman times, that of the Venetian general, Gattimolata, at Padua. His works in bas-relief have also certain characteristics of their own, notably that exceedingly low relief called Stiacciato, which he often used with very beautiful effect. Perkins draws attention to his treatment of the hair, saying that, though the ancient sculptures were unrivalled in their treatment of hair in the abstract, no sculptor, ancient or modern, ever surpassed Donatello in giving it all the qualities of growth and waywardness. To compare Donatello with his great successor, Michelangelo, is absurd. Donatello's fame is that of the leader, of the man who revolutionised sculpture and taught all who came after him what art's true aim should be, and no excellencies in Michelangelo or any other successor can touch the point on which Donatello's fame rests. Fra Angelico San Marco not only possessed learned men among its community, and a prior who was beloved by all who knew him, but also numbered among its members the greatest painter of the day, Fra Angelico. His earlier paintings are to be seen at Cortana, but in 1437 he began his painting at Florence, being at Cosimo's insistence set to work. As soon as any portions of the new monastery were sufficiently far advanced for the purpose, to decorate the walls of the chapter house, cloisters, and corridors with his frescoes. Amongst these, the large fresco in the chapter house representing the crucifixion, with the saints of the New Testament on one side and the prominent saints of the Middle Ages on the other, was specially ordered by Cosimo, who gave much helpful advice in regard to the details. It was one of the first of Fra Angelico's frescoes painted in San Marco. Cosimo also made Fra Angelico paint, in the cell which he kept for himself, a fresco picture of the Adoration of the Magi. Desiring to have this example of Eastern kings laying down their crowns at the manger of Bethlehem always before his eyes as a reminder for his own guidance as a ruler. From time to time we meet with a master who, having made some line in art specially his own, and perfected it to such a point that it is felt that no further advance in that line is possible to man, remains for all time its solitary exponent. It was thus with Fra Angelico. 
he reigned supreme and alone in that line which he chose, wherein he sought only to express the inner life of the adoring soul. At the same time, he was an artist who steadily improved in technical skill, and his later paintings show that he had carefully studied the works of Masaccio. Regarding the general style of his painting, Mrs. Aidy says as follows, quote, all the mystic thought of the medieval world, the passionate love of God and man that beat in the heart of St. Francis, the yearnings of Dante's soul after a higher and more perfect order of things are embodied in the art of Fra Angelico, the brilliancy of colour and richness which he gives in his pictures of angels and heavenly scenes are marvellous. In his picture at Cortona of the Annunciation, Fra Angelico's first version of his favourite subject, the angel's wings are gold-tipped with ruby light, and his robe is a marvel of decorative beauty, studded all over with little tongues of flame, and embroidered in mystic patterns. His picture of the coronation of the Virgin is one of the glories of the Louvre, and in it he has lavished the richest ornament and the most radiant colour on the angels who stand before the throne, each with a spark of fire on his forehead and glittering stars on his purple wings. End quote. Ruskin, speaking of Fra Angelico's painting from the more technical side, remarks as follows quote, The art of Fra Angelico, both in drawing and colouring, is perfect, and his work may be recognised at any distance by its rainbow play and brilliancy, like a piece of opal among common marbles. In order to effect clearer distinction between heavenly beings and those of this world, he represents the former as clothed in draperies of the purest colour, crowned with glories of burnished gold, and entirely shadowless. The flames on their foreheads waving brighter as they move, the sparkles streaming away from their purple wings like the glitter of the sun upon the sea, while they listen in the pauses of alternate song for the prolonging of the trumpet blast and the answering of the psalm and harp and cymbal throughout the endless deep. And from all the star shores of heaven, this mode of treatment, combined as it is with the exquisite choice of gesture and disposition of drapery, gives perhaps the best idea of spiritual beings which the human mind is capable of forming. End quote. For one other point, Fra Angelico's pictures are notable. In them we have, for the first time, heads full of individual character. While he was the first to begin introducing in his pictures portraits of his friends, thus doing much to help forward another line in art, portrait painting, which a generation later became a recognised branch of painting. In this way, he gives us in his picture of the deposition from the cross now in the Academia at Florence, a portrait of his friend Michelozzo, the architect, who was being employed by Cosimo in the rebuilding of San Marco. Fra Angelico's period of painting in Florence lasted for nine years, 1437 to 1446. In 1446, Pope Eugenius IV, having seen so much of his work at Florence, summoned him to Rome, but that pope died almost immediately afterwards, in 1447. However, his successor, Nicholas V, was, as previously noted, most anxious to inaugurate a new state of things in Rome as regards art. One of his first efforts in this direction, after the example of the Monastery of San Marco in Florence, was to begin covering the walls of the Vatican with frescoes, and this was the commencement of that long series of renowned frescoes, which, added to by Pope after Pope, now form so large a part of the treasures of the Vatican. Nicholas V began with his private chapel and set Fra Angelico to work to decorate its walls. Thus, these frescoes in the chapel of Nicholas V are important both as the first of all the frescoes in the Vatican and also as being Fra Angelico's last work. They took him the greater part of the next five years, 1447 to 1452, and these frescoes in particular show how greatly he had profited by careful study of Masaccio's works. 
for while they still have his own grace and skill in delineating character, they are instinct with Masaccio's power. In them we have from Farrar Angelico's two portraits of Nicholas V, in the two pictures representing Sixtus II, AD 257, ordaining the deacon St. Lawrence and giving into his charge the treasures of the church, Fra Angelico died at Rome in 1455. Simultaneously with the above work in art, Nicholas V commenced the formation of a library in the Vatican after the pattern of the Medici Library in Florence, and collected a large number of manuscript books and appointed a librarian, but the whole was dispersed by his successors, and it was not until Sixtus IV revived the institution in 1475 that the Vatican Library began its existence. Luca della Robbia Luca della Robbia, born in 1400, was employed as a youth on the bronze doors of the baptistry. After a time he began working on his own account, and struck out a new line of his own. He executed reliefs in marble, in bronze, and in glazed terracotta, devoting him specially to the varied expressions of the human features, and his works, by their truth to nature and the deep feeling which they breathe, have won for him an honoured place amongst those who gave an impulse to the Renaissance. Speaking of his art generally, Miss Crutwell says, quote, He is first of all the imaginative sculptor and poet who embodied the grandest ideals in forms worthy of Phidian Greece. Unquote. In 1438, Luca produced his beautiful relief of the Cantoria, executed for one of the organ lofts of the cathedral, and representing groups of boys and girls singing and little children dancing, which at once placed him amongst the foremost artists of his time. This relief in marble, from its truth to nature and the grace of movement of its figures, was almost as much a wonder to the time as Ghiberti's first pair of bronze doors had been, and had much effect in helping still further forward both sculpture and painting towards a lifelike representation of human figures. It is meant to illustrate the 150th psalm, each of the panels portraying one of the six verses of that psalm. Regarding this magnificent frieze, the Marchesa Berlamacci says, quote, Luca della Robbia's Cantori children live and move, the very action of their throats can be seen as they sing. The soul of music is in their faces. There is a swing in their movements as they dance, a grace of attitude and an elegance of flowing drapery that throughout the works of the Renaissance has never been surpassed. End quote. Besides the Cantoria, Luca della Robbia's other chief works, in marble and bronze, were the five panels on the north side of the Campanile, executed in 1439, representing the development of man's intellect in the arts and sciences. The tomb of Benozzo Federighi, Bishop of Fiesol, now in the church of Santa Trinita, executed in 1454, and by some considered Luca's best work in marble. And the bronze doors of the sacristy of the Duomo, completed after many years' labour in 1469. His works in glazed terracotta, will be considered later. Chapter 6 Ghiberti In 1452, six years after Brunelleschi had died and Fra Angelico's painting in Florence come to an end, Ghiberti at last finished his second pair of bronze doors for the baptistry. These, which Michelangelo, a hundred years later, declared fit to be the gates of paradise, are considered Ghiberti's masterpiece. They represent scenes from Old Testament history, and Ruskin remarks, The book of Genesis, in all the fullness of its incidents, in all the depths of its meaning, is bound within the leaf borders of the gates of Ghiberti. They had taken Ghiberti twenty-eight years. He had begun his first pair of doors at the age of twenty-three. He finished his second at the age of seventy-three, and he died three years afterwards. Excepting his three statues outside or San Michel, and one or two minor works, these two pairs of bronze doors were his life's work. 
As Alexandra Dumas says, a whole life spent over this marvellous bronze. The pathos of the young Ghiberti beginning this beautiful work of art when full of youth and strength, amidst all the enthusiasm of the first outburst of the Renaissance, and finishing it when he was old and worn with years, and when so many who had seen its commencement had passed away, cannot but touch all who think of it. It was another generation who now saw its completion from that which had seen it begun. Cosimo himself, now sixty-three, had then been only a boy of thirteen. Fra Angelico fifteen, Michelozzo eleven, Luca della Robbia, a child of a year old, Masaccio, the boy who had worked under him, had covered himself with glory in another line and was long dead. Brunelleschi, his passionate rival, had had time to learn another art and to make his name famous therein, and was gone. Of all the band of eager competitors for the work, he alone remained. As we look at these beautiful doors, how many thoughts crowd upon us. The terrible sufferings of Florence from the plague which caused their construction, the celebrated competition with its intense and passionate rivalry, the whole lifetime of work spent in their production, all the art life which surged around them as they lay gradually taking shape in the workshop of Ghiberti, hard by the place where they have now stood for 450 years, the school of art which that workshop began for Florence, the band of eager young assistants, some of whom had since made their names, which are now famous throughout the world, the final triumph when they were at last completed, the solemn function when they were erected in their place, the grey-haired man of seventy-three, bent with age, who had begun them in his youth, and who, had he had another lifetime before him, would have destroyed even these, and begun yet another effort, after something more perfect still. The pride of all who had had a part, however humble in their production, the excitement and rapture of a whole city. Lastly, the many things of which they were the origin and the matrix, the sculpture of Donatello, the painting of Masaccio, and all that grew from these. So that we look at Ghiberti's panels, we see mirrored in them the triumphs of Raphael and of Michelangelo. It is thoughts such as these which force themselves upon our minds as we stand in the crowded modern thoroughfare with its trams and tourists and life of the Florence of today around us, and look at Ghiberti's doors. End of section 9section 10 of the medici volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by adrian stevens the medici volume 1 by g f young chapter 4 cosimo Pater patriae part 5 filippo lippi in 1441 Filippo Lippi, who had been Masaccio's pupil, finished his painting of the coronation of the Madonna, considered his best picture in Florence. A greater contrast could scarcely be found than that between the two chief painters of Cosimo's time, Fra Angelico and Filippo Lippi, for Lippi was in everything the antithesis of his contemporary Fra Angelico. The orphan son of a butcher, he was left as a boy in charge of an aunt, who, finding him an idle ne'er-do-well, put him as a novice into the nearest monastic community, that of the Carmelites, in whose church of the Carmine Masaccio was then painting his frescoes. The monks, owing to his laziness, could do nothing with him, but, watching Masaccio at his work, Lippi thought this an easier task than learning to read and write, and Masaccio, finding he could draw, taught him his art. Lippi was sixteen when Masaccio died, and in the following year, Vasari says, Lippi boldly threw off the monastic habit and took to painting for a livelihood. Though he signs himself Frater Philippus, he had no right to the term, as he had entirely discarded his vows, and owing to his disreputable conduct, 
no religious community would own him. His life was a disturbed one, as his drunken character and constant feuds upon those who employed him caused him to be always in trouble. After being several times brought up before the authorities for various misdemeanours, at length for a particularly flagrant case of embezzlement, he was flogged. Lippi's character, however, only affect his credit as a painter by accounting for the kind of success he achieved. He had, as was to be expected, no ears for the message which Donatello was at this time teaching, and consequently his pictures on religious subjects have an exceedingly mundane character. Nevertheless, the sweet seriousness of his Madonnas falls in no way short of those of Fra Angelico, and the faces of his children are full of a quaint, mischievous character, which is delightful, while in both drawing and colouring he shows the immense advance which had now taken place in painting. And it is here that Lippi's true claim to fame lies. Masaccio, the only man who up to that time had found out the true methods of the art of painting, had died too soon himself to be able to make known his discovery, except to the few who could visit Florence and the Branacci Chapel. It was left for Lippi, the rough boy whom he had taught, to show the world Masaccio's discovery. And Lippi did so. Vasari says, Taught as he had been by Masaccio, he was a faithful follower of Masaccio's style. And he adds that he followed the latter's methods so faithfully that it appeared that the spirit of Masaccio had entered Lippi's body. Thus, what Masaccio had done for the art of painting is chiefly to be seen by a comparison of Lippi's pictures with those of Masaccio's immediate predecessors, the Giotteschi. Lippi's principal picture in Florence is his Coronation of the Virgin, painted for Cosimo, and now in the Accademia della Belle Arti. But his best work is considered to be his frescoes in the Cathedral at Prato, painted between 1456 and 1465. A serious error of the last generation has caused much injustice to Masaccio, and has been widely spread through Robert Browning's poem on Lippi. He makes Lippi speak of Masaccio as a youngster, then just learning to paint. Lippi saying that after his death, this Guidi may perhaps rob him of his laurels. This is owing to Masaccio's date being in Browning's time, imagined to be later than it really is, so that Lippi was supposed to have preceded him, with the result that Lippi, instead of Masaccio, gained all the credit of the great advance in painting which exists between the Giotteschi and Masaccio. The pathos which throughout attaches to Masaccio is thus still further increased. Not only is he crushed with poverty throughout his life, and his great fame only won after death, but in addition even those laurels are in later times given to the pupil whom he had out of a rough kindness taught for nothing. And then, as the crowning point, this Tommaso Guidi, this great genius who is the founder of all modern painting, and from whom even Raphael was glad to learn, becomes known to posterity only as Clumsy Tom. The fuller information now available has put this matter right, and more particularly the registers of the Catasto tax for the years 1421 to 1428, which give definite and conclusive evidence as to Masaccio's date and circumstances. Though even without this, Vasari's remark should have sufficed to prevent the mistake. Lippi died in 1469 at the age of 57. Minor Sculptors Though the transcendent genius of Donatello threw all others into the shade, there were various other distinguished sculptures who also flourished at this period, making Cosimo's time specially notable in this branch of art. The chief of these were Desiderio da Settinano, a pupil of Donatello and eminent among the sculptors of this time. Perkins considers his tomb of Carlo Masupini in Santa Croce as one of the three finest tombs in Tuscany, while well, he says of the bust of Marietta Palastrozzi, quote, It would be difficult to point out a bust which more thoroughly combines those peculiar features of the best 
Quattrocento work, high technical excellence, refinement of taste, delicacy of treatment, and purity of design. Unquote. The beautiful head of St. Cecilia in Stiacciato, low relief, now the property of Lord Weems, which used to be attributed to Donatello, is now said to be by Desiderio. Bernardo and Antonio Rossellino. Bernardo Rossellino executed the fine tomb of Leonardo Bruni in Santa Croce and the monument of Beata Villana in the Rucellai Chapel in Santa Maria Novella of Antonio Rossellino. Perkins says, quote, He possessed grace, delicacy of treatment, dignity, and a rare feeling of beauty and sweetness of expression, as we see in the noble monument of the Cardinal Portogallo at San Miniato, Florence. Unquote. He considers this tomb one of the most beautiful in Italy. Mino da Fiesol, another still more famous sculptor of this period, who outlived those previously mentioned. His works show a refined taste, great delicacy of detail, and much devotional feeling. Regarding his tomb of Bishop Salutati in the Cathedral of Fiesol, Perkins says, quote, The bust of the bishop is certainly one of the most living and strongly characterized counterfeit presentments of nature ever produced in marble. Unquote. Mino da Fiesol also executed the beautiful tabernacle in the Medici Chapel at Santa Croce, and many busts, altarpieces, and other celebrated works during the time of Piero il Gottoso and Lorenzo the Magnificent. Antonio and Piero Polagiuolo. These two brothers were celebrated sculptors, painters, goldsmiths, and medalists of the time. Their renown belongs almost entirely to Antonio, his younger brother, Piero, producing little notable work. Antonio's principal existing work in Florence is the silver altar of the baptistry, kept in the Opera del Duomo, and in Rome his two tombs of Pope Sixtus IV and Pope Innocent VIII. The fine medal of the Pazzi Conspiracy, hitherto attributed to him, is now said to be by Bertoldo, the well-known pupil of Donatello, Antonio Polagiuolo, was no less celebrated as a painter than as a sculptor and medalist. In 1460, three large and very famous canvases, five braccia high, about nine feet, were painted by him for the hall of the Medici Palace, depicting the combats of Hercules with the lion, with the hydra, and with Antaeus. Vasari describes them in detail and speaks with great admiration of their execution. When the Medici Palace was sacked in 1494, they were appropriated by the Signoria and removed to the Council Hall of the Palazzo della Signoria, where they hung for many years, but have since been lost. Vasari, in mentioning them, states that they were painted for Lorenzo the Magnificent, but this must be a mistake on his part, for in a letter of Polagiuolo's own, he states that he painted them in 1460, and at that time Cosimo was head of the house, and his grandson Lorenzo, a boy of only eleven years old. So that they were painted for Cosimo. There were two small panel pictures on the same subject by Pollajuolo, now in the Uffizi Gallery, evidently painted about the same time, and these give us an idea of what the celebrated canvases which adorned the walls of the principal reception room of the Medici Palace in the time of Cosimo Piero and Lorenzo were like. Cosimo, 1463-1464 Cosimo grew old very rapidly, suffering severely from gout, and in his later years becoming very infirm, which caused him to leave the home affairs of the state to a very large extent to others, a condition of things under which we first hear of the incapable Luca Pitti who during the last four years of Cosimo's life thrust himself into a prominent place in public matters, though Cosimo still kept foreign affairs in his own hands. His long labours for his country's welfare had borne their full fruit, 
none now questioned or attempted to disturb the position he had so deservedly gained. We find the Signoria in an official document, a letter to the Venetian Republic, calling him Capo della Repubblica, though he held no official position at the time, and head of the Republic he was universally acknowledged to be to the very end of his life. Giovanni Cosimo, like his father, had two sons, Piero, born in 1416, and Giovanni, born in 1421. The death of the latter at the age of 42 is the last prominent incident connected with Cosimo's life. Giovanni had all the family love of learning, and many rare manuscript books collected by him are still in the Medici Library in San Lorenzo. His portrait bust by Mino da Fiesole, who knew him well, gives us a thoroughly reliable representation of his appearance. As the chronic ill health of his elder brother Piero made it unlikely that the latter would survive their father, Giovanni was brought up as the future head of the family, was looked on by all as his father's successor, and was Cosimo's favourite son. To a family situated as the Medici were at this time, it was of the utmost importance that whoever succeeded Cosimo as head of the house should be both capable and popular, so that Cosimo's feeling regarding his two sons was not unnatural. Nor did Giovanni come short of his father's hopes in this respect. His ability, good sense, tact, and knowledge of men made him highly popular, and he promised to be a worthy successor to Cosimo. So, as Piero's health grew from year to year worse, all the hopes of the family rested on Giovanni. The latter was married to Ginevra Degla Albizzi, one of that family who had so violently opposed Cosimo in his earlier years, and tried to compass his ruin and death. Giovanni and Ginevra's only child, a son, then nine years old, died in 1461. But, alas for human hopes, in 1463, one year before Cosimo's own death, Giovanni, the hope of the house, died. The grief into which the family were plunged at this serious misfortune was very great. Cosimo was broken down, physically helpless, and his death soon to be expected. Piero was likely to die any day, and his eldest son, Lorenzo, was only fourteen years old so that with Giovanni dead, it seemed that all the prospects of the family were destroyed. For it was well known that powerful enemies, including all those other families jealous of the one which was rising to such eminence, were on the watch for an opportunity to bring its power to an end. There is a pathetic story of the infirm and aged Cosimo after this death of his favourite son, having himself carried through the rooms of the spacious palace which he had built, and which had seen two such gaps made in the family within three years, and several times repeating, too large a house now for so small a family. Giovanni was buried in the family church of San Lorenzo, which was then just finished, and had been endowed by Cosimo. Giovanni di Bicci and Picarda had already been buried in the old sacristy, and their grandson, the second Giovanni, was now also interned there, and when, six years later, his brother Piero died, the sculptor Verrocchio, Donatello's best pupil, was called upon to design a joint tomb for the two brothers, and executed the very tasteful one which stands in the archway between the sacristy and the chapel of the Madonna, consisting of a sarcophagus of porphyry with bronze acanthus leaves climbing over it. It is Verrocchio's earliest important work. Cosimo, 1464 Cosimo died on the 1st of August, 1464, at his beloved villa of Carreggi, at the age of 75. Piero, in relating their grandfather's death to his two sons the following day, says as follows, quote, He counselled me that, as you had good abilities, I ought to bring you up well, and you would then relieve me of many cares. He said that he did not wish any pomp or demonstration at his funeral. He reminded me, as he had told me before, 
of where he wished to be buried in San Lorenzo, and he said all in such an orderly manner and with so much prudence and spirit that it was wonderful. He added that his life had been long, therefore he was well content to leave it when God willed. Yesterday morning he had himself completely dressed. He then made his confession to the prior of San Lorenzo, after which he caused mass to be said, making the responses as if he were in health. Afterwards, being asked to make profession of his faith, he said the creed word for word, said the confession himself, and then received the holy sacrament, doing so with as much devotion as one can describe, having first asked pardon of every one for any wrongs he had done them, which things have encouraged me in my hope towards God. Unquote. Cosimo's popularity with his countrymen lasted to the very end, as well as the respect with which he was regarded by the rulers of all other states. He was buried as he had desired without any pomp, and at first in the old sacristy of San Lorenzo. The Signoria had planned to give him a magnificent funeral and a very imposing monument, but the Medici family, on the proposal being put before them, refused to have either. The people, however, were determined to give him some special honour. A public decree was therefore passed by the Signoria, conferring on him the title of Pater Patriae, and ordering that this should be inscribed by the Republic on his tomb. It therefore bears the honourable inscription, Cosimus Medicis hic situs est, decreto publico Pater Patriae. No greater honour could have been done him than that such a title should thus be given him after his death, and by this title of Pater Patriae he has ever since been known in history. But the honour done to Cosimo's memory was not confined to giving him the title of Father of his Country. A further and more peculiar honour was conferred. San Lorenzo, founded in such ancient times, is the Ambrosian Basilica, having beneath its high altar many highly venerated relics of the martyrs, and an ancient rule of the Catholic Church prohibited, out of reverence thereto, the burial of any persons in such basilicas, only permitting them to be buried in sacristies or chapels attached to the church. And although, in special cases, persons of importance were allowed to be buried in the vault below the church, none so interred were permitted to have a tombstone in the church, but their tombstones were required to be placed in the vault. There are consequently no tombstones in the pavement of the nave of San Lorenzo except one. This solitary exception is in the case of Cosimo Pater Patriae. Migliore, in his interesting old book entitled Firenze, Sita Noblissima, 1684, in describing the church of San Lorenzo, gives the following account of this matter. Quote, and here is to be seen maintained a most laudable disposition of the canons of the church, especially at the Council of Bragarense, held in Portugal under Giovanni the Third, which is not to allow the burial of the dead in the basilica, out of reverence to the relics of the blessed martyrs. And in accordance with this disposition, you find at the foot of the altar, in the middle of the pavement, placed in the memory of Cosimo Padre della Patria, the marble memorial in a circle of serpentine and porphyry, with the arms of the Medici at the four sides. But the body is not in the place which is thus represented, but is placed beneath in the vault, with all the other personages buried in that church, without any description of them in the pavement above them. This was a sign of the difference which ought to be maintained between them, and him who was like a founder of this church, also, as a man who, much separated from the crowd, had no equal in those happy times when the fame of worthy persons travelled upon the wings of fortune, so that one who well knew his qualities sums up all by saying, Via potens famosus in toto mundo, a man most able, famous in all the world. None, added Il Volterano, in public affairs of such capacity, nor in learning, wisdom and knowledge his equal. Unquote. 
After dilating on all that Cosimo did for the Republic and Italy, the account concludes by saying, quote, After his death, the Republic conferred on him the honourable title of Pater Patriae, never before conferred on any one in that Republic, and rarely even in that of Rome, and this was accompanied by extraordinary pomp at the sole cost of the Republic in transferring his body to this sepulchre, which brought to mind that given to Fabius Maximus. Unquote. And if we penetrate into the vault below, we find in what a peculiar way this special honour to Cosimo was carried out. Evidently, the Florentines were determined to do nothing by halves in the matter, for instead of finding, as we should have expected, a sarcophagus with Cosimo's name on it, placed in the vault underneath the memorial slab in the pavement of the church, we find immediately below the porphyry slab a large square pillar of about eight feet on each side, extending right up to the floor of the church above, and having on it only the Medici arms and one short Latin inscription of five words, simply stating that Piero has placed this to the memory of his father. This pillar is Cosimo's tomb. His own name does not appear on it at all. That is borne by the porphyry slab above, the whole being thus joined together in one monument. It was an honour never, then or afterwards, accorded to any one else in Florence, and thus is Cosimo, after all in reality, buried in front of the high altar of San Lorenzo. An immense amount has been written on Cosimo's character, and as usual in the case of the Medici, the most violently opposite views have been enunciated. Those with whom the name of Medici overthrows all balance can see in him no virtues. Thus, even a comparatively temperate writer like Simmons, who is far surpassed by others on that side, calls Cosimo a cynical, self-seeking bourgeois tyrant. But Simmons would have found it hard to substantiate his string of epithets out of the facts of Cosimo's life. Other writers declare that every seeming virtue in Cosimo was assumed for some unworthy end, but there are many facts of Cosimo's life which decline to accord with this assertion. Nor, had it been true, could Marsilio Ficino have written, I owe to Plato much, to Cosimo no less, he realised for me the virtues of which Plato gave me the conception. Simmons and other writers accuse Cosimo of having undermined the liberties of Florence. But the changes introduced by him in the form of the Constitution were few and unimportant. The truth was that Florence, notwithstanding her republican forms, had never really possessed freedom, and that the people, wearied of perpetual dissensions, strife, banishments, and the losses which these entailed, welcomed the stable and efficient government which Cosimo gave them. Had it not been so, his rule, resting solely on popularity, would promptly have been terminated. There was, however, in Florentine politics, a Medician party and an anti-Medician party, and the latter put forward assertions, quite regardless of whether these had any solid basis, which in later times have formed the ground of unbalanced judgments and exaggerated statements which have been repeated by one writer after another as though they expressed the acknowledged verdict of history. And at the hands of such writers Cosimo has fared ill indeed. His arduous labours for the welfare of the state and people have been declared due solely to personal ambition. The far-sighted statesmanship by which he managed to control for so long a period the destinies of his country, and to guide her affairs with such success, has been declared to have been merely a crafty plan, pursued with the utmost dissimulation, to pave the way towards the destruction of the Republic. Deeds of his done purely for the benefit of the people have been either dismissed as of little importance, or else attributed to sinister motives. Lastly, even the title placed upon his tomb by his countrymen has been represented as a mere empty compliment. Though compliments are seldom thought necessary when the person no longer survives to hear them. All this, however, involves the assumption that, 
an exceptionally quick-witted race, specially on the watch against attempts to steal away their independence, should, in this one instance, and throughout so long a period as thirty years, have displayed a want of discernment at variance with all their history. Machiavelli's estimate of Cosimo is as follows, quote, He was one of the most prudent of men, grave and courteous and of venerable appearance. His early years were full of trouble, exile and personal danger, but by the unwearied generosity of his disposition he triumphed over all his enemies and made himself most popular with the people. Though so rich, yet in his mode of living he was always very simple and without ostentation. None of his time had such an intimate knowledge of government and of state affairs. Hence, even in a city so given to change, he retained the government for thirty years. Unquote. Unwearied generosity of disposition exactly expresses the general idea which is given us by the facts of Cosimo's life as the most prominent feature of his character. And setting aside all testimony of writers on the one side or the other, the indisputable benefits which he conferred on his country, the end which he put to faction fighting which sapped Florence's strength, the prosperity and the contentment which he secured for the people, the relief from taxation which he brought about by the effects of his enlightened foreign policy, and lastly, the general character associated with his memory in the minds of the common people of Tuscany, all go to refute the unbalanced judgments which have been referred to, and to corroborate those who have considered that the title engraved by his countrymen upon his tomb was justly deserved, and correctly sums up the leading features of his character and conduct. End of section 10「Section 11 of The Medici, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avahi in February 2020. The Medici, Volume 1 by G. F. Young. Chapter 5 The Medici Palace. Before taking our next step in the history of the Medici, let us look at the house in which they lived and which is inseparably concerned with Cosimo, its builder, for it is a notable one. For this is the cradle in which things which now form all the intellectual life of Europe were nursed and nourished in their infancy and helped to grow. The Medici in the course of their history occupied three successive palaces in Florence, the first, that which was occupied by Giovanni di Bicci, connected with their rise, the second, this in the Via Larga, connected with all their greatest time in history, the third, that on the south side of the Arno, the Pitti Palace, connected with their decline and end. But it is this second of the three, their home during all the time of their greatest achievements, which must ever have the chief attraction for those who study their history. A world of interest gathers round this palace. It is interesting architecturally, as the first to be constructed of all the Renaissance palaces of Florence. It is interesting historically from the many important events with which it is associated. And lastly, it is deeply interesting on account of its connection with learning and art. As regards its architectural interest, the first thing noticeable about it is its date, 1430, and its extraordinary advance in style, spaciousness and general arrangements beyond all palaces of like date in France, England or Germany. We look at it when it has been standing 475 years and yet do not find it jar on us by any appearance of inferiority of style or meanness of proportions. Thus we are apt to forget that it was built when the Battle of Agincourt had only been fought fifteen years, when the Wars of the Roses had not yet begun, and when Henry the Sixth was only eight years old. But let it be compared with anything of the kind elsewhere of the same date, 
and it will be realized how far in advance this handsome spacious and commodious palace erected by the medici for themselves in fourteen thirty was beyond even king's palaces of that date in england france or germany it is built in three orders of architecture the peculiar style rustica on the ground floor doric on the second story and corinthian on the third the rustica style with its grand roughly hewn stones a style of construction which afterwards became so fashionable was first employed in the building of this palace we are told that michelozzo adopted it because it united an appearance of solidity and strength with the light and shadow so essential to beauty under the glare of an italian sun it was exceedingly expensive and was the principal cause of the new palace being spoken of as too grand for an ordinary citizen the corner of the ground floor towards the via de gori was originally an open loggia the windows of the upper stories are divided by elegant little columns with carved above them cosimo's own special device of the three feathers and the arms of the medici the palle or balls on the corner of the palace is the celebrated fanale one of the most perfect specimens of the well-known iron lamps made by Niccolo Caparra, and only permitted on the palaces of the most distinguished citizens. The solid character of the ground floor is in accordance with the requirements of the time. In that age the home of an important family had to be a fortress no less than a palace, and the ground floor of a Florentine palace was built as solidly as the Bastille, all decoration being reserved for the upper floors the entrance door of such palaces led through an arched vestibule into an open cortile or courtyard round which the four sides of the palace were built with a fine marble staircase leading up from the cortile to the handsome rooms on the first floor this palace was deliberately intended by cosimo to be a model of renaissance architecture it of course far surpassed when built any of the other palaces at that time in florence or in italy and it is remarkable that though it was the first of the kind and though it was succeeded by numerous others many of them of such excellence it still remains unsurpassed by any of them the worthy leader of all the great palaces of florence professor bannister fletcher in his history of architecture takes this palace as the best example of renaissance architecture as applied to palaces while he also notes that it gives us both the first and the finest example of two things in particular the solid rustica masonry and the bold and massive cornice eight feet in height which crowns the structure and considerably aids its impressive effect interesting however as this palace is architecturally it is still more so as the centre of so much history from the middle of the fifteenth to the middle of the sixteenth century this was the home of the medici during a hundred years from the time of cosimo pater patrie until in fifteen thirty nine cosimo the first the first grand duke moved to the palazzo vecchio preparatory to occupying the new and larger palace which he constructed on the other side of the arno it was thus their home throughout all their greatest time here have been entertained emperors popes kings princes and most of the distinguished men of that period here cosimo pater patrie passed his strenuous years so full of varied labours here lorenzo the magnificent gathered round him his brilliant intellectual coterie here the future pope leo x was brought up here his cousin afterwards pope clement the seventh devised his deep-laid schemes for the advancement of the family here catherine de medici was born and lived as a girl and here nearly all the most prominent events in florence's history during her most important period have taken place not many palaces in europe have given hospitality to so many notable persons as have passed through the entrance doorway of this home of the medici 
Migliore says that owing to the number and high rank of those entertained there, the Medici Palace was called the Hotel of the Princes of the Whole World. It is now known as the Riccardi Palace, having been, long subsequently, bought from the state by that family, but now that it has again passed into the possession of the state, it might well be called by its own name. Though now so little thought of, it is one of the most important buildings in Florence, and should have that importance duly marked. Greater still, however, is the interest attaching to this palace from the point of view of learning and art. The inscription which it still bears designates it as the nurse of all learning, and justly so, for it was here that the ancient learning of Greece and Rome was called back to life, and it was from hence that the new learning went forth to change the face of Europe. Entering by the central doorway and passing through the arched vestibule, one finds oneself in the cortile. This court was once adorned with various celebrated statues, among them Donatello's bronze statue of David, which worked so important an effect in the world of art, while we still see over the arches his medallions. And here, all round under the arcades, are classical busts, inscriptions, and sarcophagi, recalling the time when the enthusiasm for the ancient learning burned so strongly here, that time when Marsilio Ficino, the great scholar whom Cosimo treated almost as a son, kept a lamp burning before the bust of Plato as before an altar. Here also art was reverenced and encouraged to a scarcely less degree than learning. The number of objects of art which the Medici collected round them in this palace was extraordinary. A glimpse of it is given us in the remark made by the Duke of Milan in 1471 that he had not seen in all Italy so many objects of art as he saw in this palace. Yet this was before Lorenzo the Magnificent added thereto all the immense collection made by him during his twenty-three years' rule, by which he at least doubled all that had been collected by his father and grandfather. The whole of this great accumulation of art treasures was lost when the palace was sacked by the mob in 1494, while the same plundering of all the art treasures collected in the meantime happened again in 1527. It shows, therefore, what profuse art collectors the Medici were, when we find that, though all was thus twice over swept away, the galleries and museums of Florence still contain paintings, statues, bronzes, gems, and other objects of art, almost all of them collected by the Medici, sufficient to surpass any other collection of such things in Europe. This passion for collecting objects of art on the most lavish scale was permanent in this family through all changes, and from their rise right down to their end. No differences of character seemed to make any difference in this, and whether they were public-minded statesmen like Cosimo Pater Patrie, or luxurious popes like Leo X, or iron-handed tyrants like Cosimo I, or incapable occupiers of a tottering throne like the last two grand dukes, there is not one of them in the whole three hundred and forty-three years of their course who does not show this strong family characteristic. In the now deserted court of the palace of the Medici there is to be seen a long Latin inscription which runs as follows. After calling on the traveller to pause and note that this was once the celebrated house of the Medici, Mediceas Olim Aedes, and that here a long list of emperors, kings, popes, and other exalted personages have been entertained, it continues thus. Traveller. Once the house of the Medici, in which not alone so many great men, but knowledge herself had her home the house which was the nurse of all learning, which here revived again. Renowned also for its cultured magnificence, a treasury of antiquity and the arts. The homes of departed glory are few over which a prouder epitaph could be placed. 
and it is in this connection that we may trace the origin of that unique appreciation of art which the medici as a family possessed that second sphere in which they were as notable though in a different way as they were in regard to learning for they give us an example on the wide scale of the connection between those two things all who feel the spirit of art know that technical excellence is not the chief thing that there must also be the expression of some thought some creation of the artist's brain we see that pictures or statues which lack this and rely solely on excellence of technique though they may gain a certain degree of eminence never obtain the highest and most lasting fame hence it is that it has been said of technical criticism that it can only show us the things that are of minor consequence if then the real value of a picture lies in the thoughts that it expresses it is evident that the more knowledge we possess the more likely we are to be able to read those thoughts and so to appreciate the picture and this true everywhere is doubly so in the case of the great masters of the classic age of painting who were many-sided men learned in many subjects ruskin after long study of an important fresco picture by one of these masters remarked that he stood amazed at the mass of varied knowledge in history science theology and other subjects displayed by the artist and that as he realized how much it surpassed his own knowledge on the subjects concerned and marked that this mass of knowledge on the part of the artist was joined also to perfect drawing and coloring he felt that he stood indeed in the presence of a master every picture in fact except those belonging to the time of art's decadence has something to say lord lindsay calls the efforts of the earliest masters the burning messages of prophecy uttered by the stammering lips of infants and whether the execution be crude or not the true pleasure in art lies in looking through and beyond it and deciphering that burning message if such be there art therefore is a universal language and one in which the artist opens to us a world of high and deep thoughts of which we had before no conception thus learning and art go hand in hand for without learning art has nothing to say and art that has nothing to say will never long hold the attention of mankind as then we stand in the deserted court of the palace which was the nurse of all learning we can understand how natural it was that the learning of the medici should lead them to become the greatest patrons of art that the world has ever seen end of section 11section 12 of the medici volume 1 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the medici volume 1 by g f young chapter 6 piero il gotoso born 1416 ruled 1464 to 1469 died 1469 piero il gotoso has failed to receive from history the notice that he deserves he is generally passed over by historians either with no mention at all or else with merely a few disparaging remarks referring to his physical infirmities it will be seen however that his history and character merit no little attention upon the death of his father cosimo paterpatrie piero then forty-eight years old succeeded to the headship of the family and the rule of florence from his very boyhood he had been afflicted with gout and was early in life given the name of il gotoso the gouty by which he is always known his constant ill health handicapped him greatly throughout life often making him unable for long periods to take any active part in public affairs and forcing him instead to devote himself to the retired life of the scholar 
while his younger brother giovanni was practically given his place became his father's favorite and was looked upon by all as the future head of the family and the first indication that we get of piero's character is the fact that we never hear during all the thirty years that he had to bear this of any sign of resentment on his part either towards his father or brother on this account yet he possessed a full measure of the ability of the medici family as he both then and afterwards showed for not only was he recognized as a powerful scholar but also we find him sent on several occasions during cosimo's lifetime on various embassies to venice to milan and to france and highly thought of by those to whom he was thus sent and none were more acute judges of character and ability than doge francesco foscari duke francesco sforza of milan and king louis the eleventh of france moreover in connection with these embassies the character and ability of piero il gotoso have received a very unique testimony one born to this day by the medici coat of arms for so high an opinion did louis the eleventh form of piero's abilities that he conferred on him on his becoming head of the family the very special honor of permission to stamp the lilies of france on one of the balls of the medici arms that ball being colored blue for this purpose and from this time forward the medici arms have one blue ball with the french lily quite different in shape from the florentine lily upon it which thus remains a permanent record of the high estimation gained in a country outside his own by piero il gotoso we do not find that his constant ill health soured piero's disposition in every act of his life he showed a disposition the reverse of an ill-tempered one even though his conduct of business and public affairs had more often than not to be performed from a sick man's couch while various writers mention that one of his special characteristics was an intense hatred of all quarrels but there is a third indication of his character which is more striking in his case alone we have none of that conflict of opinion among rival historians giving the most opposite views of character and motives which has been alluded to as so common throughout the history of this family even those most bitterly biased against the whole race of medici have nothing to say against piero il gotoso he is the one solitary head of this family throughout their whole history in whose case this feature is absent before considering his history it is necessary to note exactly what was the position to which on his father's death he succeeded one necessarily speaks of it as the rule over the state but that term is liable to mislead unless we bear in mind the peculiar position it must not be forgotten that the governing body was the signoria with its president the gonfaloniere piero was not one of this body and therefore had theoretically no official position but it had gradually come about as a consequence of the influence which cosimo had so long wielded that every measure passed by the signoria must be agreed to by the head of the medici family before it could be carried into effect thus the head of the medici family though theoretically no more than a simple citizen of the republic did in actual fact bear the rule over the state and wielded almost complete authority but it must be remembered that the continuance of that position rested solely on two conditions a constantly maintained demonstration by the person in question of an ability greater than that of his fellow-citizens and a no less constantly maintained popularity let either of these factors fail to continue and the position at once reverted to the theoretical one wherein the head of the medici family was only an ordinary citizen and as liable as any other to be exiled by the signoria when piero's brother giovanni died cosimo seeing that piero's frail life might terminate any day had advanced the latter's elder son lorenzo giving him practice in every way possible in public affairs though he was only fourteen but lorenzo had only reached the age of fifteen when his grandfather died he was however capable beyond his years 
the greatest attention had from the very first been paid by piero to the education of his two sons landino wrote a whole treatise on the education of the two young medici and piero as soon as lorenzo was old enough had appointed marsilio ficino the celebrated head of the platonic academy to be his tutor when therefore piero became head of the family he continued the course which cosimo had begun to adopt and while he retained foreign affairs in his own hands left home politics largely in the hands of his capable young son for thirty years there had been no further attempts to oust the medici from that position of power in florence to which they had attained now however the attempt was again to be made to get rid of them a large party of all those jealous of the position this family had come to occupy saw in the feeble health of piero and the extreme youth of his eldest son an opportunity for effecting this and began to stir up a movement against the medici which was headed by luca pitti assisted by such prominent men as agnolo accioli niccolo sordini and even dietti salvi neroni who had been cosimo's most trusted adviser and on whom he had specially advised piero to lean and since those concerned knew that owing to the popularity of the medici the lower classes of the people would not permit any regular process for their exile the above movement soon grew into plans for a formidable rebellion by force of arms the objects which the conspirators set before themselves were the death of piero and the banishment of the family the plots for this were being carried on all through fourteen sixty five and the first half of fourteen sixty six piero appears to have known that something was going on but with his habitual dislike of intrigues and quarrels chose to ignore it and was apparently right in feeling that if it came to a head he had in himself the abilities to defeat it he knew luca pitti's character as a vain but incapable man and that the others relied too much on the results of his own bad health also for some time the conspirators could not agree as to their plan of action so that for the first two years of piero's rule no overt action took place meanwhile the chief events in other states were as follows pope pius the second died in the same month as cosimo pater patriae and was succeeded by paul the second in france louis the eleventh was introducing a new era cold measured crafty and detestable for his many murders and cruelties especially for the way in which he in many cases lured his victims to their deaths by treachery he had gained the name of the universal spider at the same time he worked an immense change in france which was for her ultimate benefit he destroyed the power of the nobles gradually murdering them in turn until he left none who could be formidable and quenched all elements of independence but he converted chaos into order made france into a strong and prosperous kingdom and was the founder of her absolute monarchy during the first six years of his reign fourteen sixty one to fourteen sixty seven he was occupied in the above struggle until by the end of this period he had for the time crushed the power of the nobles in france in fourteen sixty six francesco sforza duke of milan died ever since he had gained his throne by cosimo's assistance he had been a firm friend of the medici and the death of this strong ally tended to weaken piero's position both as regards foreign affairs and in his own state as francesco's son and successor galeazzo sforza was not so strong a character nor so surely to be relied upon in august fourteen sixty six the conspiracy which had been hatching for two years to take piero's life and destroy the medici came to a head the party headed by luca pitti assembled their forces in arms a few miles from florence and laid plans for seizing piero who was lying seriously ill at careggi at the same time a force from ferrara under ercole d'este duke borso's brother advanced to the frontier to assist them but the conspirators were completely mistaken in their man for piero displayed a resolution and energy extraordinary in one handicapped as he was by severe illness getting into a litter he at once started for florence 
but on the way he had a narrow escape on this occasion his young son lorenzo then seventeen displayed great coolness in danger and resource whereby he saved his father's life riding on ahead he heard of an armed party who were lying in wait for piero on the ordinary road with much adroitness he managed to keep their attention occupied while he sent back word to the party who were escorting his father and caused him to be conveyed by a different route to florence in safety arrived at the medici palace piero at once set about collecting his adherents sent to beg the assistance of some milanese troops who happened to be near the borders of tuscany and had soon collected a larger force than his opponents he marched against them the conspirators divided by the vacillations of luca pitti and their own dissensions and confused by piero's promptness were unable to fight their force melted away and dispersed and the leaders surrendered a new signoria just elected promptly passed a sentence of death upon the ringleaders luca pitti dieti salvi neroni niccolo sorerini and agnolo acciaioli and certainly never did men more deserve it especially neroni who had throughout acted with the basest ingratitude treachery and dissimulation and now piero displayed the best side of his character he utterly refused to have these men put to death though it certainly would have been to his advantage not to interfere on their behalf for two of them neroni and sorerini only used their pardon and liberty to stir up venice to make war upon him he pardoned luca pitti outright and by his treatment of him converted him into a friend for life while the others were simply ordered to quit florence machiavelli says it was due to him piero that his partisans did not stain their hands in the blood of their fellow-citizens thus did piero put down a formidable rebellion without any bloodshed and this is probably the only instance in those ages of an armed rebellion which aimed at the death of the ruler being suppressed by him without the loss of a single life and even with the conversion of its principal leader into a permanent friend this one achievement of piero il gotoso is sufficient to demonstrate both his ability and the high qualities of his character and marks him out as one really fit to rule a state we are told that when luca pitti's rebellion was thus suppressed the young lorenzo commenting to a friend on his father's action said he only knows how to conquer who knows how to forgive it was conduct and qualities such as this displayed by the earlier generations of the medici which helped to raise that family to its high eminence in florence and when sixty years after this clarice de medici become by marriage clarice strozzi in her impassioned harangue contrasted the behaviour of her ancestors with that of those then representing the family and said that it was by magnanimity and clemency that the former had gained the favour of the florentines she said no more than the actual truth the natural effect of the defeat of such a formidable effort to destroy the family and especially when so complete a victory was accompanied by such clemency and kindliness was to make the medici stronger than ever in their peculiar position in florence after this affair their popularity with the people caused the head of the family to become more than ever a king in all but the name the above episode was followed in the next year fourteen sixty seven by war with venice ever since cosimo's alliance with milan venice had waited for an opportunity of revenge upon the medici and this seemed now to have come niccolo sorerini and dieti salvi neroni requited piero for saving their lives by proceeding to venice and persuading the doge and council to attack him asserting that there was a large party in florence ready to take up arms against the medici the venetian army therefore commanded by the celebrated bartolomeo colioni was in may fourteen sixty seven dispatched against florence's territory piero's conduct however had entirely won over those who had previously been ready to attack the medici 
so that the supposed adherence of venice in florence proved non-existent piero was also successful in obtaining as his allies both the duke of milan and the king of naples each of whom sent him some troops the florentine army opposed that of venice in the little state of imola where at length a battle was fought in which the venetian army was defeated after which in april fourteen sixty eight a peace was concluded as the result of which florence gained a much coveted addition to her territory viz the town of sartazana and the fortress of sartazanello this was followed in august of the same year by a short but very successful campaign in which florence assisted by naples and urbino opposed the pope and prevented him from seizing upon the small state of rimini by these successes piero still further strengthened the position of his family in florence these various troubles having been overcome the year fourteen sixty nine the last year of piero's life was one of peace and festivities his son lorenzo was now nineteen and his second son giuliano fifteen and in february fourteen sixty nine these two young medici organized a splendid tournament which they intended should be the inauguration of a lighter and more festive life than the somewhat sombre one which their father's ill health and the political troubles of the last few years had made customary it was held in order to celebrate lorenzo's betrothal to clarice orsini the roman bride who had been selected for him by his mother lucrezia tonabuoni whose letters from rome to her husband piero describing the young lady's appearance are still preserved clarice orsini at this time sixteen also writes letters to lorenzo conveying various polite greetings while she complains to a friend that lorenzo is so greatly occupied with this jousting that he does not find time to write to her often enough by her anxiety and depression for several days on account of the tilting and her relief when she heard it was over without mishap to lorenzo we are reminded that a tournament was not merely a splendid show but that wounds and death were always possible in the course of it it is evident that clarice's abilities were not of a very high order and that her education fell considerably below that customary in the family she was about to enter which she considered so far beneath her own even lucrezia tornabuoni while praising the appearance of the girl she had chosen for her son says that she is not to be compared with maria lucrezia and bianca her own daughters this tournament which so fully engaged the young lorenzo's attention provided florence with a more gorgeous spectacle than the city had ever before witnessed and was the first of those great pageants for which lorenzo's age afterwards became famous it was immortalized in one of the two most celebrated poems of the fifteenth century la giostra di lorenzo de medici by luca pulci standing in the piazza santa croce where as a substitute for the fierce battles between citizens of former days this exciting scene of mimic warfare took place how vividly does its fantastic splendor voluminously described in the writings of the time rise before our eyes the reigning beauty of florentine society lucrezia donati who was queen of the tournament the young scions of the medici pazzi pucci benci Urcelai, vespucci and other principal families who were the knights and each knight accompanied by his standard-bearer heralds trumpeters pages and men-at-arms all wearing his colors and arrayed in the most splendid fashion the extravagant punctilio the grandiloquent compliments the delight of the vast crowd occupying every roof balcony window and other point of vantage round the piazza and all lit up by florentine sunshine in february the knights first appeared in most magnificent dresses for an imposing procession round the piazza accompanied by every sort of display after which they changed into their armor for the actual combat we may gather some idea of the dresses from the description of that of lorenzo he had a diamond in the centre of his shield and rubies and diamonds in his cap a velvet surcoat with a cape of white silk edged with red and a silk scarf embroidered with roses and pearls 
for the actual combat he wore another surcoat of velvet fringed with gold with a helmet adorned with three blue feathers his horse was draped with red and white velvet embroidered with pearls the device on his standard was a bay tree one half dry and dead looking and the other half green with the motto worked in pearls le temps revient symbolizing that a time of youth and joy after the winter of cosimo's old age and piero's ill health was now to supervene the occasion was considered of sufficient importance for the king of naples and the dukes of ferrara and milan to present lorenzo with horses and armor for it lorenzo in his own writings mentions this tournament and says in order to do as others i appointed a tournament in the piazza santa croce with great splendor and at great expense so that it cost me about ten thousand gold florins although i was young and of no great skill the first prize was awarded to me namely a helmet inlaid with silver and surmounted with a figure of mars Giuliano also, though as yet too young to take so prominent a part as his brother, was splendidly arrayed, and this handsome boy of fifteen, in helmet and armor, and mounted on a fine charger, won the admiration of all. Several busts of him in his armor and wearing the dragon-shaped helmet designed for him by Verrocchio were executed, and it seems most probable that the terracotta bust by Antonio Polariolo now in the museum of the bargello and catalogued as an unknown portrait bust is in reality one of these busts of giuliano miss crutwell in her work on antonio polaiolo considers that it was executed at about this date and says it is probably a portrait of one of the medici whose type of face and arrogant bearing it resembles closely giuliano is known to have specially patronized polaiolo and in the inventory of the collections in the medici palace other works by that artist are recorded as being all in giuliano's room in the palace again there was no other youth of the same age at this period in florence whose bust in this style would have been likely to be executed by polaiolo but above all it has the well-known lock of hair on the forehead which was so distinguishing a feature of giuliano's face and is often mentioned so that altogether there seems to be little doubt that we have in this bust of polaiolo's a portrait of giuliano as he was at fifteen the bust has been greatly damaged the arms being broken off as well as the dragon-shaped helmet leaving only one of the legs of the dragon at one side of the head but the face with its charming boyish frankness is uninjured and as miss crutwell says seems to fill the room with its buoyant vivacious life the details of the armor representing hercules fighting with the serpents and with the stymphalian bird are as admirably executed as the portrait itself in the following june the marriage of lorenzo to clarice orsini took place on this occasion of the marriage of their eldest son piero and his wife lucrezia gave a magnificent entertainment to all florence it was a marriage which gave evidence of how the medici were advancing in worldly esteem for the orsini were one of the greatest families in italy but whether the medici would not have done better for themselves if they had adhered to those florentine marriages such as they had hitherto made and which had produced a cosimo pater patrie a piero il gotoso and a lorenzo the magnificent may well be doubted looking at the subsequent history the marriage took place on the fourth june in the family church of san lorenzo and the festivities in connection with it were on the most profuse scale the entire city being feasted by the medici for three successive days Quote, feasting dancing and music continued day and night until one wonders at the endurance of the people some idea of the extravagance of the entertainment may be gathered from such a fact as that there were consumed of sweetmeats alone five thousand pounds End quote. while the populace were thus regaled all florentine society was entertained at five immense banquets in the medici palace quote, 
at these banquets the loggias and gardens of the palace in the via larga were filled to overflowing separate tables being set out for the young ladies who were the bride's companions fifty young women with whom to dance say the records and for the older ladies forming madonna lucrezia's company in the same way there were different tables for the young men who danced and for those of maturer years the feasting began on the sunday morning when the bride mounted upon the splendid charger presented to lorenzo by the king of naples left the house of the alessandri in the borgo san piero now borgo degli abizzi and entered her new home followed by a train of nobles the symbolic olive branch being hoisted at the window to the accompaniment of gay music and the festivities continued until the tuesday morning when she went to hear mass at the church of san lorenzo bearing in her hand one of the thousand wedding gifts a little book of our lady most marvellous written in letters of gold upon blue paper and with a cover of crystal and silver work Unquote. end of section twelve Section 13 of the Medici, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Medici, Volume 1, by G. F. Young. Chapter 6. Piero il Gotoso. Part 2. But the chief interest of the five years' rule of Piero il Gotoso centers in his prominent connection with the art of the period he had had greater leisure to pursue the family tastes for learning and art than would have been the case had he had better health and being passionately fond of both they had for thirty years been the chief interest of his life a thorough scholar he was as eager in the collection of rare manuscript books as his father and made many valuable additions to the medici library still more important was the unremitting assistance which he gave to art nearly every work of art which remains in florence belonging to piero's time was executed either for him or at his instigation including the one solitary work which the medici palace still retains the frescoes round the walls of the chapel in fourteen sixty six the great sculptor donatello died at the age of eighty one in accordance with his dying request to be laid close to his lifelong friend and patron cosimo pater patrie he was buried at the expense of the medici family in the crypt of san lorenzo alongside the tomb of cosimo almost the whole city with every architect sculptor and painter in florence following his funeral he was the last of those who had assisted at the outburst in art at the beginning of the century Masaccio, Brunelleschi, Ghiberti, and Frangelico had all passed away, and besides Lippi, who had left Florence and died three years after Donatello, the foremost men in art now were Luca della Robbia, Leon Battista Alberti, Piero della Francesca, and Benozzo Gozzoli, while another young painter, Sandro Botticelli, was just coming forward luca della robbia is another of those who struck out a special line in art entirely his own his chief work in marble the cantoria and his other works in marble and bronze have already been noticed but the works which have given him his special fame are the beautiful bas-reliefs executed by him in glazed terracotta generally white with a blue background a method which he gradually perfected and made his own Luca della Robbia's object in adopting this method was the invention of a form of art which could be employed for the decoration of churches and other buildings where marble bas-reliefs, from their costliness, were impossible. It is believed that the sight of some ancient Greek enameled ware gave Luca della Robbia the idea of using the same method for sculptures in relief. But, however that may be, his actual discovery made after profound studies in chemistry and innumerable experiments consisted in covering the clay model with an enamel which is thought to have consisted of the ingredients of glass mixed with oxide of tin the exact method was kept as a family secret but the particular method in which luca della robbia's conceptions were given permanence is of far less importance than the works themselves 
as the marquesa bordamaki says the joy of life the sadness of life the grief of the madonna the innocence of childhood the love of mother for child and of child for mother the great central lessons of the redemption angelic sympathy all these luca de la robbia has depicted with a perfection which no other artist has ever surpassed his date also is an important item in our appreciation of his genius looking at his works one can scarcely realize that he was born in the same year as masaccio and long before all that great army of painters who followed in the latter half of the fifteenth century yet it is not too much to say that for the beauty of expression in the faces of his madonnas of his angels and of his children including the representations of the child christ it is not until we reach raphael born eighty years after him that we find a painter able to equal him in these respects while even raphael does not in these points surpass him regarding his relief of the madonna and child with two angels in a curved lunette now in the museum of the bargello mr allan marquand after remarking that there is much of raphael's manner in the bearing of the madonna draws attention to her eyes and says luca's ideal of the madonna was evidently a woman with blue eyes while to the christ child he gives hazel eyes and in the relief of the madonna and child in the foundling hospital in which the child holds a scroll with the words ego sum lux mundi and the madonna's hand rests on the inscription quia respexit dominus humanitatum ansile sue mr marquand draws attention to the eyes marked in lilac the hairy eyebrows lilac upper eyelashes and pupils and a light shade of lilac in place of the usual grayish blue for the iris of the eye in the relief of the madonna and child with three cherub heads in an arched niche now in the museum of the bargello the heads of the cherubs are specially beautiful while his altarpiece in the church of the in prunetta near florence is considered to contain one of the most beautiful figures of st john the baptist ever executed luca della robbia lived to the age of eighty-one dying in fourteen eighty two leon battista alberti was one of those men of varied genius which the renaissance so often produced nominally he was an architect and also a painter but really and chiefly an authority on art in all its branches he occupies a similar position in his age to that occupied by leonardo da vinci fifty years later and it was as a universally accepted authority on art in general and not for any works of his own that alberti gained his fame vasari in speaking of him enlarges on how necessary learning is to an artist and speaks of the great aid which alberti gave to art by his writings saying that such is the force of his writings that he exercised far greater influence by them over art than many who surpassed him by their works alberti was exceedingly versatile he studied architecture painting perspective sculpture and latin he wrote two treatises on painting one on architecture and one on sculpture he invented a celebrated perspective glass and vasari says was expert in all physical exercises and in all the accomplishments of a gentleman alberti was a florentine but he belonged to the party of the foriusciti or permanent exiles and spent very little of his life in florence he died in rome in fourteen seventy two at the age of sixty seven piero della francesca though he worked first at florence and learnt his art there especially studying masaccio's frescoes did not belong to florence itself but to the small town of borgo san sepolcro which had become part of florence's territory in fourteen forty one his great work for art was the final discovery of the true laws of perspective that subject on which so many brains in the world of art had long been busy and which was the last of the secrets of the technique of painting to be discovered in this achievement he must be coupled to some extent with paolo uccello and with alberti and he really took up and carried on alberti's ideas 
it was arrived at by being worked out from a mathematical basis and not from any of the empirical methods which had been tried by many artists in succession piero della francesca's chief work was his treatise on perspective dedicated to the duke of urbino the most pleasing of his pictures the altarpiece now in the pinacoteca at perugia has a long colonnade in perfect perspective piero della francesca is also notable for two other things we have in his fresco paintings at arezzo the first real endeavour to paint historical pictures and in his portraits of the duke and duchess of urbino now in the uffizi gallery we have the first regular portraits in fourteen sixty nine piero della francesca then sixty three was invited to urbino by the duke in order to paint them duke federigo's is painted showing the left side of the face in order to conceal the loss of his right eye which together with his broken nose was caused by a severe wound received in a tournament the likeness judged by those on coins is admirable as also the perspective of the landscape in the distance these two valuable portraits hung in the palace at urbino as long as there were any dukes of urbino when in sixteen thirty four vittoria della rovere the sole heiress of the last duke of urbino was married to her first cousin ferdinand the second she brought as a part of her property these portraits of her ancestor and ancestress thus bringing them into the art collections of the medici family piero della francesca died in fourteen ninety two at the age of eighty six benozzo gazzoli pupil of fra angelico is the great illustrative painter of his time as the teller of a story he is unrivalled he was a most rapid and indefatigable worker covering huge spaces with his beautifully executed frescoes in a wonderfully short time thus he has left a mass of paintings which are very valuable historically bringing vividly before us the manners of the time of the earlier medici like so many others gozzoli began as a worker on the bronze doors under ghiberti after a time he began to learn painting under fra angelico working as his assistants at florence and rome until fourteen forty seven when he first began to paint alone benozzo gozzoli's three chief works are one his frescoes in the church of san agostino at san gimignano a great cycle of frescoes representing the life of st augustine from his boyhood to his death in seventeen scenes this huge work took even gozzoli four years two his frescoes in the chapel of the medici palace at florence which are considered his masterpiece see chapter seven three his frescoes in the campo santo at pisa this was a gigantic work it occupied gozzoli fifteen years and was nothing less than covering with his paintings the whole of the north wall of the campo santo a task says vasari immense enough to discourage a whole legion of masters the scenes represent the whole of the old testament history from the time of noah to that of solomon in twenty-three scenes gozzoli has introduced into these forest scenery scenes of the vintage in tuscany and much that is interesting in the life of the people also portraits of many prominent men of the time members of the medici family scholars painters and other celebrated men the execution however is very uneven and he was evidently then getting old he died at pisa in fourteen ninety seven and is buried in the campo santo he had beautified but besides the foregoing another young painter sandro botticelli was at this time beginning to come forward botticelli is par excellence the painter of the time of lorenzo the magnificent but his first period belongs to that of piero il Cotoso. one of his prominent characteristics is that being of an unusually receptive nature he reflects to a singular degree the prevailing mental atmosphere around him so much so that when the spirit of the time changes the spirit and character of his pictures change with it as a consequence botticelli's painting may be divided into four distinct periods with different styles due to events which caused marked changes in the life of florence these four periods are one the period of the rule of piero il gotoso 
fourteen sixty four to fourteen sixty nine two the period of the rule of lorenzo the magnificent fourteen sixty nine to fourteen ninety two three the time of savonarola's dominance in florence fourteen ninety four to fourteen ninety eight four the portion of botticelli's life after savonarola's death fourteen ninety eight to fifteen ten owing to the close connection which his pictures usually have with the events of the time there is less difficulty than with other painters in determining their date one very shortly after he became head of the family in fourteen sixty four piero began to employ sandro botticelli then a young painter of twenty in whom he recognized great talent and the modern world which values botticelli so highly owes gratitude to piero il cotoso for the generous help and encouragement by which he enabled the friendless youth to succeed as he did nor was piero il cotoso alone in this his highly cultured wife lucrezia tornaboni was at least as much concerned in the matter as her husband and in the pictures of botticelli's first period when he was between twenty and twenty-five her influence is clearly traceable by this talented pair of patrons botticelli only five years older than their eldest son was taken into the casa medici made almost like a son of the house and kept continually occupied in painting pictures for which they gave him liberal remuneration and botticelli throughout his life cherished a deep devotion towards piero il cotoso and his wife lucrezia for the help affection and encouragement which he had received from them in his earliest years as regards technique the chief point for which botticelli is always praised is his beauty of line in drawing his love of life dancing movement and waving drapery is very apparent ruskin says he often appears affected but would not have been in accord with the spirit of the time if he had not been slightly affected much studied grace of manner much formal assertion of scholarship were a part of the spirit of the time but he was gifted with another power greater than his technique botticelli was permeated with that spirit which donatello had taught as the ultimate aim and highest glory of art beginning to paint just two years before donatello died botticelli carried on the latter's message to the world of art he is able if his subject is a religious one to make a single picture convey a whole sermon if his subject is a classical myth to make a single picture bring before our minds the whole spirit of a period if his subject is historical to cause a single picture to relate the entire history of a long episode possessed of such a power he is naturally very fond of allegorical treatment and the suggestion of a whole train of thought often giving the entire meaning of his picture by some comparatively small detail hence while his poetry of imagination his human sympathy religious spirit and beautiful technique cannot but appeal to all a mere rapid glance at his pictures will fail to reveal their depth of thought while many of his most important pictures will not be understood at all without a full knowledge of the history of the period all the principal pictures of botticelli's first period were painted for piero il gotoso referring to those which still remain at florence we have four principal pictures belonging to this period the judith the madonna of the magnificat the adoration of the magi and the fortitude all of them now in the uffizi gallery regarding the charming little picture of judith it is remarked by ruskin that among all the many pictures on this favorite subject this one by botticelli is the only one that is true to judith and that this will be seen if the book of judith is studied his reasons for this opinion and his remarks on this picture generally are well worth studying in the madonna of the magnificat we have a picture painted for piero il gotoso about the year fourteen sixty five the influence of lucrezia tornaboni the deeply religious poetess is specially apparent in this case her spirit breathes throughout the picture which is like a representation in painting of her poems it is sometimes called the humilitas 
in allusion both to the expression on the madonna's face as she writes her song of praise and to the fact that the finger of the child rests on that word in her song the left hands of both child and mother rest together on a bitten pomegranate the emblem of the fall it has been said of this picture that it expresses a depth of divine tenderness and a deep spiritual feeling such as no other painter not even raphael has reached it differs in one notable respect from the many other pictures on the subject of the madonna and child which botticelli painted at his third period namely in its keynote for while the keynote of this picture is humility that of all those of his third period is foreboding sorrow this picture was painted for piero and his wife lucrezia at the time when their two sons lorenzo and giuliano were boys of about sixteen and twelve respectively i e the year fourteen sixty five or fourteen sixty six they are the two boys introduced into the picture as angels who are kneeling before the madonna and child and holding the inkstand and the book in which the blessed virgin is writing her song while a third angel bends over them protectingly resting one hand on the shoulder of each giuliano is the one facing the spectator with the lock of hair on his forehead lorenzo's naturally darker complexion has been intensified in order to throw all the light on giuliano the favorite younger son of the mother for whom the picture was painted end of section thirteen section fourteen of the medici volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the medici volume one by g f young chapter six piero il gotoso part three the third picture the adoration of the magi has been given a name which is somewhat misleading as it is of course a family group picture the religious subject being merely chosen in accordance with the invariable custom of the time as a means by which to portray the members of the family concerned it was painted for piero il gotoso about the beginning of the year fourteen sixty seven as a votive offering to be placed in the church of santa maria novella in thanksgiving for the deliverance of himself and his family from the great danger which had threatened himself with death and his family with ruin by the conspiracy headed by luca pitti though painted with the above intention it appears doubtful whether this was ever carried out as after being finished the picture would seem to have been retained by the medici family and only to have found its way to the santa maria novella long afterwards see appendix six in it we are shown the three generations of the elder branch of the medici family up to that time surrounded by their principal adherents including also some of the eminent literary men whom they had gathered round them such as marsilio ficino cristoforo landino the brothers pulci and others cosimo piero and giuliano represent the customary three kings one old one middle-aged and one young piero having his two sons one on either side of him the following members of the family are shown on the left side cosimo pater patrie then dead embracing the feet of the child christ lorenzo elder son of piero at the age of seventeen standing holding a sword in the centre piero il gotoso kneeling with his back to the spectator on the right side giovanni then dead brother of piero il gotoso standing in dress of black and red and with very black hair giuliano younger son of piero kneeling in a robe of white and gold this picture is highly interesting not merely as usually stated because it shows us the general appearance of the literary coterie whom the medici had gathered round them but because it gives the first example of that power which botticelli possessed of making a picture relate an important incident in contemporary history for the picture has a special meaning which has passed hitherto unobserved in it botticelli refers to the plot against piero's life which had just been defeated 
and to the manner in which that defeat had been brought about allusion has already been made to botticelli's fondness for allegorical treatment and his habit of giving the clue to the meaning of his picture by some single detail which might at first escape notice and he has done so in this case though the fact has passed undetected with the result that the meaning of the picture has entirely failed to be understood it is the sword held in lorenzo's hands which gives the clue to the meaning of the entire picture whether because the picture was painted in haste to meet a desire on piero's part to present his offering while the event on account of which he gave it was still fresh in the minds of all or simply in order that botticelli might make his meaning more marked the latter has palpably made scarcely any attempt to give portraits in the case of either cosimo piero giuliano or giovanni and has concentrated all his attention on the figure of lorenzo who in consequence of his conduct on this occasion had become the hero of the hour in the family this figure he has evidently drawn with great care the whole attitude and expression being carefully studied in order by it to indicate the signification of the whole picture botticelli desires to allude to how in this affair lorenzo by his courage and sagacity had been the saviour of his father's life and indirectly of the whole family from ruin it will be noticed that lorenzo is the only person among all those in the picture who wears a sword he is given a remarkably large one held in both hands and placed in front of him in a particularly prominent manner the sword almost obtruding itself on our notice as we look at the picture and the point is still further brought out by the figure standing next to him and pointing at piero while he looks at lorenzo who stands paying no attention to the gay young companion surrounding him but with his gaze steadily fixed upon his father thus does botticelli make his pictures speak and relate the danger which had threatened piero's life and the part which lorenzo has borne in warding it off the fourth picture the fortitude is also very interesting both for its connection with the medici and the manner in which that connection becomes apparent for it refers to the same event as that commemorated in the previous picture but in this case our attention is drawn not to lorenzo's conduct on that occasion but to that of piero il cotoso himself the first thing noticeable in the picture is that botticelli called upon to paint a figure representing fortitude produces one quite unlike the usual conception of that subject ruskin in his comments on the picture remarks on this and how very different botticelli's treatment of the subject is from that of all other painters but there is a reason for this and although ruskin was evidently unaware of such a reason while he does not show that he even knew the date of the picture or for whom it was painted yet the key to the meaning of all that he notices in the picture is to be found in the circumstances of the life of piero il gotoso it is in fact an allegorical record in painting of the fortitude energy and resource which piero had displayed in the event which was the chief one during his five years rule the rebellion of fourteen sixty six this will become apparent if with that knowledge of piero's history which ruskin did not possess we look at his remarks on this picture speaking of this figure of fortitude ruskin says as follows what is chiefly notable in her is that you would not if you had to guess who she was take her for fortitude at all everybody else's fortitudes announce themselves clearly and proudly they have tower-like shields and lion-like helmets and stand firm astride on their legs and are confidently ready for all comers yes that is your common fortitude very grand though common but not the highest by any means but botticelli's fortitude is no match it may be for any that are coming worn somewhat and not a little weary instead of standing ready for all comers she is sitting apparently in reverie her fingers playing restlessly and idly nay i think even nervously about the hilt of her sword for her battle is not to begin to-day nor did it begin yesterday many a morn and eve have passed since it began and now 
is this to be the ending day of it and if this by what manner of end that is what sandro's fortitude is thinking and the playing fingers about the sword-hilt would fain let it fall if it might be and yet how swiftly and gladly will they close on it when the far-off trumpet sounds which she will hear through all her reverie these remarks exactly reflect the circumstances attitude and conduct of piero il gotoso in the trial which came upon him thought to be no match for those who were preparing to attack him half absorbed in the reverie of a strong disinclination to turn from the pursuits of literature to meet quarrelling and strife feeling the battle which did not begin to-day in the long period of two years during which he had known this plot to be hatching the sitting posture instead of the usual standing one which indicated the crippled state of health that so severely handicapped him the worn and not a little weary expression caused by both the long ill health he had endured and by disgust at the political intrigues around him including the ingratitude and deception of neroni and others the hatred of strife shown in the fingers that would fain let the weapons in the hands fall and lastly the resolute character underlying all the weariness which was demonstrated by the prompt and effective action taken when the time came all these are points which show the true meaning of the picture looking therefore at the date when this picture was painted at the conduct of piero il gotoso in the chief event of his five years rule conduct which had won him much honour among his fellow countrymen and at the character of the picture so well brought out in ruskin's remarks upon it there can be in my opinion no doubt that it is to piero's conduct in that event that this picture of botticelli's relates and it shows what a master in art criticism ruskin was that although with his customary want of interest in history he was as is evident unaware of the circumstances alluded to by the picture he should yet have been able so accurately to gauge its spirit piero il gotoso when he was dying in december fourteen sixty nine obtained for botticelli the commission to paint this picture the council of the mercantanzia had decided to place in their hall six panels representing the virtues of prudence temperance fortitude charity justice and faith and had given the commission to piero polaiolo but piero il gotoso working through tommaso sorerini an influential member of the mercantanzia got the latter to give the commission for one of the figures that of fortitude to botticelli the latter painted the picture during the early months of the year fourteen seventy just when he was in deep grief for the death of the kind and generous patron who had done everything for him and one of whose last acts had been to get him this commission and with his marvellous talent for allegorical design he contrives to give to his picture of fortitude for the council hall of the mercantanzia those characteristics which would make it also a remarkable memorial of the character of piero il gotoso to the above four pictures must also be added botticelli's portrait of lucrezia tournabuoni now in the kaiser friedrich museum at berlin probably the most beautiful portrait up to that time painted and his picture of st sebastian also now at berlin the above were botticelli's chief pictures during the period that he worked for piero il gotoso and lucrezia tornaboni both of whom he held in highest honour his second period is best considered in connection with lorenzo the magnificent chapters eight and nine shortly before his death various of his most ardent adherents among the citizens gave piero il gotoso considerable trouble they seem to have been carried away by elation at his uniform success and at the triumph of their party over all who had wished ill to him and his and machiavelli says gave themselves up to tyrannizing over their fellow-citizens and to committing all sorts of excesses piero though he was on his deathbed and unable to move hands or feet took vigorous action to quell this spirit among his followers he summoned the most prominent of the offenders to his bedside and gave them a most severe rebuke 
promising them that if they did not abandon their course of conduct he would make them repent it and in order to check the excesses of his own party would take the extreme step of recalling some of their exiled opponents nor was this an empty threat for when he found that thinking him too ill to interfere they continued in the same course he had a secret meeting at his villa of cafagiolo with agnolo acciaioli the principal of the exiles with a view to carrying out what he had said and had he lived there is no doubt that he would have done it but his course was run he died in december fourteen sixty nine universally regretted by all the best of his countrymen who rejoiced in his temperate and sympathetic method of ruling the life which had been a threatened one ever since he was a boy and which had seldom known a day's real health nevertheless reached the age of fifty-three regarding his character there is no dispute even machiavelli who was not the sort of man to appreciate its nobler side describes him thus quote, he was a good man he hated violence and display his goodness and virtues were not duly appreciated by his country principally because the few years that he survived his father cosimo were largely occupied by civil discord and constant ill-health he promptly and firmly put down an attempted rebellion against him without any violence which he detested and managed to turn his enemies into friends he took little interest in home politics and faction but paid unfailing attention to foreign politics and was better appreciated at foreign courts than in his own city End quote. when we consider his energy notwithstanding that he was so crippled with gout as to be often unable to move hands or feet hatred of dissensions and violence contempt for the intrigues which made up so large a part of the political life of florence in his time the combination of vigour sense and tact with which he suppressed a formidable rebellion and dealt with unruly adherents and lastly the clemency he showed to those who had endeavoured to take his life we have apparently just reason to say that piero il gotoso had a fine character and one which adds not a little to his family's reputation while it is fully evident from subsequent events that strong as was the position to which cosimo had raised the family that strength was increased and by the most worthy methods by piero il gotoso even though he had so few years in which to do it piero was buried in the old sacristy in san lorenzo in the same tomb as his brother giovanni and over it his sons placed the graceful monument by verrocchio already mentioned it has an inscription round the base saying that his sons lorenzo and giuliano have erected this tomb to their father and uncle instead of a painted portrait such having as yet barely come into vogue piero like his brother giovanni had a portrait bust of himself executed by mino da fiesole which is now in the museum of the bargello it shows a fine and strong face and as mino de fiesole excelled in these portrait busts and knew piero well it is sure to be a good likeness these two busts of piero and giovanni are the first portraits among those in this book which were done from life the change in the family arms brought about by piero has already been noted the number of the balls in the medici arms varied during their history in very early times the number was eleven then nine then eight then seven and at last six thus the number of balls is a rough indication as to date while giovanni da bici was head of the family we generally find eight when cosimo became head of the family the number changes to seven and that is the number in the arms on the palace which he built the colouring of one of the red balls blue and on it the fleur-de-lis or if in stone simply on one of the balls the fleur-de-lis is of course not found until the time of piero so that six red balls and one blue indicate piero's time lastly in lorenzo's time we find the number of balls reduced to six five red and one blue and at this it finally remained the rule is absolute so far as our never finding seven balls before the time of cosimo or seven balls one of them bearing the fleur-de-lis before the time of piero or six balls before the time of lorenzo 
but there are a few occasions where one might find eight balls even in the time of cosimo and seven balls without the fleur-de-lis even in the time of piero the medici were great people for heraldic devices with hidden meanings each of them on becoming head of the family adopted a private crest of his own which he used in addition to the family one thus cosimo's crest was three peacock's feathers intended to signify the three cardinal virtues he most admired prudence temperance and fortitude they are to be seen among other instances on the trappings of his charger in gozzoli's fresco in the medici chapel piero chose a falcon holding a diamond ring but as his time was so short it is less often met with than the others it is to be seen on the lavabo in the inner part of the old sacristy in san lorenzo lorenzo assumed as his crest three sometimes four diamond rings interlaced the diamond as not yielding to fire or blows signifying indomitable strength and the ring eternity and certainly nothing was more appropriate to lorenzo's character than a device symbolizing enduring indomitable strength his device is to be seen on the dress of the figure representing himself in botticelli's palace and the centaur all three cosimo piero and lorenzo used the motto semper it is to be seen combined with cosimo's peacock feathers on the trappings of his charger in gozzoli's fresco combined with piero's falcon and diamond ring on the lava bow in the old sacristy and round the ornamental border of the chapel in the medici palace these private crests are important as often assisting to determine the date of various works especially in conjunction with the diverse number of balls in the family arms already noted lucrezia tornaboni the wives of giovanni di bici and cosimo pater patriae had not been of any particular note intellectually in the case of lucrezia tornaboni the wife of piero il gotoso it was otherwise she was one of the most accomplished women of that age she belonged to a family who were formerly nobles of the name of tornaquinci but had changed their name and arms about two hundred years before in order to become ordinary citizens and eligible for the signoria and who were notable patrons of art she was learned a poetess and a deeply religious woman she distinguished herself not only as a noted patroness of learning but also by her own writings and crescembeni is of opinion that she excelled in greater part of not to say all the poets of her time her chief writings were hymns and translations of holy scripture in verse both politian and pulci speak highly of her intellectual gifts and roscoe remarks that her poems are the more worthy of praise as being produced at a time when poetry was at its lowest ebb in italy dr pastor in his histoire des papes couples her with cecilia gonzaga isotta nogarola cassandra fedele and antonio pulci in detailing the most notable ladies of the time who came forth from the seclusion in which women had hitherto shut themselves up and won for themselves renown in literature and science nor was she less notable in the sphere of religion and francesco palermo says that the treatise of san antonino entitled opera a ben vivere methods of a good life was addressed to lucrezia tornaboni if so it is a high tribute to her devout and sensible character all that we hear regarding lucrezia tornaboni shows her to have been a woman of exceptionally high character as well as thus talented in her eldest son lorenzo the remarkable abilities of the medici family reach their culminating point and this was no doubt due to the fact that not only his father but also his mother was so highly gifted lucrezia survived her husband thirteen years and lived to see the terrible death of her beloved younger son in fourteen seventy eight the war of fourteen seventy eight fourteen eighty and the triumph of her elder son in fourteen eighty dying herself in fourteen eighty two and there is no doubt that during the earlier part of his rule lorenzo owed much to her valuable advice niccolo valori says lorenzo was most deferential to her and after his father's death loved and honoured her 
showing in all his actions both the affection felt for a mother and the respect given to a father it was hard to discern whether he most loved or honoured her lucrezia's portrait in profile painted by botticelli shows a beautiful and intellectual face she and piero had five children two sons lorenzo and giuliano and three daughters maria lucrezia or nanina and bianca their three daughters all made notable marriages maria married leopetto rossi bianca married guglielmo de pazzi and lucrezia married bernardo rucellai who was one of the most distinguished scholars of the time by the end of piero il gotoso's life the light which florence had ignited and had held aloft in art and learning for a hundred and fifty years had begun to show signs of becoming diffused in rome a beginning had been made by the efforts of pope nicholas v in venice the two brothers gentile and giovanni bellini and their brother-in-law mantegna were originating a school of painting destined to become second only to that of florence urbino under its enlightened duke federigo montefeltro was following in the steps of florence and both mantua under the gonzaga family and ferrara under the este family were beginning to give to art and learning a similar encouragement End of section 14. Section 15 of The Medici, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2020. The Medici, Volume 1 by g f young chapter seven the frescoes in the chapel of the medici palace just as the medici palace is inseparably connected with cosimo so is that which in these days chiefly attracts attention to it connected with piero of all the mass of art treasures which that palace contained in the time of cosimo piero and lorenzo one alone now remains there. The fresco is painted for Piero il Gottoso on the walls of the little chapel on the first floor by Benozzo Cozzoli. They merit special consideration on the three grounds of their historical interest, their being this painter's masterpiece, and their combining examples of his powers in two different aspects, those on the walls of the chancel being occupied with a religious subject, and those round the body of the chapel with an historical one although a window now exists all authorities state that originally this chapel had no window and that all these beautiful frescoes were painted by lamplight if so it increases our admiration of the master's talent they are still in perfect preservation though nearly four hundred and fifty years have passed since they were executed over the altar where the window now is there was originally a picture of the nativity by filippo lippi all round the chapel at the lower part of the walls runs an ornamental border consisting of piero's device of a single diamond ring and the motto semper the chancel pictures these give us an example of benozzo gozzoli's powers as a devotional painter the pupil of fra angelico and although this was not the line in which Gozzoli excelled, these pictures show that he can, on occasion, breathe into his work not a little of the spirit of his master. On the two side walls of the chancel, covering the whole height of the wall, Gozzoli gives us two pictures representing the world on that night of the Nativity of Christ, referred to in the picture which was over the altar. He lays his scene amidst Italian garden and woodland scenery, with groups of angels passing about everywhere, singing their song of glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace. There are on each wall three groups, one kneeling, another standing, and a third flying. All are turned toward the altar, or rather towards the picture of the nativity over it. The kneeling groups those nearest to that on which the attention of all is concentrated, 
are unlike the rest not singing they are intently gazing at the great mystery before them of the incarnation in a human body of him whom they have ever known as the second person of the holy trinity that mystery regarding which we are told that the angels desire to look into it and bowed in awe are lost in silent wonder and devotion at such transcendent love on the part of god for the human race the thoughts in their minds are shown in the glories round their heads in which some have the words gloria in excelsis deo others adoremus others et in terra pax the standing groups a little further back are occupied in recounting to each other the wonder of this greatest event in the world's history and singing loudly are calling on all to come and see it the flying groups are hastening up from the distance to see this wonder of god becoming man and gazing down at it in adoration the spirit of the entire picture may be summed up in the words god so loved the world while it is made all the more impressive by not containing any representation of that at which all are so intently gazing seeing as we do only its profound impression upon them our attention is drawn to concentrate itself on the greatness of the deed which can thus impress even the angels probably in the very devotional spirit of this picture is to be seen the influence of lucrezia tornabuoni who no doubt had much to say in regard to its design behind the principal groups angels pick roses in the gardens a little cherub rests placidly in the top of a tree bright-coloured birds fly or stand without fear among the angels and all is happiness and peace the beautiful peacock wings of the angels the brilliant colouring of the birds the exquisitely painted roses and other details make the picture as deserving of admiration for its execution as it is for its general design in accordance with the custom of the old masters and to exemplify that in the things of the spiritual world time and place are non-existent the background shows us italian scenery with castles and villages of the middle ages the general idea of the picture is carried out even in the landscape its stiffness and formality being due to this cause intending that his picture shall breathe throughout it the thought embodied in the singing angel's words of peace brought to a world tortured by sin and sin's results the master gives to his landscape such characteristics as shall accord with this idea ruskin in speaking of this point says in these sort of pictures by masters such as raphael perugino or benozzo gozzoli whereas all mountain forms are in nature produced by convulsion or modelled by decay and all forest grouping is wrought out with varieties of growth all such appearances are purposely banished the trees go straight equally branched on each side and of such slight and feathery frame as shows them never to have encountered blight or frost or tempest the mountains stand up in fantastic pinnacles with no fallen fragments the seas are always waveless the sky is always calm crossed only by far horizontal lightly wreathed white clouds he cites this picture as an example and points out how roses and pomegranates their leaves drawn to the last rib and vein twine themselves in fair and perfect order about delicate trellises broad stone pines and tall cypresses overshadow them bright birds hover here and there in the serene sky and groups of angels glide and float through the glades of an unentangled forest in this manner has benozzo gozzoli in these chancel pictures written his burning message and in a language which those of every nationality can read the pictures in the body of the chapel while the chancel pictures are occupied with the first episode connected with the nativity of christ those in the body of the chapel are concerned with the second episode connected therewith 
the journey of the three kings or magi il viaggio dei re magi to bethlehem and here we have an example of benozzo gozzoli's powers in his own special line that of an historical painter the religious subject being made merely a vehicle for references to the history of the medici in doing this gozzoli would of course desire to introduce as many allusions as possible complementary to the family but the manner in which he has done this is remarkable the picture is from end to end an elaborate memorial pointing to all that the medici had up to that time done for florence and for which they had gained honour among their countrymen but while the whole idea is wonderfully conceived and worked out the empty flattery by which many painters of that age would have spoiled the effect is avoided thus we have in this picture far more than merely a gorgeous procession of the magi into which have been introduced portraits of several of the medici which is the description it has generally received to carry out the above general idea gozzoli sets to work to make his picture speak of all that had taken place in florence in connection with this family during the preceding thirty years of how the great gathering of fourteen thirty nine had been invited to florence at the instigation of the medici and hospitably entertained there by them of how this assemblage had included an emperor the successor of constantine the great and a patriarch of constantinople the equal theoretically of the pope in rome of how it had brought to florence the most learned men of the time and furthered that revival of the ancient learning which the medici had ever since the foundation stone of this palace was laid been fostering of how as a consequence of the hospitality of fourteen thirty nine learning and culture when driven from constantinople had taken refuge in florence and lastly of how the judicious political guidance of the medici had increased florence's power and prosperity and advanced her over the heads of other states which had previously been her rivals of all this the picture speaks and the admirable manner in which gozzoli has worked out this general scheme demonstrates his great talents as an historical painter gozzoli selects for the first of his three kings or wise men the patriarch of constantinople joseph this is the patriarch who had come to florence for the council of fourteen thirty nine and who died there a month before it ended he is the old man on the mule of which half the body has been cut off in order to make a new entrance many years ago into the chapel as though to show how little splendid frescoes like this were valued at the time this act of vandalism was committed although the pope of rome eugenius the fourth had also been one of the important personages at the council gozzoli in preference to him chooses the patriarch of constantinople both as being an eastern potentate and also in allusion to those many dealings which the medici had had with constantinople in their unearthing of the ancient classical literature for the second king gozzoli chooses john paleologus john the seventh the emperor of the east this john the seventh is the emperor who had come to the council of fourteen thirty nine the last emperor but one before by the fall of constantinople the eastern half of the roman empire came to an end as the western half had done a thousand years earlier as the successor of constantine the great even though his empire had then shrunk to little more than its capital city he was theoretically the greatest of all earthly sovereigns and though by the time that this picture was painted his empire had for sixteen years ceased to exist gozzoli nevertheless puts him in as the second king for the same reason as before namely because he wishes to point to the council of fourteen thirty nine to florence having been the city to which it was transferred and to the part which the medici had had in that transfer and in giving its members such royal hospitality there for the third king gozzoli takes the young heir of the family lorenzo de medici 
by putting him in as one of the three kings, Gozzoli makes the Medici not merely attendants upon the wise men, but wise men themselves, and, by the exalted company in which he is placed, contrives a powerful compliment to the family. Behind the three kings comes their retinue, and here we find the Medici leading a gathering of all the most learned men of the time. In the front line we have the two brothers, Cosimo Pata Patrie, in an embroidered coat, and on his charger's trappings the Medici arms, with seven balls, and his own private crest of the three peacock's feathers, and on his right his brother Lorenzo, typically mounted on a quiet and humble mule. In the left corner Piero il Gotoso, as usual with bare head, and next to him, on the white horse, the young, fifteen-year-old Giuliano, preceded by a negro with a bow, in allusion to Giuliano's love of sport. Giuliano's horse, alone, has a jewel on the frontlet of its bridle. In each case Gozzoli, ignoring likenesses, has devoted much care to the dress and general appearance. And then, behind these members of three generations of the Medici family, comes a long procession of scholars and literati, extending far into the distance, and including both those Florentines whom the Medici had taught to care for and seek after learning, such as Marsilio Ficino, the brothers Pulci, and others, and also those celebrated Greek scholars from Constantinople, whom the Medici had induced to settle in Florence, and to whom they had given appointments as professors of classical learning, such as Argyropoulos, Chalcondylas, and others, or who had come to the Council of 1439, such as Bessarion, Plethon, and others, and who are distinguished from the Florentines by their Greek headdresses. The Florentines are all close-shaven, whereas the Greeks, in the Eastern fashion, wear beards. The man on foot, with a black cap, immediately behind Cosimo, is Salviati, a strong adherent of the Medici and tutor to Giuliano. Amidst the crowd of literati, Gozzoli has inserted himself, between two of the learned Greeks, and, to prevent his name being lost, and also perhaps because he might scarcely be expected in such company, has carefully written his name round his cap. Throughout the whole picture it is learning, and not wealth or power which is exalted. The Pope of Rome was infinitely more wealthy and powerful than the Patriarch of Constantinople, and many of the sovereigns of the time than the Emperor of the East, and again those who accompany the Medici in the retinue of the three kings are not the wealthiest Florentines, but the most learned. In the fore part of the cavalcade, in front of the Patriarch, is introduced a gorgeously apparelled youth on a handsomely caparisoned horse, on the back of which he carries a hunting leopard. This is one of those scherzi, or jokes, such as the old masters loved, while it is made at the same time to serve the general object of the picture. The person represented is Gastruccio Gastracani, Duca di Lucca, a celebrated and terrible commander, and a formidable enemy of Florence, who, in the early part of the fourteenth century, fought furiously against her, conquering Pisa and Pistoia, devastated Florence's territory, and carried war up to her very walls, and, to the indignation of the Florentines, was nominated by the Emperor Louis of Bavaria to be imperial governor of Tuscany. Gozzoli's scherzo consists in representing this terrible enemy as a mere youthful hunter, excelling only in field sports, and contrasted in every way with the wise and learned Florentines. He is trying to force his prancing horse through a crowd of them, but they pay little attention to him, excepting one who holds up his hand, forbidding him to proceed. In all of which we have allusion to the fact that whereas Luca had previously been Florence's formidable rival, and whereas in two wars before the Medici arose, 
Florence, guided by the Albizzi, had been worsted by Luca, she had now been carried by the Medici to a position of power and importance far beyond that which Luca possessed, and had entirely put a stop to Luca's triumphal career. Thus, in this picture, we have brought before our minds, in one general view, all that the Medici, up to the point in their career which they had reached in 1469, had achieved in reviving learning, in advancing the glory of Florence as the most cultured city in Italy, and in advancing her in political power. And what Gozzoli had to say as regards these achievements of the first three generations of the family was rendered in such fashion that it could be read by multitudes who could understand no word of Italian, while his record has proved a lasting one. The picture possesses much historical interest apart from its allusions to the deeds of the Medici. The portraits and dresses of the emperor and the patriarch, the dresses and appointments of the cavalcade, and similar details, are not imaginary. Thirty years before, when he was about twenty, Gozzoli had himself seen the emperor and the patriarch in the processions and functions which took place during the summer of 1439. He had also lately seen the no less splendid array of the tournament of February 1469, and he takes his materials from both these, thus reproducing before our eyes persons, dresses, and customs of which we should otherwise have but little idea. The patriarch of Constantinople is shown in the dress he wore in the processions of 1439. On his head he has the ancient headdress which he was almost the last to wear, and the chief point noticeable about this headdress is that, while his colleague, the Pope of Rome, had gradually altered it until it had grown into the triple crown, that of Constantinople had been kept as it was at the first. In the portrait of the Emperor John the Seventh, John Paleologus, we are shown him as he appeared during the processions in 1439. It is highly interesting from the fact that it is probably the sole portrait now existing in the world of any one of all that long line of emperors, from Constantine the Great downwards, who sat on the throne of Constantinople for 1130 years. His dress and the trappings of his charger are very magnificent. On his head he wears, entwined with his turban, the peculiar crown of the eastern emperors of Rome, so different in shape from that which had by that time been adopted by all sovereigns in Western Europe. Unlike the Florentines, he, according to the Eastern fashion, wears a beard. His face is dignified, yet has a melancholy expression, as well it may, as he sees that once glorious empire in its last throes, and knows there is no hope of any assistance coming from the West to save it. Lorenzo de' Medici's dress is that which he had lately worn at the tournament of February 1469. We note the rubies and diamonds in his cap, the velvet embroidered surcoat, just showing on his arm, and the cape, like a sleeved surplice, of white silk edged with red, with his sword belt worn over it. He rides the great white charger which had been presented to him by the King of Naples for the tournament, and the trappings of this charger have all over them the seven Medici balls. The mounted pages, heralds, men-at-arms on foot, etc., are also all in the dresses which they wore at Lorenzo's tournament. The journey of the Magi, always a favorite subject with the old masters on account of its great possibilities for picturesque treatment, has nowhere else been treated on so magnificent a scale. The splendid procession is given every accessory that can add to its picturesque splendor, beautiful youths, gorgeous dresses, fine horses, hunting leopards, greyhounds, falcons, etc., and winds its way up and down over the rocky paths and wooded slopes of the Apennines, amidst castles, villages, and cypress groves, 
while all is painted in colours that are almost as fresh as when laid on. The date of these frescoes is somewhat of a problem. Ruskin states that they were painted between 1457 and 1459. All other authorities say between 1459 and 1463, while both Ruskin and all other authorities say, rightly enough, that they were painted for Piero il Gotoso. The latter, however, did not become head of the family until 1464, while there are also further grounds than this for considering that none of these dates can be correct. In 1457, Lorenzo was a child of only eight years old, and Giuliano only four years old, which makes Ruskin's date at any rate impossible. And even at the latest of the above dates, 1463, Lorenzo was no more than fourteen, and Giuliano only ten, scarcely an age at which fondness for field sports has been developed. Again, all authorities consider that the dresses and appointments of the cavalcade in the procession of the Magi reproduce the festive pomp and splendor of the pageants of the Medici. Now, the earliest of these pageants was held in February 1469, when Lorenzo was nineteen and Giuliano fifteen, and none can look at the picture with the account of that pageant before him and have any doubt that the tournament of February 1469 formed the model for the dresses and appointments of Lorenzo, the pages, men-at-arms, grooms and serving-men in the picture while ages of nineteen and fifteen accord with the representation therein of Lorenzo and Giuliano, which ages of fourteen and ten do not. So that the internal evidence of the picture bars all dates earlier than February 1469. On the other hand, two letters, without date, regarding the work, were written to Piero il Gotoso by Gozzoli while employed on it, and the tone and expressions used show that Piero was then head of the family. This would bar all dates earlier than August 1464, or later than December 1469. While yet a further difficulty, and that which has no doubt been the chief reason for the dates hitherto assigned to these frescoes, is introduced by the fact that from 1463 to 1467, Cozzoli was painting his great series of frescoes at San Gimignano, writing dated letters from thence at that period, and that in 1468 he signed an agreement for the execution of his great work in the Pisa Campo Santo, which he is usually supposed to have begun in 1469, and which was his last work. In the midst of such conflicting evidence, part of which, that given by the picture itself, is too strong to be ignored, the only solution appears to be that these frescoes were painted neither between 1457 and 1459, nor between 1459 and 1463, but between January 1468 and December 1469. The chancel pictures, and possibly some portion of the leading part of the procession, including perhaps the figures of the patriarch and the emperor being painted between january fourteen sixty eight and january fourteen sixty nine and the remainder of the frescoes in the body of the chapel between february fourteen sixty nine and december fourteen sixty nine the work at pisa not being begun until quite the end of that year the whole chapel was certainly painted while piero il gotoso was head of the family 1464 to 1469. The chancel pictures could only have been begun upon Gozzoli's return from San Gimignano, that is, in 1468, while the details connected with the tournament and the ages of Lorenzo and Giuliano make February to December 1469 the only possible period when the chief part of the frescoes in the body of the chapel could have been executed. Benozzo Gozzoli was noted for his extreme rapidity of work, and though these frescoes are filled with a multiplicity of details, it was possible for such an artist as he was to execute them in two years. End of section 15
Section 16 of the Medici, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dick Bourgeois Doyle. The Medici, Volume 1, by G. F. Young. Lorenzo the Magnificent, born 1449, ruled 1469 to 1492, died 1492. 1. The first nine years of his rule, 1469 to 1478. Lorenzo, the elder son of Piero il Gotozzo, was only 20 years old when, by his father's death, he became the head of the family and succeeded to the rule of Florence. Six months earlier, he had been married, as already noted, to Clarice Orsini. His three sisters, Maria, Lucrezia, or Nanina, and Bianca, married respectively to Leopetto Rossi, Bernardo Ruccelli, and Guglielmo de Pazzi, were all older than himself, while his brother, Guglielmo, was four years his junior. His mother, Lucrezia, lived during the first 13 years of his rule over Florence. Having been for several years accustomed to take a large part in public affairs, he was better prepared than most young men of his age would have been for the position to which he was called so much earlier than either his father or his grandfather had been, each of whom who had been over 40 when he became head of the family. In Lorenzo the Magnificent, the abilities of this family reached their climax. Probably no other man has ever had great talents in so many directions, in statesmanlike insight and judgment, in political wisdom and promptness of decision, in power of influencing men, in profound knowledge of the ancient classical authors, as a poet and writer who bore a principal part in the development of the Italian language, in artistic taste and critical knowledge of the various branches of art, in knowledge of agriculture, the life and needs of the people, and country pursuits. In all these different directions was Lorenzo eminent. The title of Magnificent, which has by common consent been accorded to him, was not due to any ostentation in his private life, for there he was notably unostentatious. He was so called because of his extraordinary abilities, his great liberality, his lavish expenditure of his wealth for the public benefit, and the general magnificence of his life in which Florence participated, so that his name is intended to bring to our minds not personal ostentation, but the splendor with which he invested Florence. Yet while Lorenzo raised Florence to be the most important state in Italy, set her on a pinnacle as the acknowledged intellectual and artistic capital of Europe, and increased the prosperity of her citizens to the highest point, he has, from later ages, received unmeasured condemnation for a far-reaching change which he brought about in her government, and for the creation in this jealously guarded republic of what was practically an autocracy. It is true that his grandfather, Cosimo, had yielded an influence in the state, such as enabled him to sway public affairs according to his will. But the position created by Lorenzo went beyond this, and was different in kind. In his case, it was not an influence, but a rule. Lorenzo, as a matter of fact, had a greater power of statesmanlike vision than even his grandfather Cosimo. He saw that the Florentines were too liable to give away to private feuds, to be really fitted for republican institutions, while under an autocratic rule there was practically no limit to the political importance and domestic prosperity which Florence might be conducted. That he should cherish the desire that his own family should be the one to exercise that rule was not only natural but justified. The Medici alone among the families of Florence had shown themselves to possess the qualities which could successfully govern the Florentines. Their power had been gained by those means which alone give a just title to rule. While added to all other qualifications, they possessed as a family a positive genius for pouring oil on troubled waters and getting men to work harmoniously together, who under any other rule were ever at enmity. This valuable characteristic, which has passed unnoticed, Cosimo, Piero, and Lorenzo himself all possessed in a marked degree. While it is one which comes out again and again in this family long after their time, Lorenzo, in carrying out this change, took a unique course. Convinced that an autocratic style of government was the only one of which the conditions of the time admitted, he yet did not follow the example of other rulers around him who in that age were erecting thrones, 
their methods being force, crime, and treachery. Instead, he solved the apparently impossible problem of combining two things diametrically opposed, an autocracy and a democracy, and contrived to preserve the form of government loved by his countrymen and yet to wield personally an autocratic power. Unsupported by any military force, he yet exercised absolute authority, but only because his countrymen well knew that no one else could produce such happy results. The Florentines saw their city through his abilities, raised to the leading place among Italian states, made the intellectual and artistic capital of Europe, and daily advancing in a commercial prosperity in which they each individually shared. And they had no desire to kill the goose which laid such golden eggs. They felt that however autocratic was Lorenzo's rule, they had power to end it whenever determined to do so. And the correctness of the view was fully proved by subsequent events. While, however, Lorenzo wielded an autocratic power, it is necessary to bear in mind, especially in financial matters, that the governing body of the state remained, as heretofore, the Signoria. The word rule or reign as applied to the Medici, although it is impossible to use any other, is calculated to lead to the supposition that they received the money raised by taxation, and hence to the idea when we hear of large expenditure by them for the public benefit or amusement or for the advancement of learning, that the money so spent was public money and that possibly the people were heavily taxed to provide it, all of which would be the very opposite of the truth. The money raised by taxation was received by the Signoria and spent by that body in other directions. And that which the Medici spent on works for public benefit or on pageants and festivities for the amusement of the people was given from their own private fortune derived from their great banking business. The historian of this time, Machiavelli, speaks of Lorenzo thus. He governed the Republic with great judgment and was recognized as an equal by various crowned heads of other countries. Though notice ably without military ability, he yet conducted several wars to a successful conclusion by his diplomacy. He was the greatest patron of literature and art that any prince has ever been, and he won the people by his liberality and other popular qualities. By his political talents, he made Florence the leading state in Italy, and by his other qualities, he made her the intellectual, artistic, and fashionable center of Italy. And in connection with these achievements, Lorenzo shows one notable characteristic. Though he had in him the capacity to do all this, and was in ability a head and shoulders above all men around him, yet never throughout his life did he show any arrogance, that quality in Uberti, the Albizzi, the Pazzi, and other chief families of Florence, which the people had always so detested. And to the day of his death, though so admired by Florence as the source of all her greatness, remained always singularly free from this failing. Autocratic sovereign of Tuscany, practically arbiter of the politics of all Italy, treated by the sovereigns of France and England as an equal, there is not a sign in him of that arrogant self-assertion which in one belonging to a bourgeois family would with so many have been an inevitable accompaniment of such greatness. Lorenzo did not maintain even the amount of state considered necessary by the president of a modern republic. No officials guarded the entrance to the Medici Palace. To every citizen of Florence, Lorenzo behaved and spoke on all occasions, public or private, as to an equal. While every historian mentions his marked courtesy of manner, even to the poorest of the people. Such was the young head of the Medici family, who at so early an age succeeded to the thorny position of ruler over turbulent Florence, without any military force to support that rule or anything else to rely upon but his own abilities. In his memoirs, Lorenzo himself describes the manner of his accession in terms that are almost comical in their diplomatic depreciation of the position to which he was called and his own ability to fill it. He says, The second day after my father's death, Although I, Lorenzo, was very young, that is to say, only in my 21st year, the principal men of the city and of the state came to our house to condole us on our loss and to encourage me to take on myself the care of the city and of the state, as my father and grandfather had done. This proposal being against the instincts of my youthful age and considering the burden and danger were great, I consented to it unwillingly. 
but I did so in order to protect our friends and property. For it fares ill in Florence with anyone who possesses wealth without any control in the government. The contrast in Lorenzo's case between the difficult conduct of public affairs and the chief outward occupations of his life, particularly during the earlier part of his rule, is very striking. It was a period when the exuberant vitality of the Renaissance was at its height. And the first nine years of his rule, when he was from 20 to 29 and his brother Giuliano from 16 to 25, was a time in Florence of constant festivities, of music, art, and poetry, of joy and laughter, and all the bright side of life. It was the fashion of the day to import into all the amusements an imitation of the classic times of ancient Greece. And the Florence of that time appears set before us as a city with youth at the prow and pleasure at the helm and full of all the life, joy, and pleasure of the old pagan ideal of Greece, set in a 15th century dress. Besides all his duties in regard to state affairs, and labors in the founding of institutions to advance learning, not to mention his own literary work, Lorenzo with his brother led these festivities, organizing pageants and other spectacles of the most costly description, permeated with classical learning and poetical allusions for the popular amusement. Nor are Lorenzo and Galliano to be considered as the sole authors of such a change from the old, plain-living and high-thinking ideal of Florence. The age was one in which this sort of thing was in the air throughout Italy, and not in Florence alone. It was the way in which that portion of human need, which in our age is provided for by theaters and music halls, was then supplied. Lorenzo has been charged with thus leading Florentines into profligacy. But had that been the case, there could scarcely have failed to have been evidence of some protest made by his high-minded mother, Lucrezia Tornabuoni, whose influence over him was, as we know, very great. The entertainments organized by these two brilliant young Medici took the form sometimes of grand possessions and tournaments, but more often of the most elaborate allegorical masks, Lorenzo and Giuliano themselves designed the various tableaux into which every kind of classical illusion was woven, while their execution was entrusted to the greatest artists of the day, no trouble or expense being spared to make these gorgeous spectacles in which the times of ancient Greece were revived before the eyes of the Florentines, as perfect and dramatic as possible. The costumes and chariots were designed by the most celebrated painters, the groups were arranged by renowned sculptors. The speeches were prepared by the foremost classical scholars, such as Marsilio, Ficino, Luigi Pulci, and Polizian. Horses dressed up in the skins of lions and tigers, beautiful women posed as the goddesses of pagan divinity, and poets wrote elaborate compositions in verse describing the meaning of the different tableaux and the processions. Nor were the young people of the time very unlike those of our day in devising pastimes of a yet lighter kind, not to mention midnight tournaments in which fireworks took the place of more deadly weapons and magnificently arrayed processions by the young men to serenade the young ladies they desired to honor, we have in a letter to Lorenzo the year before a midnight snowballing match related. The heroine of this particular adventure was Marietta Palastrozzi, the daughter of Lorenzo Palastrozzi. The young heiress, who, both her parents being dead, was thought unduly emancipated because she lived where she liked and did what she would. And those features are immortalized by Desiderio's beautiful bust of her, half princess, halfway ward child, with saucy chin and willful hair, writing in Latin to Lorenzo, then absent at Pisa, his friend Filippo Corsini, detailing the latest doings of Florentine society, says... And whilst I am writing to thee, almost the whole city is covered with snow, tiresome for many and obliging them to stay within, but for others a cause of much merriment and pleasure. Thou must know that there were together Lottieri Naroni, Priore Pandolfini, and Bartolo Meo Benci, Marietta's betrothed. And they did say, let us seize upon the occasion to make some fine diversion. And immediately, at about two o'clock of the night, they did present themselves before the house of Mariette Storosi, followed by a great multitude assembled from every part to make sport with her at throwing snow. And they gave her a portion, and then they began. Ye immortal gods, what a spectacle! 
How can I describe it unto thee, my Lorenzo, in this feeble prose? The innumerable torches, the blowing of trumpets, the piping of flutes, the excited and cheering crowd. And what a triumph when one of the besiegers did succeed in flinging snow upon the maiden's face, as white as the snow itself. But what do I say, flinging snow? It was truly a veritable shooting at a mark, and by most expert marksmen. Moreover, Marietta herself, so graceful and so skilled in this game, and beautiful as all do know, did acquit herself with very great honor. But the noble youths would not take leave of her until they had bestowed most generous gifts upon her for a remembrance of them. And thus, to the great contentment of all, this pleasant sport came to an end. Marietta did not marry the hero of this snowballing match. She married in 1471 to one of the Calcagnini family of Ferrara, and left Florence for the city, of which Leonora Aragu became two years later the Duchess. Well might Lorenzo write in his poems, Quante bella giovinezzi, che si fugge, tuttavia, che vu ol esser vieto sia, di domen noce certeza, or in English, How beautiful is youth, which yet flies quickly away. Who has a mind to be joyous, let him be so. For of tomorrow there is no certainty. But Lorenzo was not always planning pageants and festivities, or engaged in state affairs. Many other things also occupied his attention. Around his villa on Fiesole, he gave small villas to the most celebrated literary men of the time, thus gathering round him a society of literati of whom we are all told that their readings, recitations, and discussions revived a knowledge and love of classical learning for which posterity has the utmost reason to be grateful. In his villa at Fiesole, and in his beloved villa of Careggi, Lorenzo read with them the ancient authors, wrote Latin verses and poetry in the language of Tuscany, and took an active part in musical entertainments. A feast was held at his villa of Careggi every 7th November to commemorate the birth of Plato, and remarkable indeed must have been one of these gatherings of all the most brilliant scholars of the time. Lorenzo found time also for field sports, of which both he and Guiliano were passionately fond. Rising, he says, at the earliest dawn, when the east is already red and the tops of the mountains appear to be of gold. And the remarkable thing is that notwithstanding pageants, classical studies, literary work, social gatherings, and field sports, there was no neglect of public affairs. But that, on the contrary, these were most ably administered. End of section 16. Section 17 of the Medici, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dick Bourgeois Doyle. The Medici, Volume 1, by G. F. Young. In 1470, soon after his father Piero's death, there came, as on each occasion that the family gained a new head, another attempt to destroy the Medici. Dieti Salvi Neroni and the others exiled with him thought they saw an opportunity for doing this now that Piero was gone, and in view of Lorenzo's youth and inexperience. Accordingly, having collected a force, they seized Prato, the nearest of Florence's subject towns, and hope by means of concurrent intrigues in Florence and assistance from Ferrara to succeed in the above object. But Lorenzo was equal to the occasion. The intrigues in the city were foiled by his tact. Troops were sent from Florence, who retook Prato, and the rebellion was put down. In 1741, the Duke of Milan, Galeazzo Sforza, came with his wife, Bona of Savoy, and two daughters, and a great retinue to visit Lorenzo the latter having himself twice been entertained at Milan, once in 1465, when at the age of 16 he was present at the marriage of Ippolita Sforza to the Duke of Calabria, and again in 1469, when he went to represent his father as godfather to Galeazzo Sforza's infant heir. On the occasion of this visit to Florence, the Duke of Milan, desiring to overawe and impress his two young hosts, as well as the people of Florence, came with a great display of his wealth and importance. We are told that his retinue included councillors, chamberlains, courtiers, and vassals, twelve litters covered with gold brocade in which the ladies of the party traveled, 
fifty grooms in liveries of cloth of silver, numerous servants all clad, and even kitchen boys in silk and velvet, fifty war horses with saddles of gold brocade, gilded stirrups, and silk embroidered bridles, and five hundred couple of hounds with huntsmen, falcons, and falconers, together with trumpeters, players, and musicians, also a bodyguard of one hundred knights and five hundred infantry. But all this did not have the effect he intended. He stayed at the Medici Palace, which taught him a valuable lesson. For desirous as he had been to display to the Florentines how much greater was the wealth and splendor of Milan, he was forced by what he saw around him to acknowledge that art was superior to mere costliness, while we find him declaring that in all of Italy he had not seen so many pictures by the first masters, statues, gems, bronzes, beautiful vases, medallions, and rare books as he saw collected in the palace of the Medici. The result was that he departed at the end of his visit with a greatly increased respect for the Medici, and more inclined than he had previously been to maintain the alliance with Florence. From this time forward, we find Milan following in the steps of Florence, and its duke constantly writing to Lorenzo, asking him to send him the foremost artists, and endeavoring in every way to make Milan also a center of learning and art. In July of this same year, Pope Paul II died, and was succeeded by Sixtus IV. On the election of the latter, a signoria of Florence, sent an embassy to Rome, in accordance with the usual custom, to congratulate him. Lorenzo formed one of the representatives of Florence and says in his memoirs that he was received by the new pope very honorably. These satisfactory relations, however, did not last. Sixtus IV soon became a pope whose crimes caused mankind to loathe the very name of the papacy, and before many years were over, he was forming a formidable plot against Lorenzo's life and the independence of the Florentine state. In June 1472, took place an event in regard to which Lorenzo's conduct has been so grossly distorted by his detractors that the episode has to receive notice. Volterra, the most turbulent of Florence's subject towns, had raised a revolt in connection with some local disputes, and on the matter being referred to Florence, had refused to submit to the decision of the government. Riots occurred in which many lives were lost, and the Florentine envoy only just escaped from the city with his life. Subsequently, Volterra sent to Florence, offering submission. Some were for accepting it, but Lorenzo was against this, on the ground that the offense had been serious, that it was not the first occasion of the kind on the part of Volterra, and that the city ought to receive punishment. It may have been an error of judgment, but even this cannot be known. While well, even if it were so, it must be remembered that Lorenzo was at this time only 23 years old. Eventually, a force was sent against Volterra, commanded by the Duke of Urbino, neither Florence nor Venice allowing their armies to be commanded by one of their own citizens. And after a month's siege, the town surrendered and opened its gates. Then occurred the lamentable event in question. As the force entered, an affray accidentally took place between some of the troops and the populace, and this rapidly spreading grew into a sack of the town. The Duke of Urbino did everything possible to restrain his troops. He rode among them, protecting the women and children, and he hanged on the spot several of the soldiery who were foremost in inciting the rest. But on such occasions, a medieval force was practically uncontrollable, and in spite of all his efforts, the unfortunate inhabitants were for some hours subjected to outrage and plunder as though the town had been taken by assault. Lorenzo at once proceeded to Volterra and did his utmost to mitigate the sufferings which had been endured. He has been severely condemned for this sack of Volterra, but certainly not with justice. It was the result of an accident which he could not have foreseen, and he showed by his subsequent conduct how much he deplored it. In 1473, we find Louis XI writing to Lorenzo, asking him to effect a marriage between the Dauphin and Leonora of Aragon, the eldest daughter of King Ferrante of Naples. Louis XI writes to Lorenzo quite as an equal, and this, with the request itself, show what a position the latter had by this time made for himself, though as yet only 24 years of age. But the King of France was too late in this request, for the Princess Leonora had already been betrothed elsewhere. And on the 22nd of June, a very grand cavalcade, scarcely less imposing than that of the Duke of Milan two years before, arrived in Florence, escorting her to Ferrara to be married to Ercole, 
the first, Duke of Ferrara, who had succeeded his brother Borso in 1471. She was accompanied by two brothers of Duke Ercole, the lords of Capri, Mirandola and Correggio, the Dukes of Amin and Atri, and a number of other nobles. Entering by the Porta Romana, this brilliant cortege rode through the city. Leonora, dressed all in black velvet, adorned in front with numberless pearls and jewels, with a cape and a little black hat with white feathers. They crossed the Ponte Vecchio and rode up the Palazzo della Signoria, where Leonora, without dismounting, received an address from the Signoria, and then rode on to the Medici Palace, where she stayed during her visit, and at dinner was waited upon by her two young hosts, Lorenzo and Giuliano. She stayed with them several days, during which various festivities were arranged for her amusement. Among these was a dance on the 24th of June at the Palazzo Lenzi, near the Porta Prato. In those days of inferior artificial light and small rooms, such dances generally took place during daylight and in the open air, as was the case with this one, which was given on the Prato, or open stretch of grass beside the city gate, between the palace and the Arno. Probably those who took part in it were dressed much in the same way as is related of a dance which took place on a previous occasion in the Piazza della Signoria, in which the young men were all dressed in rich green cloth, with kid boots reaching up to their thighs, and the young ladies in splendid dresses, high to the throat, and adorned with jewels and pearls. Leonora also witnessed the annual horse race, the Corso, which took place on the same day the starting point being from the Prato and the course being from thence by the Via della Vigna, the Mercato Vecchio, and the Corso to the Porta Alia Croce. After these and other festivities, Leonora departed for Ferrara, much pleased with the two young Medici. In 1475, there took place a more than usually grand tournament, the most splendid of all the spectacles during these joyous nine years, it was called specially Gellianos, as that in 1469 had been called Lorenzo's. And from the elaborate preparations made for it, the interest it aroused far beyond the limits of the Florentine state, the number and importance of the visitors invited by the two young Medici to be their guests for the occasion, and the extravagantly magnificent pageant which it presented, this tournament became the event of the time. It was held in the Piazza Santa Croce, the usual place for these grand spectacles, which Piazza, though it now looks so cold and grey, has seen more brilliant and gorgeous displays than perhaps any other place of the kind in Europe. Lucrezia Donati was again the queen of the tournament, and the beautiful Simonetta Cataneo, who had lately been married at the age of 16 to Marco Vespucci, and though a Genoese by birth, was now the acknowledged belle of Florence, was the tournament's queen of beauty. The splendor of the dresses and appointments on this occasion exceeded even those of the tournament of 1469. Giuliano, now 22, wore a suit of silver armor, and his entire dress is said to have cost 8,000 florins. His and Lorenzo's helmets were designed by Verrocchio, who also painted Giuliano's standard. Giuliano's handsome looks and gallant bearing won all hearts, and whether it is the result of his skill in the combat or his good looks, he was awarded the prize. This notable tournament, having formed so prominent an event, was immortalized both in poetry and in painting, and since nothing accorded with the spirit of the age, which did not contain profuse allusion to classical literature, both arts clothe what they have to say in classic dress. Poetry speaks first, by the mouth of the youthful prodigy Politian, and just as the tournament of 1469 had been immortalized by Pulci's poem Theron, so was this one of Galliano by the still more celebrated poem of Polizian, entitled La Giostra de Galliano de Medici. Roscoe says these two tournaments are chiefly notable because they called forth two of the most celebrated poems of the 15th century, La Giostra di Lorenzo de Medici by Pulci and La Giostra di Galliano de Medici by Polizian. The latter poem contains about 1,400 lines and has been uniformly allowed to be one of the earliest productions in the revival of letters that breathes the true spirit of poetry. 
Still more widely known, however, is the record by which painting has commemorated this tournament, for no less than three of Botticelli's chief pictures refer to this celebrated tournament and are simply his way of recording in painting the same matters which have been spoken by Polizian in poetry. The Botticelli, Mori, Suo, expresses what he has to say with such a wealth of allegory that this has not always been fully recognized. These pictures are The Birth of Venus, now in the Uffizi Gallery, Florence, His Mars and Venus, now in the National Gallery, London, and His Return of Spring, now in the Accademia, Florence, all three pictures being painted for Lorenzo the Magnificent. Polizien, in his poem, following the classical fashion of the day, is allusion to the tournament's queen of beauty, Simonetta, describes the birth of Venus, and Botticelli does the same in painting, following exactly Polizien's words. How closely he has done so is well described by Mrs. Addy, who says, The composition of the picture was evidently derived from Poliziano's poem of the Giostra. In a passage adapted from one of the Homeric hymns, the poet tells us how the newborn Aphrodite was blown by the soft breath of the zephyrs on the foam of the Aegean waves to shore. Heaven and earth, he sings, rejoice at her coming. The hours wait to welcome her and spread a star's own robe over her white limbs, while countless flowers spring up in the grass where her feet will tread. All this exquisite imagery is faithfully reproduced in Sandro's painting. He has represented his Venus in a diomene, laying one hand on her snowy breast, the other on her loose tresses of golden hair, a form of virginal beauty and purity, as with feet resting on the golden shell, she glides softly over the rippling surface of the waves. He has painted the winged zephyrs hovering in the air, linked fast together, blowing the goddess to the flower-strewn shore, and the shower of single roses fluttering about her form. Only instead of the three hours of Homer's hymn in Polietziano's poem, he shows us one fair nymph in a white robe embroidered with blue corn, flowers springing lightly forward to offer Venus a pink mantle sewn with daisies. In the laurel groves along the shore, we see a courtly allusion to the laurel who sheltered the songbirds that caroled to the Tuscan spring, while in the background the eye roams across long reaches of silent sea to distant headlands, sleeping under the cool gray light of early dawn. The picture charms us by its delightful mixture of the spirit of ancient Greece with that of the Renaissance, as well as by its life and movement, and its sensation of the free air of nature. As Steinman says, we seem to hear the tremulous rustle of the laurel grove and the gentle splash of the waves. Following this, we have the second picture. The tournament is over, Galliano has carried all before him, and rests from his fatigues basking in beauty's smiles. Polizian, in his poem alluding to Galliano as the victor of the tournament, has told the story of Mars and Venus, and described Venus reclining in a woodland glade, robed in gold-embroidered draperies, watching Mars with limbs relaxed, lying asleep on the grass, while little goat-footed satyrs played with his armor. This scene Botticelli takes for his second picture, and as before follows closely Polizian's words. And then, having devoted one picture to the tournament's queen of beauty, and one to the victor in its mimic warfare, Botticelli makes his third picture, the most important of the three. Relate to Lorenzo and his part in all this, gathering up in one view the whole subject of these pastimes. This Botticelli does with great talent, and in a manner all his own. He takes for his text the celebrated standard, which had been born in front of Lorenzo at both his and Galliano's tournaments, with its motto, Le Temps Revienne. Its device of the bay tree, which had appeared dead again, putting forth its leaves, and its allusion to the new era of youth and joy which Lorenzo had inaugurated, and had likened to the return of spring after the gloomy months of winter. Making the leading thought of his picture the theme of Lorenzo's standard, Botticelli paints for him his beautiful picture, The Return of Spring, the Primavera, perhaps the most widely admired of all Botticelli's pictures. As before, Botticelli connects his picture with the recent tournament by introducing Galliano and Simonetta, 
but he wishes to refer not only to this one tournament, but to all these pastimes, to their having been inaugurated by and taking place under the fostering care of Lorenzo, and also to the latter's talents as a poet, in which domain he is already beginning to earn a great reputation. And so Botticelli depicts for us a scene of light-hearted, youthful joy representing the return of spring, and by his great talent contrives that the entire picture shall speak of Lorenzo, and breathe the very spirit of the poems in which the latter had sung of the joys of Maytime in Tuscany. Shielded from rough winds and scorching sun by a grove of orange trees, backed by the ever-present laurel, Queen Venus, Simonetta, stands presiding over the return of spring to Tuscany. The graces dance before her. From out a laurel grove at her side, the three spring months, March, April, May, or it may be Zephyr, Fertility, and Flora, come bringing flowers of every hue. Mercury, Galliano, scatters the clouds of winter. And the little blind god of love aims his arrows recklessly around. Lorenzo's tournament motto of La Tempe Rivienne could be written below the picture as its name. So beautifully does Botticelli bring it, the occasion on which it was used, the meaning which it had, and Lorenzo's talent for poetry describing the beauties of nature, all in one glance before our eyes. Some consider this picture Botticelli's masterpiece, while others would give that honor to his Madonna of the Magnificat. The verdict will depend chiefly upon the temperament of the observer, but whether the return of spring can be considered his masterpiece or not, none can fail to praise what has been well termed his rhythmic grace, as well as the surpassing art with which Botticelli has made it speak of Lorenzo, his acts, his poetry, and the motto by which he signified the introduction of a brighter era. But dark clouds were coming on the horizon, which were long to overcast all these bright scenes of joy, putting an end forever to Lorenzo's youth and all the happy times which he and Galliano had enjoyed together. In April 1476, before Polizian had finished his poem or Botticelli had even begun to paint his three pictures, the tournament's poor queen of beauty, Simonetta de Vespucci, whose lovely face looks at us so wistfully in Botticelli's Birth of Venus and of whom Polizian says she was so sweet and charming that all men praised her and no women abused her, was dead being carried off by rapid consumption after a few weeks of illness. Lorenzo, who was then at Pisa, superintending his new university, and had sent his own physician to attend her and to furnish him with daily bulletins when he heard the news, went out into the calm spring night to walk with a friend, and as he was speaking of the dead lady, he suddenly stopped and gazed at a star which had never before seemed to him so brilliant. See, he exclaimed, Either the soul of that most gentle lady hath been transformed into that new star, or else hath it been joined together thereunto. Then followed in December 1476 the murder of the Duke of Milan, Galeazzo Sforza, which upset the balance of power in Italy and changing all political relations involved Lorenzo in serious anxieties. And soon afterwards came the terrible Patsy conspiracy and the bright, handsome Giuliano, Lorenzo's constant companion in work and play, and on whose sound sense he had grown greatly to rely, was foully murdered, and Lorenzo himself plunged into a serious war and many troubles. End of section 17. Section 18 of the Medici, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dick Bourgeois Doyle. The Medici, Volume 1, by G. F. Young. The celebrated conspiracy which had these results originated at Rome with Pope Sixtus IV and his nephews, of the Riario family. They gained, as their accomplices, the Patsy, at this time the leading family amongst the nobles in Florence, and the conspiracy has taken its name from them, though they were not the chief authors of the plot. Sixtus IV, the first of three popes who in this age attained an evil preeminence, was a fisherman by birth and took the name of the Della Roveri family. His sister married a Riario, and of him it has been said that he was the first pope who, for the sake of a founding family, sacrificed every interest of the church, and waited deep in crime and bloodshed for this purpose. 
The chief political feature of his pontificate is a constant struggle to rob all, right and left, of their possessions to enrich his rapacious nephews. He made himself hated in Rome, above all for his cruel treatment of the Colonna family, whom he pursued with relentless ferocity, and of all his crimes, this atrocious murder of the head of that family, the proto-notary Lorenzo Colonna, in order to wring from them the surrender of their estates, has made his name forever odious. Sixtus IV, urged on by Girolamo Riario, the most evil of his nephews, desired to seize upon Florence in order to give that state to Girolamo. That this involved the murder of the two Medici brothers was a mere detail. The Pazzi, on the other hand, though they desired to exterminate the Medici, had no intention of allowing the Riario to obtain Florence afterwards. Thus did these two bands of criminals combine for their common object of a treacherous double murder, each of them determined to outwit the other when that should have been effected. The arrangements took some time, but eventually the two parties hatched at Rome, early in 1478, the plot known as the Patsy Conspiracy, certainly with the full cognizance of the Pope, even though it may be true that he did not know all the details. For these he left to his nephew, Girolamo Riario, the chief originator of the plot, and did not desire to know them so long as the result, the removal of the two Medici, was achieved. In fact, without the Pope's full concurrence, Girolamo Riario would never have undertaken an affair involving so many risks, which might, without that support, bring him no profit. Troops under Niccolo de Talentino and Lorenzo Giustini were sent to occupy points on Florence's frontiers at Todi, Cito de Castello, Imola, and near Perugia, and arrangements made for their marching upon Florence, while that city should be in the state of confusion and helplessness which would result from the murder of the two Medici. As has been remarked, for such extensive movements, the Pope's assent and cooperation were essential. The principal movers in the business were Girolamo Riario, who was to obtain the state of Florence, Francesco Salviati, Archbishop designate of Pisa, who was promised that he would be made Archbishop of Florence if the attempt succeeded, the young cardinal, Raffaello Riario, the Pope's grandnephew, who was sent to Florence to represent Girolamo and the Pazzi family. The latter were very numerous. Jacopo de Pazzi, who was head of the family, had two brothers, and between them they had ten grown-up sons, besides many daughters. Cosimo, foreseeing the enmity of the Pazzi, had arranged a marriage between one of these nephews of Jacopo the Pazzi and his granddaughter, Bianca, Lorenzo's sister. But when the time came, this did not protect Lorenzo from the Pazzi. When all the plans and the conspirators were ready, the archbishop, Salviati came to Florence, bringing with him Montesecco, a mercenary soldier in the Pope's employ, who was to play the chief part in the murder, and other conspirators. At the same time, the young cardinal, Raffaello Riario, also came to Florence, ostensibly on a visit to Jacopo de Pazzi. The cowardly Girolamo Riario, though he was the chief author of the plot, and was to be the person to benefit by it, took care to remain out of harm's way in Rome. Lorenzo and Giuliano were at the time staying at the charming Medici villa a few miles out of Florence on the slope of the hill of Fiesole. Raffaello Riario and his retinue stayed with Jacopo de Pazzi at his neighboring villa of La Veggi. They were invited by the two Medici brothers to a grand banquet to take place at the Medici villa on Saturday, the 25th of April, and the first plan formed by the conspirators was to poison the two brothers at this banquet. The entertainment took place, but Giuliano, being indisposed, was unable to be present, so the plan fell through. The Patsy then told Lorenzo that the young cardinal Riario was anxious to see the treasures of the Medici palace upon which Lorenzo invited him and his retinue to stay with him there for the Sunday night, when the cardinal intended being present at high mass in the cathedral, whereupon the conspirators laid the plan that after attending mass and returning to the Medici palace for dinner, their two young hosts should be murdered as they rose from the table. 
In accordance with the above invitation, the party removed to the Medici Palace, but on the Sunday morning it was found that though Giuliano would be at Mass, he was still too unwell to be at the midday dinner. So again, another plan had to be formed. Nor could any delay be allowed, since on the evening the troops of Niccolo de Tolentino and Giustini would be at the gates of the city. It was therefore hastily decided that the murder should take place at the service in the cathedral, where it was known that there would be a great crowd which would facilitate the escape of the murderers. Montesecco, however, declined to take part in this plan, as he refused to add sacrilege to murder. So in his place were substituted two priests who were among the conspirators, Antonio Maffei and Stefano de Bagnone, who had no such scruples. Meanwhile, in the Medici Palace, every preparation was made for the banquet. The rare silver, maiolica, and precious vases were brought out, and the cortile, which Donatello's medallions and statuary adorned, were arranged for the entertainment of so distinguished a company. It shows somewhat of the general estimation in which the Medici were held in Florence that though for several days danger of this kind, either by poison or dagger, had been all around Lorenzo and Giuliano, both they, their family, and their numerous retainers should have been so entirely without the smallest suspicion of any danger. It was this entire absence of suspicion on the part of the two brothers which caused the plot to come so very near to succeeding. Towards midday, on the Sunday morning, 26th of April, Lorenzo left the Medici Palace, walking with his guest, the young cardinal, Raffaello Riario, to the cathedral. After a short interval, Giuliano followed, accompanied by Francesco de Pazzi and Bernardo Bandini. As they walked, Francesco de Pazzi pretended affection, put his arm around Giuliano's waist to ascertain whether he wore a coat of mail under his clothes, which he found he did not. Giuliano on that day was entirely unarmed, not even wearing a sword, having hurt his leg in an accident. The moment which the conspirators had fixed upon to carry out this diabolical murder during high mass of the two young men whose hospitality they were enjoying was that of the elevation of the host. This moment, says a historian of the time, being chosen both by reason of the impossibility of mistaking it and also on account of the bending attitude of worship, which it is the habit of everyone in the church to assume at that solemn moment in the service. It was this which caused the mercenary soldier, Montesecco, to draw back from the plot, he being appalled, ruffian as he was, at the blasphemy of choosing such a moment for so great a crime. And this was the actual cause of the failure of the plot, for his part had been that of murdering Lorenzo. And the two priests, substituted in his place, being unused to arms, bungled their work, where those told off to do the same to Giuliano, Bernardo Bandini and Francesco de Pazzi, succeeded only too well. In the crowded cathedral, the brothers were, according to the plan, separated. At the fatal moment, Giuliano, unarmed, was standing at the northern side of the choir, not far from the door leading to the Via de Servi, while Lorenzo was standing at the south side of the choir. Giuliano, furiously attacked by Bernardo Bandini and Francesco de Pazzi, fell dead at once where he stood, his body being stabbed again and again as it lay on the ground until it had 19 wounds. At the same time, Maffei and Stefano attacked Lorenzo, but being less prompt than Bandini, only succeeded in giving him a wound on the neck. Lorenzo, with much presence of mind, immediately threw off his cloak, wrapped it around his left arm as a shield, and drawing his sword, beat off his assailants. He then leaped over the low rail which encircled the choir, and running along a cross in front of the high altar, took refuge in the sacristy. Bandini, having slain Giuliano, rushed towards the sacristy to attack Lorenzo, killing on the way, with one blow, Francesco Nori, a devoted adherent of the Medici, who interposed to prevent him from reaching Lorenzo. Belizian, with one or two others of his friends, had followed Lorenzo, closed the heavy bronze doors of the sacristy to Bandini's face, while Antonio Ridolfi sucked Lorenzo's wound lest the weapon should have been poisoned. 
the whole church was at once in an uproar. The people, when they knew what had happened, being ready to tear in pieces those guilty of the crime. For the moment, however, the latter, in the general confusion, escaped out of the church, while the young cardinal, Raffaello Riario, took refuge at the high altar. One of Lorenzo's party in the sacristy climbed up into the organ loft and saw Giuliano's body lying dead at the north side of the choir, and that the conspirators had fled, this being the first intimation that Lorenzo had of what had happened to his brother. And after a little time, Lorenzo, wounded and in deep distress at his brother's cruel fate, was escorted home by his friends. Meanwhile, the other and larger portion of the conspirators were occupied at the Palazzo della Signoria. The plot, as arranged, was a most formidable one, eminently calculated to paralyze Florence and render her powerless to resist the troops of Niccolo da Talontino and Giostini, who should in a few hours be entering the city. For the plan had been that while those told off to that work carried out the murder of the two brothers in the cathedral, the principal band of the conspirators, headed by the Archbishop Salviati, should proceed to the Palazzo della Signoria, and having gained admittance to the council chambers, should seize the government, killing all members of the Signoria who resisted. But on the entrance of the Archbishop and his following, the Gonfaloniere Petrucci, who in this crisis showed himself a decidedly strong man, suspected something wrong. He therefore kept the archbishop and his party in play for a short time, detaining the archbishop in his own private room while he quietly set out to ascertain if there was anything unusual going on in the city. In a few minutes came the news of the tragedy which had occurred in the cathedral. And with it, the gathering noise of the furious people, who, while Jacopo de Pazzi and others of that family strove to rouse them to rise against the Medici, and rode through the streets crying out, Liberta, were refusing to shout as instigated, Abasso le pale, but instead were shouting furiously, Vivano le pale. The gonfaloniere, with great resolution, seized the archbishop and promptly hanged him from the corner window on the north side of the Palazzo della Signoria, the corner window of the great council hall, and with him, from the adjacent windows, five of his fellow conspirators, while the rest were slain on the staircase. Within a half hour, 26 bodies were encumbering the staircase of the Palazzo della Signoria, and half a dozen more were dangling from the windows. The remainder of the conspirators were hunted through the city by the enraged people, whose hatred against them was beyond all bounds, and none who fell into their hands were spared even to be handed over to the Signoria for execution. They had not only killed Giuliano and attempted to kill Lorenzo, but they had also made a formidable endeavor by force of arms and with the aid of foreign troops to seize Florence by a coup de main, and all these acts together roused the people to frenzy. They surrounded the Medici Palace and clamored to see Lorenzo. Wounded as he was, he came out and addressed them, assuring them that he was only slightly hurt and exhorting them not to execute private vengeance on the perpetrators of this deed, but to reserve their animosity for those foreign enemies of their country who had instigated it. But they paid no heed to his admonition, and all suspected of complicity in the plot were pursued through the streets and slaughtered wherever captured. Their mangled remains were dragged about by the infuriated mob, whose rage was not satisfied until about 80 persons had been massacred. Nor was the feeling confined to the city. For days afterwards, the country people flocked into Florence, coming, they said, to protect Lorenzo. But in the Medici Palace was deep and bitter mourning for the bright and justly loved Giuliano, the idol of his family and mournful preparations for the solemn public funeral to be held in the family church of San Lorenzo. Nor when the Florentine people had had time to recover from this first excitement did the popular wrath abate. It became less wild, but more determined. Jacopo de Pazzi had escaped to the village of Castagno, but was seized and brought back by the villagers and executed by the Signoria. The same fete met Francesco de Pazzi, one of the two murderers of Giuliano, his cousin Renato de Pazzi, Montesecco, and the two priests, Maffei and Stefano. 
Guglielmo de Pazzi, brother of Francesco and husband of Lorenzo's favorite sister Bianca, would probably also have lost his life had not Lorenzo, on his sister's account, intervened on his behalf. In consequence, Guglielmo was merely banished to a short distance from Florence. The remaining seven of the ten sons or nephews of Jacopo de Pazzi were sentenced either to imprisonment for longer or shorter periods or to banishment. Vespucci also richly deserved hanging but was let off with two years imprisonment. Bernardo Bandini, the other murderer of Giuliano, escaped to Constantinople. There, however, he was seized by the Sultan and sent back in chains to Florence. On his arrival, the Signoria at once ordered him to be executed in the Bargello. The indignation of the people, not all of it on account of the attempt against the Medici, but also on account of the effrontery of such an endeavor to seize upon their state as if a mere spoil of war, caused them to seek for every possible method which they could use to devise to brand with deserved infamy those who had perpetrated this deed. By a public decree of the Signoria, the name and arms of the Pazzi family were ordered to be forever suppressed. Their palace and all places in the city named after them were given other names. All persons contracting marriage with any of that family were declared prohibited from all offices in the Republic. The ancient ceremony on Easter Eve of conducting the sacred fire to the house of the Pazzi was abolished. An artist was employed at the public expense to represent on the walls of the Bargello the bodies of the traitors to the Republic suspended as a mark of infamy by the feet. And a medal was struck by the order of the Signoria representing the choir of the cathedral, the heads of Lorenzo and Giuliano and the attacks made upon them. While the fury of the Florentines was thus at a white heat against those who had perpetrated this crime and come so near bringing their country under such a yoke as Sixtus IV had intended, Lorenzo showed in the midst of the frenzy of his city one trait which is deserving of notice, and it was an inherited one. Whether he had felt that, notwithstanding the part in the matter which the one member of the Riario family who had come to Florence had played, the latter had been only a tool in the hands of older men, or whatever the cause, it was to Lorenzo that the young cardinal, Raffaello Riario, entirely owed the saving of his life. When the uproar in the cathedral took place, the young cardinal took refuge, as already noted, at the high altar, whence he dared not stir. Lorenzo, on reaching home, sent a party of his retainers to protect him and to conduct him to the Medici Palace, the sole place in the city where he could be in safety. There he kept him hidden for some days until the violence of the people had cooled down and then sent him away in secrecy to Rome. Lorenzo showed similar magnanimity in saving the lives of Raffaello Maffei, the brother of the priest who had attempted to murder him, and of Averardo Salviati, a near relation of the archbishop who had taken so prominent a part in the plot. Such, then, was the Patsy conspiracy. It differs in no way from the most brutal highway murder and robbery except in its consummate treachery and the high position of its authors. Yet it will scarcely be credited that some writers have styled it a praiseworthy act. Thus, for instance, we find Sismondi crediting the chief actors in the Patsy conspiracy with noble motives. He sees in the conduct of Sixtus IV, whose motive is well known to have been solely the desire to seize Tuscany for his greedy nephew, elevation of sentiment and a desire for the independence of Italy. And he regards the Patsy as noble patriots striving for the liberty of Florence. The Medici have quite enough faults to answer for without their history being distorted in this preposterous fashion. The judgment of a more balanced writer is as follows. The Pope and his nephew attempted to overthrow the Medici rule because it was a bar to enlarging the temporal authority of the one and to the personal ambition of the other. The Patsy were perhaps unconscious that they were being used as tools for the attainment of these ends and had no doubt their own ideas as to the future government of Florence, but there is not a tittle of evidence that they were actuated by a love of liberty. Their conduct throughout seems to have been purely vindictive. It was the Medici, and not the Patsy, who in the past had been on the side of free institutions. 
The supposition that the Florentines would have preferred the rule of the Pazzi to that of the Medici is ridiculous, or Jacopo de Pazzi's shouts of Liberta, Liberta would not have been answered with the Pale, Pale of the multitude. In truth, there has seldom been a conspiracy which was instigated throughout by meaner motives. Thus did this celebrated conspiracy fail, and the Medici were more popular than ever, and had weathered the fourth and most formidable attempt to destroy them. While Lorenzo, as a result of this attempt, gained much additional strength for the war which was now before him, in the knowledge that he had a united people at his back, but Lorenzo's youth ended with the death of his much-loved brother. There are no more pageants and festivities, but henceforward war, politics, and literary labors, with field sports as the only relaxation. End of section 18.